Preliminaries of the 20th of June. The plan of raising a mob to march on the Tuileries, one of the leaders afterwards admitted, was conceived and planned in the salon of Madame Roland. It is certain at any rate that, as Mortimer Temo pointed out, the day of June the 20th had been prepared long beforehand by the agitators of the Faubourgs, the date had been settled, it was that of the oath of the tennis court, the roles were distributed, complicity agreed on and accepted, the issue alone was uncertain, it depended on the degree of excitement and exasperation to which the masses could be brought. The reasons given by revolutionary writers for the invasion of the Tuileries are, therefore, only the pretexts that were given to the people in order to induce them to carry out the designs of the leaders. But, as we have already seen, the people at this moment were in no mood to rise. Even the faubourgs of Saint-Antoine and saint Marceau showed little tendency to revolt, although perpetually stirred up by Santerre and by Goncan. There and de Mericourt, no longer the light-hearted fille de joie who had ridden with the mob to Versailles, but a haggard and embittered virago, was also hard at work in Saint-Antoine, where she had organized revolutionary clubs for women on the model of the Société Fraternelle that formed an annex to the Jacobins and served as a training school for the future trekkateurs. But Théoin's efforts met with violent remonstrance from the working men of Saint-Antoine, who complained to Santerre that the sweetness of their wives' tempers was not increased by attendance at these assemblies, and the Jacobins were obliged to request Mill. Théoin to moderate her activities. Nothing, indeed, is more surprising than the resistance shown by the inhabitants of the Faubourgs to the seductions of the Jacobins, a fact of which historians give no idea, but which is only revealed by a study of contemporary literature, especially of the ultra-revolutionary variety. It is in the pages of Prudhomme, in the reports of the Seances des Jacobins, that we discover the immense efforts made by the revolutionaries and their repeated failures to enlist the sympathies of the people. For when we consider the wretchedness of the people at this crisis, and realize that the arms of the Jacobins were always open to receive them, when we remember that any deserter from the army who appealed to the society for sympathy stood an excellent chance of receiving a civic crown, that any man or woman who entered the hall and uttered revolutionary sentiments received an ovation, and in many instances a sum of money, that any schoolboy who recited a revolutionary poem was invited to the honors of the seance and overwhelmed with compliments, we can only wonder that the Faubourgs did not crowd en masse to the club in the Rue Saint Honoré. But no, only here and there does a stray dweller of the Faubourgs find his way there, and then with what triumph and at what length is the incident recorded in the Journal of the Society. True, we shall read often of deputations from the sections of Paris arriving, both at the Assembly and at the Jacobins, but we do not need the explanations of Montjoie, of Bully, or the De Amis de la Liberté to realize that the speeches crammed with classical allusions delivered on these occasions were not the work of the poor and unlettered inhabitants of the Faubourgs but of the revolutionary agents who distributed them to orators, so unlearned that they were hardly able to read the words aloud. As to any spontaneous expressions of the people's sentiments these were seldom accorded a hearing, and at any rate were not recorded in the press, which at this date was almost entirely in the pay of the revolutionary leaders. Thus we read of an imposing deputation from St. Marceau to the National Assembly consisting of 6,000 men armed with pikes and forks, and women with their arms held threateningly aloft, and children carrying naked swords, led by an orator in rags who spoke like Cicero in praise of the revolution, but a petition signed by 30,000 citizens which was presented a few days later to protest against the tyranny of the Jacobins is not even mentioned in the reports of the debates. Adolf Schmidt, in his studies of revolutionary Paris, has worked out by statistics that out of all the 600,000 to 800,000 inhabitants of the capital there were, in 1792, not more than 5,000 to 6,000 real revolutionaries, a number that diminished in the following year to nearly half, and that during the whole revolutionary period the anti-revolutionaries constituted nine-tenths of the population. In this June of 1792 the departmental administration placed in this category of honest folk and young folk those useful and hard-working men attached to the state at every point of their existence and by all the objects of their affections, proprietors, cultivators, tradesmen, artisans, workmen, and all those estimable citizens whose activity and economy contribute to the public treasury, and animate all the resources of national prosperity. All these men profess a boundless devotion to the constitution, and principally to the sovereignty of the nation, to political equality, and to constitutional monarchy. The Jacobin Club, the same report declares, is alone responsible for any disturbances in the city. In order, therefore, to persuade the people of Paris to march on the Tuileries some very powerful incentive must be provided. 
For some months the Girondins, Briso, Genjorna, and above all Cara, had endeavoured to inflame the popular mind by continual declamations against the so-called Austrian Committee, by means of which Marie Antoinette was declared to be betraying France to the Emperor of Austria, but their efforts to prove the existence of this committee had ended in ignominious failure. To the request for a written statement of their accusations they replied, What do you wish us to prove? Conspiracies cannot be written down, lay conspirations ni si trivent pa. Later on at their trial, when they asked Fikir Tinville for proofs of their guilt, Fikir quoted these words to them and sent them to the guillotine. The scare of the Austrian committee having failed to rouse the people, the Girondins set about devising further traps for the king. If only Louis XVI were to refuse his sanction to any decrees passed by the assembly the old cry against the veto could be raised, and an insurrection might be expected to result. Accordingly three iniquitous decrees were placed before the assembly. The first enacted that all the nonjuring priests, that is to say, those who had not subscribed to the civil constitution of the clergy, should be deported, the second that the king should be deprived of his bodyguard of 1800 men accorded to him by the constitution, but suspected by the revolutionaries of loyalty to his person, and the third that a camp of 20,000 men should be formed outside Paris. Louis gave his sanction to the second decree, but withheld it from the first and third. Now, since the first decree was mainly instigated by Roland, and the third was proposed by Servon, Madame Roland's particular ally in the ministry, it is impossible not to recognize the hand of Madame Roland in all this. The three decrees were, of course, directly unconstitutional, the last because, according to the terms of the constitution, the king alone had the authority to propose any addition to the standing army, and the camp of 20,000 men was proposed by Servon entirely on his own authority, without reference to the king or even to the other ministers. Moreover, as the 20,000 men were to consist of confederates from the provinces, that is to say, they were to be chosen by the Jacobin clubs all over France, the plan met with immediate remonstrance, not only from the king but from sane men of every party. Lafayette wrote to the king from his camp at Mabouge urging him to persist in his refusal to sanction the decree, even Robespierre expressed his disapproval. The ministers themselves were violently divided on the subject, Roland, Servon, and Clavier supporting the plan, Dumayet, Lacoste, and Duranton protesting, Dumayet, indeed, nearly came to blows with Servon in the king's presence. But most of all was the proposal resented by the National Guard of Paris, a corps essentially representative of the people, who sent a deputation to the assembly to protest against the imputation that they were incompetent to defend the capital. Servon, said the orator of this deputation, had violated the constitution, had shown himself the vile instrument of a faction that rends the kingdom. We citizens of Paris, we who were the first to conquer liberty, we shall know how to defend it at all times against every kind of tyrant, we have still the force and courage of the men of the 14th of July. At this venue, rising in wrath, declared that the petitioners were guilty of inconceivable audacity, and should be refused the honours of the sitting, in other words, that they should be driven from the hall. A further deputation of the National Guard, armed with a petition bearing 8,000 signatures, met with a like reception, and the assembly thereupon closed the debate. To this, then, had the sovereignty of the people been reduced. All through the revolution we shall find the same method employ, the only deputations recognized as representative of the people are those organized by the revolutionary leaders and marching to the word of command, spontaneous demonstrations are invariably silenced and declared to be seditious. The Jacobin Club, dominated by the Girondins, whose violence during the early part of 1792 surpassed even that of the future terrorists, had succeeded in establishing a tyranny which roused the indignation of all true lovers of liberty. At his camp in Mabouge, Lafayette received from the administrative and municipal bodies all over the country further complaints of their excesses, and now once again he resolved to come to the rescue of the monarchy. His letter to the Assembly on June 16 is one of the few admirable incidents in his vacillating career. Can you deny, he wrote indignantly, that a faction, and to avoid vague denominations, the Jacobin faction, has caused all the disorders. It is this faction that I loudly accuse. Organized like an empire apart in its metropolis and its affiliations, blindly directed by a few ambitious leaders, this sect forms a distinct corporation in the midst of the French people, of which it usurps the powers by subjugating its representatives and its agents. It is there that at public meetings attachment to the law is called aristocracy, and its infringement patriotism, 
There the assassins of desire triumph, the crimes of Jordan find panegyrists. It is I who denounce this sect to you. And how should I delay any longer in fulfilling this duty when each day weakens constituted authority, substitutes the spirit of party for the will of the people, when the audacity of agitators imposes silence on peaceful citizens and casts aside men who could be useful. May the royal power remain intact, for it is guaranteed by the constitution, may it be independent, for that independence is one of the mainsprings of our liberty, may the king be revered, for he is invested with the majesty of the nation, may he choose a ministry that wears the chains of no party, and if there are conspirators may they perish beneath the power of the sword. In a word, may the reign of the clubs be destroyed by you and give place to the reign of law. Their disorganizing maxims, give place, to the true principles of liberty, their delirious fury to the calm and settled courage of a nation that knows its rights and defends them, may party considerations yield to the real interests of the country, which at this moment of danger should unite all those to whom its subjugation and ruin are not a matter of atrocious profit and infamous speculation. These courageous words of Lafayette were received with a howl of execration by the Girondins. Venio rose angrily to declare that it was all over with liberty if a general were allowed to dictate laws to the assembly. No less than sixty-five departments of France and several large towns hastened to endorse the sentiments of Lafayette. But it was useless indeed for anyone to oppose the Girondins at this crisis, the power was all in their hands, and Humier, realizing this, dared not stand against them, so, although he had declared that those who demanded the formation of a camp of twenty thousand men near Paris were as much the enemies of the country as the enemies of the king, he ended by advising Louis XVI. To sanction the decree. It was the crowning misfortune of the unhappy king at every crisis of the revolution to lack disinterested advisers. Before the siege of the Bastille Necker had not dared to stand by him, at the march on Versailles all his ministers had distinguished themselves by their ineptitude, and now, before the invasion of the Tuileries, Dumier failed him ignominiously. Long afterwards in his memoir Dumier completely justified the king's conduct in refusing his sanction to the two decrees, but his tribute to the integrity of Louis XVI. Only places his own perfidy a blacker light. One day, Dumier relates, the king, taking him by the hand, said, in accents that neither art nor dissimulation could have imitated, God is my witness that I wish for nothing but the happiness of France, and Dumier, with tears in his eyes, replied, Sire, I do not doubt it. If all France knew you as I do all our misfortunes would be ended. Yet, after this, Dumier betrayed him. For Louis XVI, having refused to sanction the two decrees, Dumier only waited for the inevitable explosion in order to resign his post in the ministry and return to the army, and the Duc de Chartres. Meanwhile Madame Roland had seen her opportunity to bring about the crisis for which she had so long been waiting, and before the king could announce his final decision she had devised a further trap which this time was to prove effectual. The dismissal of Necker had served as a pretext for the revolution of July 1789, the dismissal of the three patriot ministers, Roland, Servon, and Clavier, might be expected to bring about the revolution of June 1792. Accordingly she composed a letter which Roland was to hand to the king in the council as his own composition, but of which the authorship was only too plainly visible. Who but Madame Roland, with her insatiable greed for power, could have basely taunted Louis XVI. With the loss of those prerogatives that he had voluntarily renounced. Your Majesty has enjoyed the great prerogatives that he believed to belong to royalty. Brought up with the idea of retaining them, he could not feel any pleasure at seeing them taken from him, the desire to have them given back is as natural as the regret at seeing them done away with. Then, dropping the tone of contemptuous condolence, she proceeds to threaten him, and all the old ferocity flashes out anew, two important decrees have been drawn up, both of essential interest, to the public tranquility and the salvation of the state. The delay to sanction them inspires distrust, if prolonged it will cause discontent, and I am forced to say that in the present agitation of all minds, discontent may lead to anything. There is no time to draw back, it is no longer even possible to temporize, the revolution is made in the minds of the people, it will be finished at the price of blood, and will be cemented with blood, if wisdom does not prevent misfortune it is possible to avoid. I know that the austere language of truth is rarely welcomed near the throne, I know also that it is because it cannot make itself heard there that revolutions become necessary. And I know nothing that can prevent me from fulfilling my conscious duty, etc. Not content with handing this precious document to the king, 
Roland, obedient to Manon's instructions, insisted on reading it aloud to him, after which he delivered himself of a violent tirade containing the bitterest and most insulting details on the conduct of the king, representing him as a perjurer, reproaching him on the subject of his confessor and of his bodyguard, on the imprudences of the queen, and the intrigues of the court with Austria. There was a limit to the patience even of Louis XVI, and this attack of Roland's had the effect of bringing things to a crisis. On the 12th of June the king dismissed Roland, Servon, and Clavier, on the 19th he finally placed his veto on the two decrees. Nothing could have suited Madame Roland better. For once we may believe her to be sincere when she assures us that she was enchanted at the dismissal of the three ministers, for, if the king's action added fuel to her fury, it had provided the final pretext for insurrection. The plan concerted in Madame Roland's salon of collecting a mob to march on the Tuileries was matured in the councils of the Orleanists. At Charenton, Danton, Marat, Santerre, Camille de Milan met by night, as the Orleanists of 1789 had met at Montrouge or Passy, for it was they alone who could control the workings of the great revolutionary machine, it was they who chose and paid the mob leaders, they who distributed the roles, prompted the orators, and lavished gold and strong drink on the obedient multitude they held at their command. The Girondins could only suggest and perorate, the Orleanists knew how to lead from words to action. Then the conspirators set to work to inflame the minds of the people, Cara, Gorses, Briso, and Condorcet distributed seditious pamphlets, Pétion and Manuel placarded the walls of the city with fresh calumnies against the royal family. A caricature was hawked on the keys representing Louis XVI. With his crown slipping from his head, seated at Piquet with the Duc d'Orléans, and exclaiming, J. A. Curte le coeur, il a pour Louis le Pics, J. Perdu la Parti. The pikes were literally those of Orleans, for Pétion had ordered 30,000 to be forged for arming the populace, and by a refinement of brutality the points were so constructed as not only to wound but to lacerate horribly the flesh of the victims. These, together with 50,000 red caps of liberty, were distributed in the faubourgs. Meanwhile Gorses paraded the streets crying out, My friends, we must go tomorrow to plant under the windows of Fat Louis not the Oak of Liberty but an Aspen. As usual, the people were not admitted to the secrets of the leaders, whose ingenious method was invariably to propose an apparently harmless demonstration, and then to stir the people up to commit excesses. By this means it was always possible to avoid responsibility, and to attribute the blame for any violence that took place to the uncontrollable passions of the populace. As on the 14th of July the people had only been told to march on the Bastille in order to procure arms for their defence, and on the 5th of October to go to Versailles and ask the king for bread, so before the 20th of June the programme officially put before the inhabitants of Saint-Antoine and saint Marceau was to form a procession in order to present a petition to the king and legislative assembly, asking for the sanction of the two decrees and the recall of the dismissed ministers. After this they were to proceed to the terrace of the Tuileries and plant a tree of liberty, to commemorate the anniversary of the oath of the tennis court. Nothing more innocent could be imagined, and by way of inducement to the more peaceable amongst the people it was suggested how pleasant it would be to visit the inside of the Tuileries, and see Monsieur and Madame Vito at home. But in order to ensure the cooperation of the populace more potent methods were employed, and amongst these, as in every outbreak of the revolution, alcohol played the principal part. So in the faubourgs throughout the 19th of June champagne, distributed by Santerre, flowed freely, whilst the professional instigators of crime who had figured in all the former tumults, Gonkin, Saint Herge, Fournier l'American, and Rotondo, stirred up insurrection. In the Champs Elysees a feast was spread to which the inhabitants of Saint Antoine and Saint Marceau were bidden, in the surrounding cabarets half naked Saint Calort collected, incendiary speeches were made, the Prussian Clutes as Toastmaster proposed the deposition of Louis XVI, and although the more prudent of the leaders affected to support this proposition, the comedian Dadison was permitted to sing verses provoking the people to murder the king. Louis XVI well knew what was taking place in the city. That day he wrote to his confessor, asking him to come to him I have never had so great need of your consolations, I have done with men, it is towards heaven that I turn my eyes. Great disasters are announced for tomorrow, I shall have courage. And as he looked out that summer evening across the great gardens of the Tuileries to the sun sinking behind the Champs Elysees, he said to good old Molzeb standing by him, who knows whether I shall see the sun set tomorrow. Then with an untroubled conscience he went to rest, ready to welcome death that would deliver him from the hideous nightmare of life. 
and in hundreds of little French homes that night the people, who still loved their king, lay down likewise to rest, little dreaming of the terrible scenes of the morrow that in the lying pages of history were to be set down to their account. The 20th of June. But whilst the people slept the conspirators were all awake, at the house of Santerre the final touches were added to the plan of insurrection, Chabot, Bazir, Merlin, the source continued to harangue the inhabitants of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, three of whom, outraged by the incendiary speeches of the agitators, denounced them later on to the assembly, declaring that Chabot had collected the people in a church of the district and had actually proposed the assassination of the king. So the match was set to the mine, and the conspirators eagerly awaited the explosion. But, contrary to their expectations, Saint-Antoine showed no irresistible desire to rise. At five in the morning of the 20th Santerre had only succeeded in raising a mob of 1,500 people, according to one account of the day, this number had not been exceeded by 11 o'clock, including those who had collected from curiosity, and it was not until the Sieur Santerre had placed himself at the head of a detachment of Invalide, and had incited during their march all onlookers to join them, that the multitude considerably increased. Meanwhile in saint Marceau, a motley crowd of men, women, and children had assembled, armed with the pikes provided by Pétion, who now with consummate hypocrisy sent out commissioners to make a feint of dissuading them from bearing arms and forming a procession. The people, well under the control of the agitators, of course refused to go back to their homes whence they had been summoned, some indeed answered in all good faith that they had no evil intentions, and were resolved to march. Finally the Faubourgs, to which a number of deserters from the National Guard had joined themselves, set forth, divided into three bands led by Santerre, saint Herge, and their own de Mericourt, and now at last, as they passed through the streets, recruits began to pour in from all sides, coal heavers, porters, chimney sweeps, ready for the price of a day's work and the promise of free drinks to throw themselves into any tumult, but besides these, terrible freaks of humanity, half naked, half in rags. Dregs not only of the Paris underworld but of foreign cities, Italians, Negroes and Negress, brigands of the South, bearing as well as the usual revolutionary weapons, pikes, scythes, pickaxes, knotted sticks, and rusty swords, horrible emblems of their own devising, filthy trousers held aloft on poles, the badge of the Sonkalort, the bleeding heart of a calf labelled aristocrat's heart, toy gibbets, hangman's ropes. Eyewitnesses speak shudderingly of this procession, nothing so revolting had ever yet been seen in Paris. The organisers of the movement, who as usual remained prudently in the background, had every reason to congratulate themselves on the success of their efforts, never before in the whole course of the revolution had so formidable a mob been collected, barely 1,000 people had marched on the Bastille, 8,000 on Versailles, but now on the 20th of June certain contemporaries declare that no less than 20,000 men, women, and children took part in the movement. Arithmetically they constituted only about one-thirtieth of the population of the city, still this number was sufficient to give some semblance of truth to the assertion that the whole people had risen in the cause of liberty. It was more than sufficient to alarm the assembly, who, hearing that the vanguard of the army consisting of eight thousand people were at the door of the assembly demanding admittance, were called upon instantly to decide whether the procession should be allowed to march through the hall with their arms. Since they are eight thousand, and we are only 745, cried one deputy overcome with panic, this is the moment to close the sitting and depart. Poor, more courageous, declared that the assembly should stand its ground and refuse the mob admittance. Who are these men calling themselves the people who bring us a petition with cannons and pikes? Close the doors, they may break them down if they wish, but at least the assembly will not have received them, and will have maintained its dignity. But the Girondins, Venio, Guardat, La Source, whose collusion with the mob leaders was a guarantee for their personal safety, arose indignantly to demand that the people should be allowed to enter and place their sufferings and anxieties before the assembly. At this Jacquot aptly exclaimed, It is evident that those who brought them here cannot send them away again. Other members rose to speak, when suddenly the waiting crowd, whose angry murmur had been growing louder, broke down the barriers and burst into the hall. A scene of indescribable confusion followed, cries of protest and alarm arose from all parts of the assembly, members sprang onto the benches and vainly strove to make their voices heard above the tumult. The president hastily put on his hat to signify that the sitting was ended. Finally the advance guard of the mob was driven out again, and after further discussion the assembly decided to admit a deputation of the people. The orator of the deputation, 
a man named Sylvester Huguenin, formerly a deserter from the army, now an agent of brothels, was certainly not calculated to inspire confidence in the pacific disposition of his followers. Tall and gaunt, with a bald forehead, bloodshot eyes, a dry and withered skin, his aspect was no less frightful than the tirade he now delivered to the assembly, of which every word was a veiled provocation to assassinate the king. A single man shall not influence the will of twenty thousand men. If out of consideration we maintain him in his post, it is on condition that he fills it constitutionally, if he fails to do this he counts for nothing to the French nation and deserves the extreme penalty. As an address supposed to have been framed by the inhabitants of Sontant when the thing was the clumsiest of frauds, for in this, as in every other bogus petition presented to the assembly, the phraseology of the Jacobin club was clearly recognizable. Thus the working men of Saint Antoine were represented as saying imitate Cicero, and Demosthenes and unveil before the whole senate the perfidious machinations of Catalina. Or again a wild medley of metaphor, the people will it so, and their head is of as much value as that of crowned despots. That head is the genealogical tree of the nation, and beneath that sturdy oak the feeble reed must bend. At each sanguinary threat the galleries broke out into tumultuous applause, and it was then decided to allow the Faubourgs to march through the assembly. Immediately the wild horde, of which a great number were now reeling under the influence of drink, entered the hall led by Santerre and Saint Herge, first came seven or eight musicians playing the Saira, and behind them women armed with sabres singing and dancing to the strains, the men brandishing their ragged banners and ghastly trophies on the end of poles, and all shrieking incoherently, Long live the Sonkalort! Long live the nation! Down with the veto! The procession, says the deputy who, uh, lasted for three hours, hideous countenances were there, I can still see that moving forest of pikes, those handkerchiefs, those rags that served as standards. Meanwhile outside the hall an immense congestion had taken place. In order to understand this we must realize the situation of the hall occupied by the assembly. This hall was the royal manege, that is to say, the riding school of the Tuileries, and stood on the spot where at the present day the Rue Costellione joins the Rue de Rivoli. At the time of the revolution neither of these streets existed, for the great gardens of the convents and private houses of the Rue Saint Honoré stretched right up to the line now occupied by the Rue de Rivoli, and were separated from the Tuileries only by a long and narrow courtyard known as the Cœur du Manège, whilst a still narrower passage, the Passage des Fulents took the place of the Rue Costellione leading from the Rue Saint Honoré to the Porte des Fulents opening into the Tuileries Gardens. The hall of the assembly was entered by two doors, one in the Cœur du Manège, the other in the Passage des Fulents, and it was at this latter entrance that the mob had drawn up demanding admittance. During the delay that ensued the rear guard of the procession continued to pour into the passage which, since the Porte des Fulents was locked, formed a blind alley, and soon became packed to suffocation. Thereupon the crowd, stifling for want of air and wearied with inaction, began to seek an outlet, and whilst one party proceeded to break open the Porte des Fulents and swarm into the gardens of the Tuileries, another bethought themselves of the poplar tree they had brought with them on a cart to represent the Tree of Liberty. Now the planting of this tree was to have formed the principal ceremony of the day, and the people, finding that their leaders had failed to carry out their program, took the law into their own hands and, bursting into the garden of the Capucin convent next to the assembly, amused themselves by planting there the tree of liberty. This diversion ended, the crowd began to grow bored, and were on the point of dispersing when the roll of drums and the strains of the Saira, sounding from the hall of the assembly rallied them once more, and the whole mass moved forward through the doorway. This long delay was undoubtedly an error on the part of the conspirators, for it had taken the first edge off the people's frenzy, who, if they had been marched straight on the Tuileries, might have shown themselves capable of greater violence. As it was, by the time they had finished parading through the hall, not only had they worked off a great part of their excitement, but also, no doubt, the effects of the wine that had inspired their hilarious entry to the assembly. It was nearly four o'clock when at last Santerre, comprehending the necessity of getting to the real business of the day, began to herd his flock towards the exit, crying out in stentorian tones, forward. March. The supreme moment had arrived. The terrible crowd of ragged men and women, victims of vice and misery, were now to consummate the crime that for three years the conspirators had vainly striven to effect. Three times already, on the 17th of July and the 6th of October 1789, and on the 18th of April 1791, 
this same rabble of Paris had been driven forward against their king, and on each occasion had refrained from violence, now for the last time the great attempt was to be made, and, to judge by the ferocious aspect they presented, there seemed little doubt that amongst this savage horde a murderous hand would not be wanting. Santerre and Saint Herge, indeed, were evidently so confident, that the people could be depended on to carry out the crime that, instead of marching at their head as they had done in the morning when leading them to the assembly, they prudently remained behind in the hall. There was every reason to prefer this safe retreat, for today it appeared that the military authorities intended to oppose a very vigorous resistance to any invasion of the chateau. Ten battalions of the National Guard were ranged along the west terrace, two more were stationed at the south end by the river, four other battalions as well as five or six hundred mounted police and twenty cannons guarded the Cur Royale. So on this occasion it was not merely the prime authors of the movement, Brissot, Danton, Pétion, Manuel, who according to their invariable custom remained in the background, but even the mob leaders themselves who retreated into safety, leaving it to the wretched instruments they had collected to do the deed and face the consequences. It is remarkable that in all the accounts of the day we find no mention of any of the usual agitators, Rotondo, Gramont, Malga, or Fournier American, mingling with the crowd at this stage of the proceedings, even there and seems to have vanished, for we hear no more of her after her start for the assembly at the head of her contingent. The mob, left therefore entirely to its own devices, streamed along the Cœur du Manège in the direction of the chateau, and then paused as if uncertain whether to go on to the place du Carousel or whether to break into the garden of the Tuileries by the gate on their right known as the Porte du Dauphin. It was, apparently, Mouché, a little bandy-legged municipal officer stationed at this gateway, who persuaded them to adopt the latter course, and thereupon the whole crowd poured into the garden. But still the uncomprehending herd failed to enter into the designs of the conspirators, for they made no attempt to invade the chateau, which was most accessible from this side, but proceeded along the terrace to the gate leading out onto the quay, and during this march past the troops their behaviour was so peaceable that the king with his family and entourage looking down on the procession from the windows, and watching it file through the gateway with immense relief, concluded the movement to have ended, for a moment it appeared that the 6th of October was not to be repeated. Once outside the garden the crowd turned to the left, but instead of continuing its way along the quay drew up outside the gateway leading into the carousel, where they were met by the extraordinary notice, here posted up, that only people armed, no matter in what way, were to be admitted. In response to this invitation, issued evidently by municipal officers in collusion with the leaders, the whole mob, armed and unarmed, poured into the square. Yet even now the people showed no intention of invading the chateau, but streamed onwards to the Rue saint eyes, apparently with the intention of returning whence they came. The fact is that the day was very hot, and the people having been on their feet since dawn were growing tired of the whole performance. The tree of liberty had been planted, the petition read aloud to the assembly, and now they were ready to go home. But Santerre and Saint Herge had been informed of the hitch in the proceedings, and, realizing that if the invasion of the Tuileries was to be accomplished they must place themselves once more at the head of the movement, they now appeared on the scene. Santerre, addressing his contingent from Saint Antoine, shouted peremptorily, why have you not got into the chateau? We must get in. It was for that we came here. And turning to his gunners he ordered them to follow him with their cannons, declaring that if the doors were closed to them they must be broken down with cannon balls. Then the mob, rallying at the word of command, surged en masse towards the gateway of the Cur Royale. As we have already seen, the troops ranged round the gateway were far more than enough to resist the incursion of the crowd, and although the hundred mounted police in the carousel showed a disinclination to use force, the National Guard at the first onslaught offered a spirited resistance. We will die rather than let them enter, cried some, and others answered, but we have no orders and no officers to command us. And this was true, for Ramon Villiers, their commander, remained absolutely inert, afterwards giving as his reason that having received no orders from the mayor he could not take upon himself to proclaim martial law, but since the mayor was Patreon, the principal organizer of the movement, this omission is hardly surprising. The truth is evidently that, as on the 12th and 14th of July and on the 5th of October 1789, the military leaders were paralyzed by their knowledge of what Mr. Crocker well describes as the king's unfortunate monomania that no blow should ever be struck in his defense. This being so they dared not offer resistance, uncertain as to the consequences if any injury were done to the people. Maintaining, therefore, 
their attitude of strict neutrality, they allowed the mob to advance their cannons and point them against the great gateway of the Kerr Royale. By what perfidy was this gateway at last opened? It is impossible to say with certainty, for just as at the siege of the Bastille an unseen hand had let down the last drawbridge, and at the invasion of Versailles another unseen hand unlocked the gate into the Cœur de Marbre, so by the same mysterious agency the courtyard of the Tuileries was thrown open to the invaders. Santerre, says Roderere, had made sure beforehand of two municipal officers, and these men, rightly calculating on the authority inspired by their scarves of office, now came forward and in imperious tones demanded that the gates should be opened. Whoever then obeyed this order, the fact remains that the great bar fastening the gates was raised from within and instantly the crowd poured into the Cur Royal. Then at last four officers, more courageous than their comrades, Mondar, Pignon, Vernot, and a cloak, a brewer of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, rushed forward to close the doorway leading to the great staircase of the palace, summoning national guards, gunners, and policemen to their aid. But it was too late now to command obedience, the gunners, urged on by Santerre, were already in open rebellion and thrust aside the officers in command. Santerre was still reluctantly compelled to remain at the head of the mob and conduct operations. For even at this crisis the great mass of the people continued to display indifference, and seemed, says Roderere, to be only misled or carried away, or brought there by curiosity, and not to understand that it was an outrage on the king to violate his palace. Several were yawning with fatigue and boredom. It would have been easy to count the men led by violent passions and ferocious designs. Seeing this, a group of law-abiding citizens, who had collected at the foot of the staircase, came forward and angrily apostrophized Santerre, threatening to make him responsible for all the harm that might come from this fatal day, because, they said to him, you alone are the author of this unconstitutional assemblage, you alone have misled these good people, and amongst them all you alone are a scoundrel. At this Santerre turned pale, and exchanging a glance with his ally, the butcher legendary, he turned to his troops and uttered these hypocritical words, Messieurs, draw up an official report of my refusal to march at your head into the king's apartments. Then the ruffians that composed the cowardly brewers following, understanding his intention, threw the honest citizens to the ground, and like a great tidal wave the mob, once more lashed to fury, burst into the chateau. So tremendous was the impetus of that mighty onrush that a cannon, carried by the invaders, was borne upon their shoulders right up the splendid staircase, wreathed with the emblems of Louis XIV, and the arms of Colbert, into the huge Salle des saint Suisse, and there jammed in the doorway, momentarily stemming the tide. But the obstacle was quickly removed with hatchet blows upon the woodwork, and the crowd swept onwards to the Ouïe de Boeuf. Now at last they were on the threshold of that abode of mystery, the king's apartments. Undoubtedly, amongst the great proportion of the people, the predominating emotion at this tremendous moment was curiosity, tinged with superstitious awe, for, in the minds of many of the poor denizens of the Faubourgs, royalty had not yet lost its glamour, in spite of all the agitators' efforts to ridicule and degrade it. But that tumultuous sea nevertheless held dangerous elements, brains that throbbed wildly to the tune of the Sa Ira, hands that closed around murderous weapons in feverish anticipation of coming violence, and in these disordered imaginations superstition assumed a terrible form, it was not Louis XVI, the descendant of Saint Louis, they were now to meet face to face, but that sinister personage Monsieur Vito, Nero, Machiavelli, and Charles IX. In one, the sanguinary monster, and his still more guilty consort, who with diabolical cunning had lulled a confiding people into security whilst planning a second massacre of Saint Barthélemy, perhaps on that same Quai du Louvre their feet had traversed to the chateau. Goaded to frenzy by these visions, the leaders of the mob continued to beat on the closed doors, clamoring loudly for admittance, then, meeting with no response, they proceeded to attack them with their weapons, beneath their savage blows the lower panels yielded and fell inwards, instantly a cluster of pikes was thrust menacingly through the opening. Suddenly from the inside a voice cried out, open. I have nothing to fear from Frenchmen. A Swiss guard threw wide the doors. The crowd surged forward, then, like an angry wave drawing back with a roar of foam, halted in confusion, for before them stood, the king. The sensation produced on the crowd by this sudden apparition, all contemporaries record, was one of stupor, 
they were utterly disconcerted, for here they saw before them no sanguinary monster but a homely personage, none the more imposing for all his powdered hair and embroidered coat, who stood regarding them with an expression of extreme benevolence obviously unmixed with fear. Louis XVI was not afraid at that frightful moment, when the faithful a cloak had rushed into his room, where all the royal family had collected, to announce the incursion of the mob, the king had instantly decided to go forward to meet them, only insisting that the queen, against whom the people's hatred had been principally directed, should remain in safety, and whilst Marie Antoinette, finally prevented by force from following him, was hurried into the bedroom of the Dauphin, the king passed calmly to the Ouïe de Boeuf. With Madame Elizabeth clinging to his arm, and followed by those of his loyal defenders who had remained at his side. Two hours earlier the king, foreseeing the invasion of the chateau, had sent away nearly all his retainers lest their presence should serve to irritate the populace, but several, amongst them the old Maréchal de Mauchy, the bizarre personage the Chevalier de Rougeville, and brave young Canoles, a boy of eighteen who had belonged to the king's old bodyguard, had refused to leave him, others, borrowing pikes and ragged garments from some of the insurgents, mingled with the mob, and thus disguised hovered around the king for his protection. Arrived in the Ouïe de Boeuf, Louis XVI, called four grenadiers of the National Guard to his side, and one of these, de la Chenay, seeing that the doors were about to be broken down, said to the king, Sire, do not be afraid. I am not afraid, answered the king, put your hand on my heart, it is calm and tranquil, and taking the hand of the grenadier he pressed it to his heart, which in truth beat no faster in the face of the appalling danger. What was the secret of the king's intrepidity? Revolutionaries, obliged to admit his amazing sangfroid at this crisis, have tried to explain it by the natural phlegm of his character, but in reality his courage throughout the revolution can always be traced to the same cause, the fact that, as Bertrand de Molville observed, he was never afraid when he was face to face with the people. It was this conviction that from the people themselves he had nothing to fear which had nerved him to take that perilous journey to Paris on the 17th of July 1789, which had enabled him to confront the raging mob on the 6th of October, and which now again on the 20th of June inspired him with the serenity that amazed all beholders. So, by the calm and undaunted aspect of the king, the ragged horde was momentarily brought to bay on the threshold of the Ouï de Boeuf. But certain of the brigands, having recovered from the first shock of surprise, thrust their way into the room, brandishing pikes and sabres as they called aloud for the death of the king. The Swiss guards drew their swords, but Louis XVI interposed, put back your swords in their scabbards I command you. Then a man, armed with a stick to which a spear had been affixed, sprang forward crying out, where is Vito that I may kill him? Whereat young Canoles threw himself on the assassin, and forcing him to his knees at the king's feet obliged him to call out, Vive la Roi. This act of courage had the effect of once more stupefying the crowd, and the king's defenders, profiting by the pause that ensued, succeeded in leading him to a seat in the recess of a window, forming there a rampart round him with their bodies. The heroic band included the four grenadiers of the National Guard, the Maréchal de Mauchy, aged seventy-seven, the intrepid brewer a cloak, and Stephanie de Bourbon Conti, the natural daughter of the Prince de Conti, who had armed herself with a sword and sabre, and throughout the day never ceased defending the king from the onslaughts of his assassins. Meanwhile Madame Elizabeth showed herself no less heroic, hearing the mob crying out for the head of the queen she came forward and, offering her breast to their daggers, said, Here is the queen. Several of her retainers cried out, No, no, she is not the queen, she is Madame Elizabeth. Ah, messieurs, she answered, why undeceive them? Were it not better that they shed my blood than that of my sister? The murderous weapons were lowered, and Madame Elizabeth was placed by her defenders in the embrasure of the window next, to the one occupied by the king. For four terrible hours Louis XVI. And Madame Elizabeth endured the threats and insults of the crowd. All through the hot June afternoon they breathed the fetid atmosphere exhaled by the densely packed mass of rags and nakedness that pressed around them, they saw before their eyes all that was basest and most degraded in human nature, the dregs of foreign countries, above all brigands from the south, vomiting imprecations, dangling before their eyes those horrible emblems, the bleeding heart labelled cur d'aristocrat. A miniature gallows to which a female figure was attached with the words for Antoinette, a guillotine bearing the inscription for the tyrant. 
Close to the king's side a group of men had thrown themselves into the gilded armchairs of the palace, and gathered around a table covered with bottles of wine sat smoking and drinking amidst the tumult. Someone passed a bottle to the king, ordering him to drink the health of the nation, at the same time a cap of liberty was thrust upon his head. Louis XVI. raised the bottle to his lips, exclaiming, People of Paris, I drink to your health and to the health of the French nation. This courageous action, derided by the revolutionaries, went straight to the hearts of the people, who broke out into applause, crying, Vive la nation! Vive la liberty! And even vive la ROI! If only Louis XVI had known how to make the most of this moment, it is possible that the invasion of his palace would have turned into an ovation in his favor, unhappily his slow-moving mind could never devise those happy phrases that exercised so great a power over the emotional Parisians. To this drama-loving people a king who on occasion could strike an attitude, show himself commanding and heroic, must have proved irresistible. Louis XVI was hopelessly undramatic, his speech proceeded always directly from his heart, never from his imagination, he could not calculate effects, declaim to order, play upon the emotions of the mobile crowd as the revolutionary leaders knew so well how to do, and thus at this supreme moment he remained inarticulate, leaving it to his enemies to wrest his victory from him. Legendary pressed forward, and addressed him brutally, Monsieur, you are there to listen to us. You are a traitor, you have always deceived us, you are deceiving us still. But have a care, the measure is overflowing, and the people are tired of being your plaything. And he read aloud a petition filled with threats and insults, expressing the wishes of the people, whose orator he declared himself to be. The king answered calmly, I shall do that which the law and the constitution order me to do. Whilst these scenes were taking place the mayor, Patreon, arrived, and making his way through the crowd addressed the king in these hypocritical words, Sire, I have only this instant heard of the situation in which you have been placed. That is very surprising, Louis XVI. Interrupted brusquely, since this has been going on for two hours. The zeal of the mayor of Paris, Condorcet afterwards had the effrontery to declare, the ascendant that his virtues and his patriotism exercised over the people, prevented all disorders, as a matter of fact his presence served as a direct encouragement to disorder, for, since not a word of protest escaped him during the whole course of the afternoon, the brigands quickly recognized in him an ally and, protected by the support his official position afforded, proceeded to greater violence. Forcing their way to the front of the crowd they lunged at the king with their weapons, which were deflected only by the bayonets of the four courageous grenadiers. Two young men, Clemon and Burgoing, wearing long caps on which the words La Morte were inscribed in large letters, called out loudly for the death of the king and all the royal family. Clemon, taking up his stand beside the mayor, continued to repeat incessantly the parrot phrases composed by the authors of the agitation, Sire. Sire. I demand in the name of the one hundred thousand souls around me the recall of the patriot ministers you have dismissed. I demand the sanction of the decree on the priests and on the twenty thousand men and the fulfillment of the law, or you will perish. Throughout this tirade, accompanied by furious gestures, Patreon uttered no remonstrance, and, not content with complimenting the people on their behavior, afterwards declared to the assembly that no one had been insulted, that no excess or offense had been committed, and the king himself had no cause of complaint. On this day, at any rate, Louis XVI showed himself not only heroic but capable of really amazing resolution. To the reiterated demand for the sanction of the two decrees and the recall of the ministers he replied immovably, this is neither the moment for you to ask nor for me to accord, and in the matter of the decree on the priests he added, I would rather renounce my crown than submit to such a tyranny of consciences. It was at this crisis that a deputation arrived from the assembly. The scene that met their eyes was indescribable, the splendid Salle de l'Oeil de Boeuf presented the appearance of a tavern, through the suffocating atmosphere, thick with the fumes of foul tobacco, Louis XVI. was seen seated in the embrasure of the window, the red cap of liberty still perched upon his powdered head, contemplating his strange guests with perfect tranquility. When the deputies came forward to inform him that the assembly would neglect no means for ensuring his liberty, the king, indicating by a gesture the carousing brigands, the wine bottles, the guns, the pikes, and sanguinary emblems by which he was surrounded, answered briefly, so you see. Then turning to a member of the deputation he added with a sudden rare flash of humor, you who have traveled much, what do you think they would say of us in foreign countries? 
Certain of the deputies venturing to repeat to the king that they had come to ensure his safety, Louis XVI, replied that he was in the midst of the French people and had nothing to fear. Again turning to one of the grenadiers he placed the man's hand on his heart, saying, see whether this is the movement of a heart agitated by fear. The intrepid attitude of the king was not without its effect on his assailants, and by eight o'clock in the evening it became evident that little hope remained of his assassination. Pachon, therefore realizing that nothing was now to be gained by further agitation, decided that the moment had come to pose as the restorer of law and order. Accordingly, mounting an armchair, he addressed the crowd of pikes and rags, the bearers of toy guillotines and gibbets, the drunken and half-naked brigands from the south, in the following words, People, you have shown yourselves worthy of yourselves. You have preserved all your dignity amidst acute alarms. No excess has sullied your sublime movements. Hope and believe that your voice will at last be heard. But night approaches, and its shadows might favor the attempts of ill-disposed persons to glide into your bosom. People, withdraw yourselves. The mob, comprehending that this was really an order to disperse, showed themselves only too eager to comply and surged towards the doors. But the leaders had resolved to make a further venture and, instead of herding the people towards the staircase, led them to the council chamber where the queen and her children had taken refuge. Santerre had already preceded them thither. On the arrival of the deputies, realizing the failure of the movement, he had been heard to mutter angrily, Le coup est manqué. But if the king had succeeded in overawing that foolish herd, the people, the queen might still serve to rouse their fury, so collecting a horde of brigands around him, and followed by a large portion of the mob, he had set forth in search of this further victim. Now on the first incursion of the crowd into the chateau, whilst the main army attacked the Ouida de Boeuf, a band of furies had broken into the queen's apartments on the ground floor and ransacked every corner in the hunt for their prey. Meanwhile Marie Antoinette, upstairs in the Dauphin's bedroom, vainly endeavoured to follow Louis XVI. Into the Ouida de Boeuf. Let me pass, she cried to the gentleman who barred her way, my place is with the king. I will join him, or perish if necessary in defending him. But convinced at last that any attempt to penetrate the sea of pikes that separated her from Louis XVI must prove the signal for bloodshed, she allowed herself to be drawn into the embrasure of the window in the Salle de Conseil. It was here that Santerre and his horde discovered her. Behind the great council table Marie Antoinette sat surrounded by her ladies, Madame de Tourzel, Madame de la Roche-Aimon, Madame de Mille, and the heroic Princess de Tarrant, ready to shed the last drop of her blood in defense of the Queen. By the side of Marie Antoinette stood little Madame Royale, the Dauphin was seated on the table with his mother's arms around him. In front several rows of grenadiers belonging to the loyal battalion of the Fils on Tomar were drawn up. Santerre roughly ordered this bodyguard to stand aside, make way that the people may see the Queen. Instantly the crowd rushed forward pouring forth imprecations, but at the sight of the grenadiers paused uncertainly. One woman, bolder than the rest, flung a red cap of liberty down on the table, and in foul language ordered the queen to place it on the head of the dauphin. The hideous badge of the galley slave was drawn over the boy's fair curls. The queen and the brave women around her endured their terrible ordeal without a sign of weakness. When the main body of the ragged army, after evacuating the Ouida de Boeuf, were driven through the Chambre de Conseil past the council table, Marie Antoinette looked still unmoved at the ghastly emblems thrust before her eyes, the gibbet from which her effigy was suspended, the banners bearing obscene legends, she heard without a tremor the furious imprecations mouthed at her by the disheveled furies, and, as on the 6th of October, ended by disarming her assailants. The strange power, that had touched even the corrupt heart of Mirabeau, that had changed Barnet from a sanguinary demagogue into a royalist ready to die in her defence, that later was to win reluctant admiration from her jailers and ring pity from the trecateurs at the Revolutionary Tribunal, gradually made itself felt amongst the women crazed with drink and revolutionary frenzy who gazed at her across the council table at the Tuileries. Some of the furies in the crowd, melted to tenderness by the sight of the Queen, after all a woman and a mother like themselves, sheltering with her arm her little son who looked with wondering eyes at the strange spectacle before him, cried out that they would shed the last drop of their blood for the Queen and the Dauphin. Another, better remembering her lesson, began to pour forth fresh invectives, whereat the Queen asked gently, Have I done you any injury? No, said the woman, but it is you who cause the unhappiness of the nation. So they have told you, 
answered Marie Antoinette, but you have been deceived. I am the wife of the King of France, the mother of the Dauphin. I am French, never again shall I see my own country. I can only be happy or unhappy in France. I was happy when you loved me. Then the fury, bursting into tears, besought the Queen's pardon, sobbing out, it was that I did not know. I see now how good you are. At this Santerre, stupefied at the turn affairs had taken, exclaimed, what is the matter with this woman that she weeps thus? She must be drunk with wine. But a moment later Santerre, pushing his way through the crowd, found himself face to face with the queen and suddenly fell likewise beneath her spell. Planting his two fists on the table he roughly ordered the bystanders to take the red cap off the head of the dauphin, who was stifling beneath its heat, then turning to the queen he said, Ah, madam, have no fear, I do not wish to harm you, I would rather defend you. But quickly repenting of his weakness he added brutally, Remember that it is dangerous to deceive the people. At these words Marie Antoinette raised her head and, looking Santerre imperiously in the eye, exclaimed with indignation, It is not by you, monsieur, that I judge the people. Santerre, utterly cowed by this reply, had no thought but to beat as hasty a retreat as possible. Turning to his brigand horde he gave the order to march, and pushing the rest of the crowd brutally before him he drove them like trembling sheep from the room. So in the growing twilight the mighty human tide ebbed from the chateau of the Tuileries, leaving the great rooms in solitude and stupor. The royal family, once more united, fell weeping into one another's arms. The terrible ordeal was at last ended. A few moments later several deputies arrived from the assembly, one turning to the queen, standing amidst the wreckage left by the invaders, the broken furniture, the shattered panels, the doors torn from their hinges, observed with unconscious irony, without excusing everything, you must admit, madam, that the people have shown themselves to be kind-hearted. The king and I, monsieur, answered Marie Antoinette, are persuaded of the natural kindness of the people, they are unkind only when they are misled. That the king could have been assassinated on this 20th of June if the people had felt any unanimous desire for his death, there can be no doubt whatever. What could his handful of defenders have availed against the determined onslaught of a mob numbering many thousand armed men? If the people had wished to kill him, he must have perished then. But on this point all contemporaries are agreed. The great majority of the crowd seemed throughout struck with stupor, and showed no inclination to join in the insults and bloodthirsty threats of the leaders. Santerre, driving his herd down the staircase of the chateau, was heard to exclaim angrily, the king was difficult to move today, but we will return tomorrow and make him evacuate. But some poor creatures, all in rags, murmured to each other, it would be a pity, somehow, he looks like a good sort of fellow. The day after the invasion of the Tuileries a witness, who appeared before a magistrate of Paris, related that he had traversed the whole Faubourg Saint Antoine to discover the disposition of the people, that in and in close to the Bayer du Tron he had listened to several men talking, and overheard these words, yes, we might have been able. But when we saw, it is so imposing. And then we are Frenchmen. Sacred you. If it had been anyone else we could have wrung his neck like a child's. But he comes and he says, here I am. Here I am. Dot the witness added that he had seen several of these men who had been led away by Santerre, and they assured him that the majority of the citizens of the Faubourg were distressed at the action taken towards the king, that it had not been their intention, and that one could be sure it would never happen again, and that there was something behind all this. The authors of the movement, however, knew no relenting. Madame Roland, hearing of the Queen's sufferings on that dreadful afternoon, cried out incontrollably, Ah! How I should have loved to look on at her long humiliation! But Manon's triumph was mingled with bitter disappointment. From the point of view of both Girondins and Orleanists the day had proved a failure, it was not merely to humiliate the royal family they had planned the invasion of the Tuileries, the great coup of the day, as Santerre said, had failed. The people, like Balaam's ass, had been driven forward for the fourth time against the king, and, seeing the angel with the flaming sword before them in the pathway, had refused to move in spite of blows and curses. So the crime from which the lowest rabble of the Faubourgs had shrunk was left to men of education, to philosophers, and intellectuals to execute. Effects of the 20th of June. The true people, the great mass of the citizens of Paris, had, of course, taken no part in the 20th of June. For the honor of our country, cries Pujula, and for the sake of historical truth, 
it must be known that the crimes and ignominies of the French Revolution were not the work of the French nation. The people of Paris were not beneath the filthy banners of Santerre, Saint Herge, and Thayen, they were around the Tuileries on the 21st of June, raging against these criminal attempts, pitying the king and queen, cursing Pétion, the Gironde, and the Jacobins, and signing their protestations. All over France a great storm of indignation arose, addresses poured in from the provinces, denouncing in vehement language the efforts of the factions to overthrow the king and constitution. The department of the Par de Calais has learnt with horror what took place in the king's palace on the 20th of the month, Rouen declares the country to be in danger, and demands justice of the assembly, punish the authors of the offences committed on the 20th of this month at the Chateau of the Tuileries. It is a public outrage, it is an attempt on the rights of the French people who will not accept laws from a few brigands in the capital, we ask you for vengeance. The Department of the Aisne urges the Assembly to suppress the Jacobins and cease from dissensions, put an end to the scandal of your divisions. Put an end to the intolerable oppression, the revolting tyranny of the tribunes, the galleries occupied by the claques of the factions. The factions of the capital have not the right to dictate public opinion. The opinion of Paris is only the opinion of the 83rd part of the empire. We demand vengeance for the execrable day of June the 20th, day of imperishable shame for Paris, of mourning for all France. The 20th of June, who were records, produced a salutary commotion in all minds. The National Guards, more than ever roused, offered to the King their services and their entire devotion. The inhabitants of Paris, who were particularly answerable to France for the king's safety since he left Versailles, ashamed of the excesses that had just been committed in their name, demanded reparation and vengeance. A petition addressed to the assembly bore 20,000 signatures, it was called the Petition of the 20,000. Nearly all the departments of France set themselves to deliberate, and forwarded unanimous demands for the punishment of the outrage. They offered to send all the forces that might be needed, it was a universal competition, it seemed as if all France had raised her arm to annihilate the factions. Needless to say, every effort was made by the Jacobins to suppress the reporting of these addresses, to silence the orators who were sent to read them aloud at the assembly, to discredit the authors, to prove the signatures fraudulent, and also to provide counterblasts in the form of bogus addresses approving the events of June 20th, and purporting to come from the provinces and from the sections of Paris. Thus, for example, on June 25th, a deputation from Saint Antoine, calling itself the men of the 14th of July, presented itself at the assembly, led by the professional orator, Gonkin, who proceeded to deliver a furious revolutionary harangue beginning with these words, legislators, it is we fathers of families, it is we, the conquerors of the Bastille, it is we who are persecuted, outraged, and calumniated, etc. But where amongst this band of petitioners were the conquerors of the Bastille to be found? Where were the men of the 14th of July, Ailey, Hullin, Tournay, Bonimir, the real heroes of that day? We may look for them in vain amongst the ruffianly followers of Gonkin, but if we go into the gardens of the Tuileries we shall discover Hullin at that very moment otherwise employed. At half past twelve of this same day, a gendarme national reported to the Jacobin Club, he had met the king in the Tuileries followed by a crowd of brigands, at the head of which was Monsieur Hullin following the king, and calling out with all his might, Vive la ROI. A sub-lieutenant answered with the cry of Vive la Nation, whereat the brave Hullin dealt him a heavy blow on the head, and but for the interposition of the gendarme would have marched him off to prison. This, then, was the attitude of the real men of the 14th of July to the Second Revolution, not one of their names occurs in the accounts of the outrages committed at the Tuileries or in the revolutionary deputations, and the only men of the First Revolution whose services the leaders were able to enlist were a couple of cut throats, one of which named Soudin had distinguished himself by washing the heads of Faulon and Berthier and delivering them as trophies to the mob. As for Gonkin himself, who had now passed from the Orleanists into the pay of the Girondins, Camille de Milan afterwards revealed that he had received over 2,000 francs from Roland merely for reading the bogus petition to the assembly. By methods such as these the voice of the true people was stifled, and the character of the French nation misrepresented to the whole civilized world. Nowhere were the outrages of June 20th more bitterly resented than in the armies on the frontier. Lafayette at last, overwhelmed with protests from his men, decided to leave Luckner in command and hastened to Paris. 
Presenting himself at the bar of the assembly he denounced, in burning words, the efforts of the conspirators to overthrow the monarchy and constitution, the violence committed at the chateau on the 20th of this month has excited the alarm of all good citizens, I have received addresses from the different corps of my army. Officers, non-commissioned officers, and men are one, and herein express their patriotic hatred of the factions. Already many of them wonder whether it is really the cause of liberty they are defending. I implore, in my own name and in that of all honest men, that the assembly should take efficacious measures to make constituted authority respected, and to give the army the assurance that no attacks will be made on the constitution from the inside, whilst they are shedding their blood to protect it from outside enemies. In spite of the insults with which the Girondins greeted these words, Lafayette succeeded in maintaining his popularity, and he was followed through the streets by crowds shouting, Down with the Jacobins! But once again the hero of the two worlds, showed his lamentable weakness. If at this crisis he had used his power and finally closed down the Jacobin club, the whole situation might have been saved. The plan was proposed to him by a deputation of National Guards, who declared that if he would place himself at their head and march with two cannons to the Rue Saint Honoré, they would undertake to clear the building. But Lafayette, always halting between two opinions, detestation of sedition mongers on one hand and fear of the ultra-royalists on the other, refused to accede to the proposal of his grenadiers. If, under these circumstances, the Queen declined to avail herself of his services, is it altogether surprising? It would be better to perish than to be saved by Lafayette, she cried, when at this juncture he came forward as champion of the monarchy. What reason, indeed, had she to trust him? Lafayette, who before the siege of the Bastille had declared that insurrection was the most sacred of duties, and had then denounced the tumults of July, who had convicted the Duc d'Orléans of conspiring to usurp the throne, and had then facilitated his return to France, who had subjected the king and queen to the humiliations of his intolerable jailership, and then talked of the respect due to the person of the monarch, who at one moment declared himself the opponent of disorders, and the next joined in singing Saira, what dependence was to be placed on such a weathercock. Throughout the whole course of the revolution it was rather as the enemy of the Duc d'Orléans than as the supporter of Louis XVI. That he had defended the throne, towards the royal family he had displayed neither sympathy nor allegiance, only when Orleanism raised its head Lafayette's hand went to his sword and he became the champion of royalty. In this second revolution he saw undoubtedly a revival of the hated conspiracy, but what guarantee was there that, once he had again succeeded in crushing it, he would not use his power to tyrannize over the king. So Lafayette, chilled by his reception at the court, left Paris and returned to the frontier, whilst the Orleanists triumphantly burnt his effigy in the Palais Royal. Yet the 20th of June had disappointed the hopes of the conspirators, as indeed of all the revolutionary intrigues, Orleanists, Girondins, subversives, Prussians, English Jacobins alike had met with a severe reverse. For not only had the invasion of the Tuileries shown the king in his true character to the nation, but in arousing public indignation all over France had revealed the true desires of the nation to the world. So the day had ended not only in a victory for the king but for the people. The siege of the Tuileries. La Poterie en danger. The fiasco of June 20 and the energetic protests of the nation convinced the revolutionary leaders that such flimsy pretexts as the dismissal of the three patriot ministers and the king's veto on the two decrees would not avail to bring about the deposition of Louis XVI, and that consequently some more potent means must be employed to rouse the people. Calumny and corruption had failed, but terror might yet prove effectual. The fear of foreign invasion was one that they well knew could always be depended on to rouse the patriotism of the nation, so when at the beginning of July Prussian troops arrived on the frontier, an admirable pretext was provided for creating a panic throughout the country by the proclamation of La Poterie en danger. The country certainly was now in danger of invasion, for the outrages endured by the royal family on the 20th of June had not only incensed the king's brothers and the émigrés, but had alarmed the Emperor of Austria and the King of Prussia. Frederick William at last realized, that the revolutionary propaganda he had helped to disseminate had gone too far and was endangering the cause of monarchy, consequently some feint must be made of marching to the rescue of the royal family of France, but that he was never disinterested in this intention cannot be doubted in the light of after events. True, the famous Manifesto of Brunswick, which was proclaimed in Paris on the 3rd of August, expressed the deepest concern for the safety of the King and Queen of France, but merely had the effect of greatly aggravating the danger of their position. 
According to the terms of this proclamation, the Emperor of Austria and the King of Prussia announce that the great interest nearest to their hearts is that of ending the domestic anarchy of France, of arresting the attacks which are directed against the altar and the throne, of re-establishing the legitimate power, of giving back to the king the freedom and safety of which he is deprived, etc. At this point the manifesto strikes a more diplomatic note, for it goes on to say, Convinced as they are that the healthy portion of the French people abhors the excesses of a party that enslaves them, and that the majority of the inhabitants are impatiently awaiting the advent of a relief that will permit them to declare themselves openly against the odious schemes of their oppressors, His Majesty the Emperor, and His Majesty the King of Prussia summon them to return at once to the call of reason and justice, of order and of peace. The first part of this passage was undoubtedly true, the vast majority of the nation was impatiently awaiting deliverance from the intolerable oppression of the Jacobins, but to follow up this conciliatory overture with commands and threats was to alienate even that loyal portion of the people who would have rallied around the standard of the king. Thus although their majesties are represented as declaring that they have no intention of interfering with the internal government of France, and that their combined armies will protect all towns and villages which submit to the king of France, Nevertheless those inhabitants who fire on the troops will be punished with all the rigor of the laws of war, further, that if the Tuileries are again invaded, or the least assault perpetrated against the royal family, their imperial and royal majesties will take an exemplary, and never to be forgotten vengeance by giving up the town of Paris to military execution, and to total subversion, and the guilty rebels to the death they have deserved. This amazingly injudicious document, which is frequently regarded as a monument of Prussian or of royal arrogance, was in reality not the work of a foreigner or of a royal prince at all, but of a French émigré, the Marquis de Limon, formerly financial adviser to the Duc d'Orléans, and though approved by the Emperor and the King of Prussia, it met with violent remonstrance from the democratic Duke of Brunswick, who at first refused to append his signature to it, and only complied at last in obedience to the commands of the aforesaid monarchs. According to Bewley, de Limon consulted in the matter a certain Hayman, who had served in a regiment of the Duc d'Orléans, both these men had formerly played an active part in the Orleanist conspiracy. It is not, therefore, impossible that the famous manifesto was inspired by Orleanist influence, and that the misguided Comte de Fersen, and through his influence Marie Antoinette, in according it their approval played into the hands of their enemies. Fersen, always illusioned as to the good faith of the King of Prussia, undoubtedly imagined that the armies of Prussia could be counted on to save the royal family, and, realizing the cowardice of the revolutionary leaders, he believed that the threat of reprisals might be used with advantage to intimidate them. But the revolutionary leaders, better acquainted with the real policy of Frederick William, were not intimidated, and in their turn made use of the manifesto to alarm the French people. The people of France, though less alarmed than revolutionary writers would have us suppose, were, nevertheless, indignant at the truculent tone of the manifesto. No country, writes Dr. Moore, who arrived in Paris this August, ever displayed a nobler or more patriotic enthusiasm than pervades France at this moment, and which glows with increasing ardor since the publication of the Duke of Brunswick's manifesto, and the entrance of the Prussians into the country. The revolutionary leaders were clever enough to exploit this spirit of patriotism to the utmost, but, as we have seen, the attitude of certain men amongst them towards Brunswick was far from antagonistic. On the 21st of July, just a week before the publication of the manifesto, the author of the correspondence secret writes, it is said that it still enters into the plans of the Jacobins to come to an understanding with the Duke of Brunswick by offering him the crown of France. Four days later this rumor was confirmed in the press, for on July 25th, that is to say the very day that Brunswick signed the manifesto prepared for him, Cara published the following passage in his Annal Patriotiques, nothing is so foolish as to believe, or to wish to make us believe, that the Prussians desire to destroy the Jacobins. These same Jacobins ever since the revolution have never ceased to cry aloud for the rupture of the Treaty of 1756, and for the formation of alliances with the House of Brandenburg, i.e. Hohenzollern, and of Hanover, whilst the Gazetteers, directed by the Austrian Committee of the Tuileries, have never ceased praising Austria, and insulting the courts of Berlin and La Haye. No, these courts are not so clumsy as to wish to destroy those Jacobins who have such fortunate ideas for changes of dynasties, and which, in case of need, can serve considerably the interests of the houses of Brandenburg and Hanover against Austria. Do you think the celebrated Duke of Brunswick does not know on what to rely in all this? He is the greatest warrior and the greatest politician in Europe, the Duke of Brunswick, he is very well educated, and very amiable, he needs perhaps only a crown to be, 
I will not say the greatest king in the world, but the true restorer of liberty in Europe. If he arrives in Paris, I wager that his first step will be to come to the Jacobins and put on the bonnet rouge. It will be urged that these sentiments were those of only an individual, or of one faction in the Jacobin club, but how are we to explain the fact that no protest was raised by any of the other revolutionary leaders, and that all these so-called patriots remained on the best of terms with the man who would have handed over the country to foreign despotism? Moreover, when later on a delegate was needed to send to the frontier in order to parley with the Prussians, Kara was one of the emissaries chosen by the leaders. Not till long after were his treasonable proposals brought up against him by the Robespierreists, and then only as the means for destroying a rival faction. What conclusion can we draw from all this but that the Jacobins had an understanding with Brunswick, and that although the plan of offering him the throne was not entertained by all of them, they were all nevertheless interested in remaining on good terms with him until they had overthrown the monarchy and finally usurped the reins of power. The Manifesto of Brunswick, which reached Paris three days after the publication of Kara's panegyric on its supposed author, merely served to moderate the ardor of the pro-German party for Brunswick and revive their enthusiasm for a Hanoverian monarch. On August 1 oh, the author of the correspondence secret writes again, the Duke of Brunswick has fallen in the estimation of the Jacobins since his manifesto, they think less of offering him the throne. Their present system is for a republic. However, they are waiting to see what form public opinion will take in this respect during the interregnum. They talk again of the Duke of York. According to the Memoir de Bear, the supporters of this change of dynasty were now Brissot, Pétion, Guardet, Genjona, and Rabord de Saint-Étienne. On the 17th of July, a deputy of the Legislative Assembly wrote to Bear, on the staircase of the Commission des Ons, at the Assembly, Brissot said to his associates of the moment, I will show you this evening, in my correspondence with the Cabinet of St. James's, that it depends on us to amalgamate our constitution with that of England by making the Duke of York a constitutional monarch in the place of Louis XVI. As usual, of course, the English government was used as a cover to the design concerted with the English revolutionaries. Brissot's lie is definitely refuted by the author of the correspondence secret, who records that the King of England, hearing of this intrigue, wrote to Louis XVI to warn him that the Duke d'Orléans was scheming to give the crown of France to the Duke of York with the hand of Mill. D'Orléans? These, then, were the intrigues at work amongst the Jacobins, whilst the Prussians and Austrians were assembling on the frontier. Of all the revolutionary legends, the legend of the patriotic fervor displayed by the leaders is the most absurd of all, the menace of foreign invasion served as a pretext for stirring up the people, not against the invaders, but against the King of France. Whilst on the 11th of July the citizens of Paris, in response to the proclamation of La Potrie en danger, were pouring into the recruiting tents to offer themselves for the defense of the country, revolutionary orators, posted at the street corners, endeavored to check their ardor. Unhappy ones! Where are you flying to? Think of the chiefs under which you must march against the enemy. Your principal officers are nearly all nobles, a Lafayette will lead you to butchery. Ah! Do you not see that beneath the blinds at the Tuileries they are smiling ferociously at your generous but blind enthusiasm? It is only necessary, says Monsieur Mortimer Turneau, to glance through the journal de la Société des Amis de la Constitution, i.e. of the Society of Jacobins, to see that at the moment when the National Assembly is devoting all its energies to national defense, the Jacobins only speak of our armies in order to denounce the treachery of the generals, and to excite the soldiers against their officers. They are much less occupied with the means of defending the frontiers from invasion than in overwhelming the monarchy. The arrival of the Marseillais. Amongst the mob orators the supporters of the Duc d'Orléans were the most active. His creditors, writes Barbarou, his hirelings, his boon companions, Mara and his cordeliers, all the swindlers, all the men sunk in debt and dishonor, were seen at work in public places, urging the deposition, of the king, greedy of gold and honors, under a regent who would have been their accomplice and their tool. In order to give a popular air to this clamor for the overthrow of Louis XVI, the usual method of deputations was adopted, and, by way of swelling their numbers, men known as Confederates, from the camp at Soissons, were enlisted in the service of the Jacobins. These petitions, says Bewley, these incendiary addresses which demanded the head of Lafayette, and the extermination of the king, were not the work of these confederates, all these were concocted at the private committee of the Jacobins, they, the confederates, 
only read them aloud so that the deluded people should believe that the overthrow of the throne was desired by the departments. At the same time a council, known as the Committee of Insurrection, was formed, which held most of its sittings at a tavern in Chorinton known as La Carda and Bleu, and included amongst its leading members Cara, Santerre, the German Westerman, Fournier American, and the Pole Lazowski. On the evening of the 26th of July this committee met at the Tavern of the Soleil d'Or, at the entrance of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, for the purpose of organizing a second march on the Tuileries. Every effort was made to excite the people, placards were displayed ordering them to join the march, and panic news was circulated to the effect that Chabot and Merlin had been assassinated by the Chevalier du Poignard, and that the Chateau was arming itself against the citizens. But, although the agitators worked hard all night, the Faubourg on this occasion absolutely declined to rise. In vain, at four o'clock in the morning, the four hundred or five hundred Confederates, whom the leaders had succeeded in collecting, sounded the tocsin and beat the General in Saint-Antoine, only a few inhabitants armed with pikes and guns responded to the summons, whilst Cara, dispatched to saint Marceau to find out what had happened to prevent the Faubourg arriving on the scene, found the whole quarter wrapped in the most perfect tranquillity. That is to say, in slumber. Throughout the whole of this month the people displayed the same apathy towards the revolutionary movement. I am convinced, writes a contemporary on the 7th of July, that our sedition mongers and enrage are beginning to be afraid, and all that they do denotes this. They would like to stir up the people to commit excesses, but I doubt whether they will succeed. They will work up the scoundrels under their orders whom they pay, but in general, what can be described as the people, the workmen and bourgeoisie, do not think like these gentlemen. They are tired, wearied, and worn out with this wretched revolution, which produces nothing but evils, crimes, disorders, anarchy, and can do no good. I walk about and observe impartially the groups that assemble, and I can assure you that, except for a few fanatics who preach murder and regicide, I can see no general inclination to insurrection. To the revolutionary leaders likewise it was now clearly evident that the people would never be persuaded to cooperate in the dethronement of Louis XVI. Mara, indeed, had long despaired of them altogether, the Parisians, he said to Barbarou, were but pitiable revolutionaries, de Mesquin's revolutionaire, give me two hundred Neapolitans armed with daggers, and with them I will overrun France and make a revolution. It was a perception of the same truth that in the early days of the revolution had led the Orleanist conspirators to send for brigands from the south, and later to enlist Italians in the company of the Sabbat. Mara's advice was not lost on Barbarou. This young lawyer from Marseille, had been discovered by Roland, and introduced to the deputies of the Gironde. It was thus that Barbarou came to play an active part in the preparations for the loath of August, and that, acting on the suggestion of Mara, he discussed with Monsieur and Madame Roland the advisability of appealing to the South for aid. The result of these deliberations, Barbarou relates, was a message to Marseille asking for six hundred men who knew how to die, that is to say, six hundred men who knew how to kill. It is evident, however, that the celebrated contingent of 500 who arrived in Paris on the 30th of July, were only a small proportion of the number summoned by the Girondins, for thousands had already arrived in the course of the month. An honest deputy of Marseille named Blanc Gilly, seeing these bloodthirsty legions arriving in the capital, thereupon published a letter to the good citizens of Paris revealing the identity of the so-called Marseillais, the town of Marseille, situated on the Mediterranean wrote Blanc Gilly on the 5th of July, must be considered on account of its port as the sink of vice for a great portion of the globe, where all the impurities of human nature foregather. It is there that we constantly see in fermentation the scum of crime, vomited by the prisons of Genoa, of Piedmont, of Sicily, in fact of all Italy, of Spain, of the archipelago and of Barbary, deplorable fatality of our geographical position and of our commercial relations. This is the scourge of Marseille, and the first cause of the frenzy attributed to all its citizens. Every time that the National Guards of Marseille have set forth on the march outside its walls, the horde of brigands without a country of their own has never failed to throw itself in their wake, and to carry devastation everywhere on their path. Several thousands of these brigands have for more than a month been arriving in Paris, a very large number is still on the road. I have sent numerous warnings to the administration. Such, then, were the foreign legions that the men who accused Louis XVI of appealing for aid from abroad saw fit to summon to their own aid for the massacring of their fellow citizens. 
The final contingent of 500 that arrived in Paris on 30 July, romantically described by historians as the brave band of Marseillais, children of the South and Liberty, singing their national hymn, the Marseillais, included the same men who had carried out the horrible massacre of the Glossier d'Avignon, and were to repeat like atrocities in Paris this September. As to the magnificent melody they had appropriated, it had nothing whatever to do with Marseille, but had been composed three months earlier at Strasbourg, at the request of the Mayor Dietrich, by Rouget de Lille, who little dreamt that his trumpet call to arms against foreign cohorts would become the war cry of an alien cohort far more terrible than any gathered on the frontier. It seems, indeed, that the Girondins themselves, seeing the instruments they had summoned to their aid, were overcome with panic, for it was not by Roland or his colleagues that the Marseillais were received, but by Santerre, Danton, and the other leaders of the Orleanist faction. It was the 30th of July, writes Thibault, that these hideous confederates, vomited by Marseille, arrived in Paris. I do not think it would be possible to imagine anything more frightful than these 500 madmen, three quarters of them drunk, nearly all of them in red caps with bare arms, followed by the dregs of the people, ceaselessly reinforced by the overflow of the Faubourgs, Saint Antoine and Saint Marceau, and fraternizing in tavern after tavern with bands as fearful as the one they formed. It was in this manner that they processed in farandoles through the principal streets and boulevards, to the Champs Elysees, where the orgy to which they had been bidden by Santerre was preceded by satanic dances. This orgy was held, evidently with intention, close to a restaurant where about 100 grenadiers of the Fils Antomar, the most loyal of all the king's guards, were holding a regimental dinner. The Marseillais, collecting a crowd of women and children, proceeded to pelt the soldiers with mud and stones, and ended by killing one and wounding several others. The grenadiers thereupon took refuge in the Tuileries, where the queen dressed their wounds, and this action was immediately interpreted by the revolutionaries as a plot concerted between the court and the regiment. The deposition of the king proposed. In vain Louis XVI implored the factions to unite in face of the peril with which the Manifesto of Brunswick threatened France, to assure them that he was one with his people at this moment of national crisis. Personal dangers, he wrote to the Assembly, are nothing compared with public misfortunes. Ah! What are personal dangers, for a king from whom it is desired to take away the love of his people? That is the sore that rankles in my heart. C'est la que la véritable play de mon coeur. One day perhaps the people will know how dear their welfare is to me, how it has always been my only interest and my greatest need. What grief might be dispelled by the least sign of their returning to me. The response to this appeal was a deputation, headed by Pétion, from the Commune de Paris reiterating the demand for the dethronement of the king, in which, for want of any better grounds of accusation, Louis XVI was denounced for his sanguinary projects against the town of Paris, the aversion he displayed towards the people, even for his action in the matter of closing the hall of the assembly on the day of the oath of the tennis court three years earlier. But Pétion showed his hand in one significant sentence, as it is very doubtful that the nation can have confidence in the existing dynasty, a provisional government must be established. The words were universally interpreted to signify a change from the Bourbons to the House of Orleans, but they might equally well apply to the proposal for replacing Louis XVI by a German monarch. Pétion's speech was followed next day by a resolution forwarded from the revolutionary section of Paris, known as More Conseil, likewise demanding the deposition of the king. 47 out of the 48 sections of Paris, revolutionary historians assure us, supported this resolution, and in confirmation of their statement they quote the Journal of Cara. As a matter of fact, an examination of the registers of the sections made by Monsieur Mortimer Turneau reveals the fact that the proposition of Morconseil was seconded by only 14 sections of Paris, rejected by 16, passed over in silence by 10, whilst the reply of the remaining eight sections is unrecorded. Several sections, indeed, entered very energetic protests at the assembly, denouncing the efforts made to divide the citizens of the empire, to a light civil war, and to substitute the most horrible anarchy for the constitution. The astonishing fact is that the petition of Morconseil was finally annulled as unconstitutional by the assembly at the proposal of Vergniaud, who only a month earlier had delivered himself of the most violent diatribe against the king. Brissot likewise at this moment displayed a sudden attachment to the monarchy and constitution, 
for although on the 9th of July he had formally asked for the deposition of the king, declaring that to strike down the court of Tuileries was to strike down all traitors at a blow, he came forward on the 25th of July to denounce that faction of regicides who would create a dictator and establish a republic. If that pact of regicides exists, he exclaimed, if men exist who now seek to establish the republic on the ruins of the constitution, the sword of the law should strike at them, as at the counter-revolutionaries of Koblenz. Again, on the following day, Brissot represented to the assembly that, as the king's collusion with the enemies of France had not been clearly proved, it would be premature to depose him. Moreover, might not the nation have something to say in the matter? Brissot only voiced the fear that lurked in the minds of all the revolutionary leaders when he described the possible consequences of overthrowing the monarchy and constitution. Do you not see from that moment the gates of the kingdom opened by the French themselves to foreigners? Do you not see these Frenchmen shaking the hands of these foreigners, and inviting them to join with them in re-establishing their constitution and maintaining the king on the throne in spite of the efforts of the factions? Thus, in the opinion of one of the most prominent revolutionary leaders, it was not only the Queen and her party who sighed for Brunswick, but many of the French people, who, before the arrival of the Manifesto, would have welcomed even foreign intervention in order to be saved from the intolerable tyranny of the Jacobins. What was the explanation of the Girondins' sudden change of front at this crisis? Simply that they had perceived the revolutionary movement to be passing out of their hands into those of the Cordeliers and Robespierreists, and were ready to accept any measures that would bring their own party back to power. It would, indeed, be idle to seek a more exalted policy amongst any of the revolutionary factions at this crisis, for none adhered consistently to any definite scheme of government. Amidst all this chaos, this general confusion, say the two friends of liberty, some wanted the deposition of the monarch, others his suspension, these, that he should let himself be ruled by them, those, that he should give up the crown to his son, that one of them should be regent, and that all the offices in the state should be reserved for them. A great number called the Duc d'Orléans to the throne, some thought of a foreign prince, and seven or eight people of a republic. This wild medley of plans explains the fact that members of each faction in turn became alarmed, and at the last moment, before the monarchy was overthrown, secretly offered their services to the king. In the whirlpool that threatened to engulf them all none knew who would sink and who would swim, and so, struck with panic, they turned and clung to the Ark of the Constitution that contained the king and that, as they all knew, was born on that mighty tide, the will of the people. It was thus that, at the eleventh hour, Brissot, Vernio, and Genjorna, through an intermediary, the painter Bose, warned the king of the impending insurrection, and undertook to quell it if the Girondon ministers were recalled and the decrees they had proposed sanctioned by the king. Louis XVI. rejected this proposal, and so his deposition was irrevocably decreed by those who had just declared that the salvation of France lay in the constitution. Robespierre also at this juncture continued to defend the constitution, his colleague, the retired comedian, Calude Herboy, repeated incessantly, Ah! If the king were really a patriot he would choose his ministers and his agents among the Jacobins. But Louis XVI. distrusted this faction likewise, and so these men obtaining nothing in one direction turned to the other and proclaimed themselves republicans whilst becoming anarchists. Meanwhile the Cordeliers, the principal instigators of the insurrection, were prepared to go to far greater extremities to save the king, provided they were sufficiently compensated for the enterprise. Mara, says Barbaroux, sent me, towards the end of July, a document of several pages, which he asked me to have printed and distributed to the Marseillais at the moment of their arrival. The work seemed to me abominable, it was a provocation to the Marseillais to fall upon the legislative assembly. The royal family, it said, must be safeguarded, but the assembly, evidently anti-revolutionary, exterminated. This statement of Barbaroux is confirmed by my court, who relates that only a few days later, at the beginning of August, another Cordelier, Fabre de Glantine, the friend and confidant of Danton, made precisely the same proposal to Monsieur Dobuchige, the Minister of the Navy, with whom he had obtained an interview by writing several times to the King. Fabre de Glantine presented himself at the rendezvous, and after great protestations of interest and zeal for the King, of esteem and admiration for the true royalists, entered into great details on the plots that were being formed against the Chateau of the Tuileries and on the dangers that surrounded the royal family. In consequence he proposed a plan which, he said, would be infallible, and would restore to Louis XVI. 
his former authority. This plan was to bribe the gunners and the leaders of sedition of whom he was sure, and then to fall on the Jacobins and the assembly in force, and thus deliver France from its greatest enemies. For the execution of this plan he asked for the sum of three millions. Monsieur Dobuchage rendered an account of this conference to the king, who was horrified by the violent measures proposed. Bewley adds, other propositions of this kind were made to Louis XVI. And the queen, at the moment when they both knew for certain that the insurrection was about to break forth, and by people in whom they could have confidence, they rejected them with horror, unable to endure the thought of seeing the innocent sacrificed with the guilty, and these men whom they had spared when they could have annihilated them described them as monsters, tigers, and cannibals. But, whilst unwilling to accede to the sanguinary suggestions of the Cordeliers, Louis XVI, realizing that greed for gold was at the bottom of most of their revolutionary frenzy, resolved once again to conciliate them with gifts of money. A week before the 10th of August, Danton received the sum of 50,000 acus, and the court, convinced that this time the great demagogue would be true to his bargain, felt no further apprehension. Our minds are at rest, said Madame Elizabeth, we can count on Danton. But the court had miscalculated on the sum required. Danton pocketed the money and betrayed the king. The fact is that the court was now too poor to buy partisans amongst the factions, who saw in the impending upheaval far greater opportunities of enrichment. Alas! Even the revolutionary Prudhomme is obliged to admit, how many pretended republicans would have been furious royalists if the court had been inclined to win them over, and had had enough money to pay them. But it had not enough for all who asked, all who aspired. The legislative assembly was full of men of this kind, royalists or republicans, according to the way the wind blew, and it must be said, although to the shame of the revolution, that these were the elements of the 10th of August, during which the people alone were disinterested and of good faith. That Danton was the principal organizer of the 10th of August cannot be doubted. Towards the end of July Prudhomme relates that he received a visit from Danton, Camille de Milan, and Fabre de Glantine. Danton said, in the trivial language habitual to him, we have come, Petit Jean Foutre, to consult you as an old patriot, although you are no longer up to the mark, but as you have often foreseen events and their results, we want your opinion on a plan of insurrection. Prudhomme inquired in what this plan consisted. We wish to overthrow the tyrant, answered Danton. Which one? The one at the Tuileries. This be, of a revolution has brought nothing to patriots. That is to say, messieurs, that you wish to make your fortunes in the name of liberty and equality. How do you think of overthrowing the monarchy? By assault? Pridom urged the temerity of the proposal. Your plan, he said, is the work of a coterie of Jacobins and Cordeliers. You do not know the intentions of the inhabitants of Paris, or of the majority of those in the departments. Fabre de Glantine said, we have the promise of a hundred deputies, Girondins and Brissotins and agents in all the popular societies of France. You wish to overthrow the monarch, Pridom answered. Whom will you put in his place? The Duc d'Orléans, blurted out the Don Fon terrible, Camille de Milan. But Danton hastily interposed, we will see afterwards what we will do. In revolutions as on the field of battle one must never look forward to the morrow. I undertake to stir up the canaille of the Faubourgs Saint Antoine and Saint Marceau. The Marseillais will be at their head, they have not come to Paris for plums. But even the canaille needed some incentive to rise, and just now none was forthcoming. It was in a mood of desperation inspired by these reflections that the deputy Chabot one day cried out incontrollably, if only the court would try to murder somebody. An attempt on the life of a patriotic deputy, he declared to Grangenouve, would prove an invaluable pretext for stirring up the people. Unfortunately the court displayed no intention of carrying out this scheme, but Chabot and Grangenouve were not to be baffled by so trifling an obstacle. In a fit of patriotic fervor these two Tartarins thereupon decided to have themselves murdered, in order to provide an accusation against the court. Chabot undertook to engage assassins who were to waylay and shoot them at the street corner. But on the night appointed Chabot seems to have thought better of the scheme, for neither he nor the assassins were forthcoming, and Grangenouve, having made his will and waited about a long while to be murdered, returned home indignant to find himself alive. Thus deprived of any shadow of a pretext for marching a second time on the Tuileries, the leaders were obliged to invent one, and in order to persuade the people to attack the chateau it was loudly proclaimed that the chateau was about to attack the people, 
15,000 aristocrats are ready to massacre all the patriots. But in spite of these alarms Paris remained sunk in lethargy. Still, on the evening of the 9th of August, all means had failed to rouse the great mass of the population. So the revolutionary leaders took the law into their own hands, and on this fateful night the terrible council of the Commune, known as the Conseil General Révolutionnaire du Tenout, came into being. The night of the 9th of August. The agitators of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine had at first met at the section of the Cansvan in their own district, but finding their efforts to make this the center of agitation abortive, they issued an appeal at 11 o'clock in the evening to the other 47 sections of Paris, asking them each to send their representatives to cooperate in the proposed insurrection with the Commune at the town hall. A great number of sections failed to respond to this appeal, some indeed protested energetically against the attempt to disturb the peace, whereupon the leaders had recourse to their usual methods of fraud and violence. As soon as night draws on, says Bewley, the revolutionaries, whose roles had been prepared beforehand, go out into all the sections, i.e. the halls of the districts, which the peaceful bourgeois had abandoned, either in order to present themselves at the guardhouse, or to return to their homes and give themselves up to rest. The revolutionaries, having thus made themselves masters of the debates, declare themselves the sovereign people, usurp their rights, and decree that all constituted authority is in abeyance. This resolution being taken and communicated to each other, the revolutionary sections ring the tocsin in all the churches of Paris, this alarm heard in the middle of the night strikes terror into all hearts. By methods such as these even sections that had protested against the plan of insurrection were represented as sending delegates to cooperate with the movement, and so, although twenty sections still remained unrepresented, it was possible to declare that the majority of the sections had responded to the appeal. In this way the insurrectional commune was formed. Predom, at that date in the secret of the leaders, afterwards described the process in these illuminating words, on the eve of the famous day, the 10th of August, the Confederates, towards 10 o'clock in the evening, assembled to the number of 20 or 30, and at once on their own initiative named new members without even collecting the wishes of the majority of the sections. This choice being made, the nominees, or rather the conspirators, arranged to meet at the commune. They present themselves armed with the power to replace the magistrates then sitting. These hesitate a moment and are secretly threatened, they give up their seats and all go out with the exception of Pétion, and Manuel, who are retained. All this was arranged in the secret meetings, conciliabules, which had been held at the Palais Royal or the Rappi, where Dorléon, Danton, Marat, Pétion, Robespierre, and others were to be found. Paris changed magistrates without knowing it, and the insurrection took place. Without any obstacle, one would have supposed that everyone was in accord. But with these secret confabulations the role of the leaders ended. As usual, when the hour of danger struck, those bold patriots, Danton, Marat, Robespierre, and Camille de Milan, retired into hiding. On the eve of this second attack on the Tuileries, Marat, overcome with panic, had implored Barbaroux to smuggle him out of Paris disguised as a jockey, and on Barbaroux's refusal betook himself once more to his cellar, a course likewise adopted by Robespierre. As to Camille de Milan and Danton, the journal of Madame de Milan reveals that they spent most of this night, whilst the insurrection was preparing, asleep at Danton's house. Just as the toxin was about to ring, Danton, always prone to slumber, retreated into his bed, from which snug ambush the emissaries of the commune had some difficulty in dislodging him, and even then he was soon back again, and still sleeping peacefully whilst the mob was marching on the Tuileries. It was therefore again on this occasion the professional agitators who were left to carry out the plans of the leaders, and for a time it seemed that their efforts were to be rewarded with no success, for the Faubourg still showed themselves recalcitrant, and as late as 2.30 in the morning of the tenth news was brought to Roderer at the chateau that the insurrection would not take place. But at last, towards dawn, the revolutionary army began to muster. Santerre gathered round him the brigands of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, Lazovsky and Alexandre enlisted a following in saint marceau and Barbarou and Fournier led forth the Marseillais. Meanwhile the Tuileries was preparing its plans of defence. The Marquis de Mondar, commander of the National Guard, warned of the impending insurrection, had sounded the call to arms, and all night his battalions streamed to the chateau, where they took up their stand in the courtyards on the carousel, and the terraces bordering the river and the garden. These battalions, sixteen in all, made up a total of 2,400 men, 
whilst in the chateau itself were 950 Swiss and 200 nobles armed with swords and pistols. As on the 20th of June, the chateau was therefore well defended, moreover, the troops were this time commanded by no feeble Raman Villiers, but by a leader who could be depended on to offer a vigorous resistance. Mondar, the revolutionary leaders well knew, was loyal to the king and, as Pétion, combining the role of spy with that of mayor of Paris, discovered on his wanderings round the chateau, really had a plan of campaign, therefore Mondar must be disposed of. Accordingly, at seven o'clock in the morning, Mondar was summoned to the Hôtel de Ville, and ordered to give an account of his conduct in organizing the defenses of the chateau. Mondar replied that he had acted on the order of Pétion to resist attack by force. But all explanations were useless, Mondar had been sent for to be murdered, not to be judged. Hu Guenin, the orator of June 20, now president of the Commune, with a horizontal gesture across his throat, said, let him be led away. Mondar was taken out, and half an hour later, on his way down the steps of the Haute Juan de Ville to the prison of the Abbaye, a young man named Rossignol, employed by Danton, approached and shot him through the head. Needless to say, this foul deed was ascribed by Pétion to the people. Pétion himself had a personal reason for desiring the death of Mondar, and undoubtedly acted in collusion with Danton, for the order to resist attack by force had really been given by him to Mondar three days earlier in writing, and it was apparently in order to abstract this compromising document from his pocket that Mondar was assassinated. Pétion's precise object in writing it is not clearly evident, possibly, as Mournjois suggests, it was for the sake of giving a pretext to the Mars AA for firing at the troops, but it may also be accounted for by the fact that Pétion had received a large sum of money from the king just before the 10th of August to maintain order, and for a moment he may have intended to earn his payment honestly. But when he saw that the insurrection was assuming formidable proportions, he was overcome with panic, and resolved to destroy the written evidence of his momentary defection from the revolutionary cause. At any rate, he now did everything in his power to assist the movement. So although, as head of the municipality, he refused during this night to supply the forces at the Tuileries with ammunition for the defense of the chateau, he contrived that 5,000 ball cartridges should be issued to the Marseillais. Pétion had also arranged with Cara that if the insurrection broke out he should be forcibly prevented from opposing it by a summons to the town hall, where he was to be detained during the attack on the chateau. Cara omitted to do this, and Pétion spent a very uncomfortable hour or two waiting about in the garden of the Tuileries, shadowed by several loyal grenadiers who shrewdly suspected his perfidy. When the expected summons still failed to arrive he finally adopted the ingenious expedient of sending repeated orders to himself, and in response to these he left his post at 2.30, and after presenting himself at the assembly placed himself under restraint in his own quarters at the town hall with a guard of 400 men to prevent him returning to duty. So through the basest treachery the chateau was disarmed before its assailants. By the death of Mondar, as the conspirators had anticipated, all the plans for defense were disorganized, and the forces assembled at the Tuileries left without a leader. The 10th of August. The king and queen well knew the fate that in all probability awaited them. Twice already since the 20th of June the queen had narrowly escaped assassination, once at the Cham de Mars on the 14th of July, once at midnight when the murderer was arrested on the threshold of her apartment, and all through these weeks, says Mournjoir, Louis XVI had slept in his clothes ready to rise at the first alarm. Now, as the sinister knell of the toxin rang out over the city, the queen sat weeping silently, the king paced the great rooms of the chateau striving to decide on the course of action to pursue. The troops, he knew, could offer a vigorous resistance to assault, but this meant bloodshed, and again the old question that at every crisis of the revolution had tortured him arose in his mind, was a king justified in shedding the blood of his people in his own defense? Royalists said yes, believers in the sovereignty of the people said no, moreover the king's own conscience said no likewise. This dilemma produced in Louis XVI an agony of irresolution that could never have afflicted any of his predecessors. Henry IV, for all his benevolence, would have buckled on his sword, mounted his charger, and shown himself to his troops as their sovereign chief, and undoubtedly, if Louis XVI had done this, even Barbaroux admits the day would have been won, for the great majority of the battalions had declared themselves for him. It seems that in the end the king, yielding to the entreaties of the royalists, decided that the chateau should be defended by force of arms, but this, to him a terrible decision, 
was reached only by hours of mental conflict. When at half past five on the morning of the tenth he came forth from his apartments to inspect the troops, his defenders saw with dismay that the Sangfra which had saved him on the twentieth of June was no longer at his command, his nerve was gone. This was not the result of cowardice, the hardest rider, the boldest airman, may find himself suddenly, as the result of continuous exposure to danger, the victim of nerve failure, and Louis XVI, as we know, was subject to such attacks under the influence of acute mental strain. From the accounts of all eyewitnesses it is evident that at this supreme moment the king was suffering from a return of the malady that had afflicted him three months earlier, and that now deprived him of all the energy he needed wherewith to meet the crisis. Above the violet of his coat his face showed white as death, his eyes were wet with tears his powdered hair disordered, he looked, says Madame Campon, as if he had ceased to exist. The effect on the troops was, of course, deplorable. Up to this moment their enthusiasm had remained at boiling point, and as the king passed on his way all the vaulted ceilings of the palace rang to the cries of vive la roi. No, sire, cried the troops, do not fear a recurrence of the 20th of June, we will wipe out that stain, the last drop of our blood belongs to your majesty. When the king came down into the courtyards loud cheers burst from every company of the National Guards vive la roi. Vive Louis the Sixteenth. Long live the king of the constitution. We wish for him. We wish for no other. Let him put himself at our head and we will defend him to death. If only he had put himself at their head. If only he could have found ringing tones in which to respond to these acclamations, have summoned smiles to his lips, and so won all hearts finally to his cause. But it seems that Louis XVI, more than ever inarticulate under the stress of great emotion, cast a chill over the spirits of the men, and as the cries of vive la roi, died down voices were heard to answer with vive la nation. On the other side of the chateau the situation assumed a more threatening aspect, for at the moment that the king entered the garden the advance guard of the revolutionary army, armed with pikes, arrived on the scene from the Faubourg Saint Marceau, and as they filed past overwhelmed him with insults. By some strange mismanagement this revolutionary battalion was allowed to take up its stand amongst the other troops, inevitably the spirit of insurrection spread, and when the king returned to the chateau along the terrace bordering the river, angry cries were raised, down with the king. Long live the Sonkolort! And other invectives of a grosser kind, only a dozen voices in all, yet loud enough to be heard in the chateau. The sinister murmurs reached the ears of the queen. Monsieur Dobishage rushing to the window cried out in horror, Good God! It is the king they are hooting. What the devil is he doing there? Let us go down and find him. The queen burst into tears. All is lost, she said, when a moment later the king returned pale and breathless, this review has done more harm than good. All indeed was lost. News had now arrived that Mondar had been either killed or arrested, that all Paris was on foot, and that the Faubourgs had assembled and were marching on the chateau with their cannons. Then the royalists who had collected in the palace knew that the moment had come to rally round the king, and Monsieur Tervely, a drawn sword in his hand, ordered the usher to open the doors to the French nobility. But where were the fifteen thousand aristocrats the revolutionaries declared to be concealed in the chateau? Where were the bloodthirsty Chevalier du Poignard who were to execute a new massacre of Saint Barthélemy at the bidding of Antoinette Medici? Nothing further from this description could be imagined than the strange procession that now streamed into the room led by the old Maréchal de Mailly, aged eighty-six, and composed of two to three hundred men and boys, many with no pretensions to nobility, but ennobled by their devotion to a lost cause. Few had been able to procure guns, and the greater number were armed only with swords or pistols, or with hastily improvised weapons they had seized on their passage, a squire and page had divided a pair of fire tongs between them. Always, throughout the whole revolution, the same unpreparedness, the same hopeless lack of design on the part of the old order, and on the other side foresight, method, superb organization. Surely a warning to all ages that courage and devotion may prove unavailing before calculating cowardice and organized malevolence. If bravery could have won the day on this 10th of August the chateau must have triumphed. The queen, now that the danger was actually at the gates, dried her tears, and resolved that, since the king could inspire no enthusiasm in his defenders, she herself would take up his role. When some of the National Guards murmured at the intrusion of the nobility, which they regarded as a slur on their own ability to defend the royal family, Marie Antoinette begged them to be reconciled. They are our best friends, 
she said, they will share the dangers of the National Guards, they will obey you, and turning to some grenadiers standing near she added, messieurs, remember that all you hold most dear, your wives or your children, your property, depends on our existence, our interest is one, you must not have the least, distrust of these brave people, who will defend you to their last breath. According to Bewley, these words had the result of promoting a complete understanding between the two parties of the king's defenders, and all now stood together, resolved to resist attack by force of arms. Meanwhile an order to the same effect was given by the Attorney General, Roderer, and the municipal officer, Leroux, to the troops surrounding the chateau, but in so half-hearted a manner as only to increase the audacity of the insurgents, the gunners defiantly replied by unloading their cannons, and a deputation of seven or eight citizens came forward to demand the deposition of the king. The two magistrates thereupon decided that resistance was useless, and that the king must be persuaded to leave the chateau with his family, and take refuge in the hall of the National Assembly. Leroux accordingly returned to the royal apartments and presented himself to the king, who was in his bedroom surrounded by his family, and several ministers. The danger, said Leroux, was now at its height, the National Guards had been corrupted, and the King and Queen, with their children and entourage, would all be massacred if they remained at the Chateau. Marie Antoinette, had always held that a King should die on his throne, and cried out indignantly that she would rather be nailed to the walls of the Chateau than leave it, but Louis XVI, ever anxious to avoid bloodshed, seemed not unwilling to consider the proposal. Seeing this the Queen seized his hand and, raising it to her eyes, covered it with tears. Roderer, arriving a moment later, added his entreaties to those of Leroux, and to the repeated protests of the Queen replied, You wish then, Madam, to make yourself responsible for the death of the King, of your own son, of your daughter, of yourself, and of all those who would defend you. And at the mention of her children the Queen, touched in her most vulnerable spot, surrendered. The King looked at her with tears in his eyes, rose from his seat, and said, Alon, Marchands, his family gathered round him. Monsieur Roderer, said Madame Elizabeth, will you answer for the king's life? Yes, Madame, on my own. But when, a moment later, the queen repeated the question, will you answer for the king's life and for that of my son? Roderer responded gloomily, Madame, we will answer for dying at your side, that is all that we can promise. At Roderer's earnest request none of the court was allowed to escort the royal family to the assembly, and the king, obviously with the intention of signifying that they were now free to depart, turned to his nobles with the words, Come, messieurs, there is nothing more to be done here either for you or me. But at the foot of the staircase, overcome with misgivings for their safety, he paused, and looking back at his faithful defenders he said to Roderer, But what will become of them all? Sire, answered Roderer, it seemed to me that they were in coloured coats, i.e. not in uniform, those who have swords need only take them off and follow you going out by the garden. Yet after this assurance, and although it was at Roderer's own request that the king left the chateau and that the nobles did not escort him, Roderer allowed it to be said by his friend Pétion without contradiction, that the king, with complete sang-froid, left his satellites in the chateau to be butchered. The royalists, it is true, were indignant at his departure, they were all prepared to fight for him, and believed that if he had held his ground and remorselessly ordered the Swiss to fire on the mob, the day would have been won. From the point of view of believers in despotism, the king was guilty therefore of criminal weakness, but for the advocates of democracy to blame him is monstrous. He left the chateau solely to avoid bloodshed. It must be remembered that the attack on the chateau had not yet begun, and did not begin until about an hour after the king had left it, and he not unnaturally imagined that since it was against himself the movement was directed, his departure would remove all cause to guerre he could not possibly foresee that the revolutionary leaders would be guilty of such inconceivable cowardice as to wreak their vengeance on the unfortunate Swiss guards. Most of the men of the people who were only doing their duty by remaining at their posts. According to Montjoie, the king, on leaving the chateau, gave strict orders to the Swiss not to fire on the insurgents, and to offer no resistance whatever happened, thereby depriving the Marseillais of any pretext for aggression, and, whether Montjoie is right or not, this, as we shall see, was precisely the course the Swiss pursued. The king, satisfied therefore that no hostilities could now take place, led the way to the assembly. The queen followed with Madame de Tourzel, each holding a hand of the Dauphin, Madame Elizabeth with Madame Royale, and the Princess de Lamballe walked behind them with one of the ministers. 
an escort, formed of 150 Swiss and 300 National Guards, marched in line on either side of the royal family. In the freshness of the glorious August morning the tragic procession made its way, first down the great central alley of the Tuileries Garden, with its cool fountains and blazing flower beds, then to the right under the shade of the ancient chestnut trees, from which, in the heat of this tropical summer, the leaves had already begun to flutter down onto the pathway, where the gardeners, unmoved by the fall of dynasties, were employed in sweeping them tidily into heaps. Perhaps it was the sudden recall to the normal facts of life produced by this circumstance that prompted the king's memorable remark, the leaves are falling early this year. But at the Porte Fuelant's grim realities reasserted themselves. Outside the gateway a crowd of men and women, evidently animated by hostile intentions, were waiting, and it was precisely at this moment, when the royal family most needed protection, that Roderer elected to deprive them of their military escort on the ridiculous pretext that the terrace of the Fuelants was the property of the National Assembly. Whether, therefore, by the official stupidity or the deliberate treachery of Roderer, the royal family was obliged to go forward into the midst of the crowd escorted only by a few deputies of the assembly who now came to meet them. Instantly the horde of ruffians surged forward howling execrations. No, no, they shall not enter the assembly, they are the cause of all our troubles. Down with them. Down. As usual, it was against the queen that their fury was principally directed, and now, pressing closely around her, they snatched her watch and purse, overwhelming her the while with insults. A man of enormous height and atrocious countenance seized the dauphin from his mother, but at the queen's cry of terror said reassuringly, Do not be afraid. I will do him no harm. And a passage through the crowd being at last cleared, he carried the boy in his arms to the assembly. The royal family entered the hall. Messieurs, said Louis XVI, addressing the assembly, I have come here to prevent a great crime, and I think I cannot be more in safety than amongst you, messieurs. Alas! The king had not prevented crimes from taking place on that terrible day. The vengeance of the leaders was not directed only against the king and royal family, other victims had been singled out, and nothing the unfortunate Louis XVI could have done or said would have availed to slake their thirst for blood. Even as the king uttered these words three heads were carried on pikes past the door of the assembly. As usual in the revolutionary outbreaks, the mob collected at the Porte des Fuelants had not come forward spontaneously to insult the royal family. The emissaries of the Duc d'Orléans were behind the movement. It was they who told the people that the royal family must not be allowed to take refuge with the assembly, and it was they who drove the mob to carry out the first prescriptions on the list they had drawn up for the day. Of all the enemies that the Duc d'Orléans had made for himself during his revolutionary career, none was so violent or so unrelenting as the journalist Sulo. François-Louis Sulo was no aristocrat, but the son of a clothmaker, and he had thrown himself into the counter-revolutionary movement with all the ardor usually to be found only in the opposing camp. A vigorous mind, always giving vent to witty sallies and bursts of boisterous laughter, with an unbridled but infectious gaiety. A meridional of the north, loving danger for danger's sake. The joyous champion of lost causes. Mocking at a revolution, Sulo had all the makings of a rebel, and at the outbreak of the revolution had marched in the vanguard of an insurrection. But before long his fierce love of justice drew him over to the cause of the king, in whom he recognized the one hope of liberty for France, and in his far from respectful petty mower Louis XVI. He frankly declared his reason for this allegiance, if the good of humanity and the salvation of my country did not happen to be identified with the interests of your glory, you would find me amongst the most intrepid in proving to you that I am a man and a citizen before I am your subject. It was because he hated fraud and imposture, because he dreaded the misfortunes which the usurpation of the throne by the Duc d'Orléans would have brought on France, that from August of 1789 he had devoted all his talents, all his wit and untiring energy, to fighting the Orléanist conspiracy. Careless of the consequences, perpetually menaced with assassination, Sulo had continued with his pen to attack the Duke, he had outraged him, threatened him, defied him in every way, before the tribunals and the justice of men, and before the judgment of God. Naturally, Sulo's name had long been on the list of prescriptions drawn up by the Orleanists. Two days before the 10th of August, Camille de Milan, his old college friend, who had remained attached to him in spite of the fact that they were now political antagonists, warned him that his head was one of the first marked down by the leaders of the insurrection, and offered him a refuge in his own house. 
Sulo refused to compromise his friend, and went forward boldly to meet his fate the sacrifice of his life, he said, had long since been made. At eight o'clock in the morning of the 10th of August, Sulo, who had spent the night in the Tuileries, came out onto the Terros de Fulence where the crowd, set in motion by the Orleanists, had assembled. His handsome appearance, his fresh attire and glittering sword attracted attention, and he was arrested on the pretext that he formed part of a false patrol. Sulo proved his innocence and was liberated, but the Orleanists at this time made sure of their victim. In the Cœur des Fulents there and a merry court was waiting for him, there and at the very height of revolutionary frenzy. The little Belgian had a private vengeance to execute in attacking Sulo, for the witty journalist, in his campaign against the Orleanist conspiracy, had frequently made their own the butt of his pleasantries, and it was not only as a partisan of the Duke, but as a woman outraged in her vanity and even in her prudery, for fille de joie though she was, their own could endure no imputations on her virtue, that she longed to plunge her dagger into the heart of her persecutor. Yet it would be absurd to accept the view of Monsieur Louis Blanc that their own was acting independently on this occasion, for it was always as an agent of the Duc d'Orléans that she had figured in the revolutionary movement, it was as an Orléanist that she had incurred the animosity of Robespierre and Calut her boy, and since, as we have seen, it was the Orléanists who had planned the death of Sulo, it was obviously at their bidding that she carried out the design. Her personal rancor merely lent a sharper edge to her fury, which at this crisis reached a pitch bordering on the insanity that was later on to become chronic. Therein, on the morning of this 10th of August, was nearly as mad as the enraged hyena that afterwards bore her name in the Salpetriere, but this madness that was to rob her of all semblance to a human being gave her today a kind of diabolical beauty which amazed all beholders. Dressed in a blue riding habit, wearing on her head a feathered hat a la Henri IV, with a pair of pistols and a dagger in her belt, the little creature seemed suddenly to have recovered her lost youth, for her face, haggard in repose, was now lit by an inward fire that glowed in her dark skin, and flamed forth from her eyes obliterating the ravages of ill-spent years. Thibault, meeting her at this moment, took her to be only twenty, no woman, he wrote long afterwards had ever made such an impression on him, I say, with a sort of horror, that she was pretty, very pretty, her excitement enhanced her beauty. For she was in the throes of revolutionary hysteria impossible to describe. Forcing a passage through the crowd in the Cœur des Fuelants with the cry of make way, make way, they and sprang onto a cannon and shouted, how long will you allow yourselves to be misled with vain words? Playing on the passions of the mob she urged them to violence. Where is Sulo, the Abbe Sulo? She cried, for she had never seen her enemy, and imagined him to be a priest. Then Sulo saw his death had been resolved on, and, hoping by the sacrifice of his life to avoid further bloodshed, said to the national guards around him, I see that today the people wish for blood, perhaps one victim will suffice, let me go toward, them. I will pay for all. The guards attempted to detain him, but Sulo rushed forward to face his assassins. For the first time these two sworn foes, the little virago mounted on the cannon, and the young man in all the beauty of his strength and fierce courage, looked each other in the eyes. The moment of reckoning had come at last. Terrible in her rage, there and sprang upon her victim, seized him by the collar, and, with the aid of the armed ruffians in her following, dragged him towards the courtyard. But if Sulo was prepared to die, he went not as a lamb to the slaughter, ever a fighter, he contrived to possess himself of a sabre and fought his assailants like a lion. Three other victims fell beside him, the gigantic Abbe Bouillon, and two officers of the king's old bodyguard, Monsieur de Solminiac and Monsieur du Vigier, known for his beauty as Le Beau Vigier. At last Sulo, seeing that he too must now be overwhelmed, crossed his arms and cried out defiantly, Kill me, then, and see how a royalist can die. Instantly there and her murderous horde closed upon him, Sulo fell pierced with dagger thrusts. His lifeless body was dragged to the place Vendôme and hacked to pieces. Then that noble head was raised on a pike and carried in triumph past the door of the assembly at the moment the royal family entered the hall. Whilst these scenes were taking place around the Salle du Manège, confusion reigned at the chateau. The troops, left by the death of Mondar without a leader, could decide on no plan of campaign, some were for leaving their post and retiring to barracks, declaring that now the royal family had gone nothing but bricks and mortar remained to be defended. The gendarmerie stationed on the place du Louvre being of this opinion calmly withdrew to the Palais Royal, leaving the approach to the chateau open to the enemy. 
but the nobles who remained in the royal apartments were for standing their ground, only a few of their number had followed the king, and the rest, rallying round the Maréchal de Mailly, enthusiastically concurred in his plan for resisting invasion to the last. Here are the gallants I hear are the last of the nobility, cried the heroic old man as this pathetic legion ranged itself in order of battle, the post of a general and of his companions in arms is at the place where the throne is attacked and in peril. And as he went up and down the ranks he continued to repeat, conquer or die, gentlemen, conquer or die. The first detachment of the Marseillais had now arrived on the carousel, but here a delay occurred in the attack on the chateau, for the Faubourgs failed to put in an appearance. Once again Balaam's ass had refused to go forward. Santerre indeed, who was to lead Saint-Antoine, the Faubourg of glory, to the assault, seemed at the last moment overcome with panic, and urged his battalions not to march on the chateau, where he said the royalists were assembled in force. Thereupon Westerman, holding his sword to Santerre's throat, ordered him to lead on his men, and Santerre obeyed, but at the Hôtel de Ville he contrived to have himself elected commander-in-chief, and, on the pretext that his post should now be at headquarters, absented himself from the army and was seen no more all day. At last the Faubourgs, commanded by Westerman and Lazovsky, arrived on the field of battle before the entrance to the chateau. Such was the attacking army, a vanguard of Marseillais largely composed of Italians, a reluctant rearguard from the Faubourgs led by a German and a Pole. And this was the French people rising as one man to overthrow the monarchy. At the first onslaught the Marseillais and the Confederates from Brest, in Brittany, alone displayed any resolution, and it was they who advanced towards the courtyards from which the Swiss and National Guards had retreated into the palace, and beat on the great gates of the chateau demanding admittance. The royal concierges withdrew the bolts and fled. A band of Marseillais rushed forward into the arms of the gunners of the National Guard, who, always the disloyal element in this body, immediately joined forces with the insurgents, and bringing out their cannons pointed them against the chateau. By this time the mob of Paris had at last begun to collect, for the impunity with which the revolutionary battalions had penetrated into the carousel and the courtyards reassured the most timorous, and streams of idlers, ever eager for a spectacle, hurried to the scene of action. Only about 750 Swiss, a handful of national guards, and 200 nobles now remained to defend the chateau. If only the Swiss, therefore, could be suborned or vanquished, further resistance would be impossible, and the mob, seeing a number of these men looking down on them from the windows, shouted loudly, down with the Swiss. Lay down your arms. The Swiss, who entertained no hostile feelings towards the people, replied with conciliatory gestures by way of persuading them to desist from attack, and the better to prove their pacific intentions, threw down packets of cartridges amongst them. But the group of Swiss sentinels drawn up at the foot of the staircase presented a more formidable appearance, and for a quarter of an hour this gallant band held the immense mob at bay by their intrepid air and resolute countenances. At last a dozen Marseillais, led by Westerman, ventured forward and ordered the men to lay down their arms, adding, we have come to fraternize with you. The Swiss, who understood little French, remained immovable. Westerman repeated the demand in German, urging them not to sacrifice their lives at the bidding of their officers. To this the sergeant Blazer replied, we are Swiss, and the Swiss only lay down their arms with their lives. We do not consider we have deserved such an insult. If the regiment is not needed let it be legally ordered to retire, but we will not leave our posts and we will not be disarmed. Thereupon Westerman and his troops retreated, for it was never the revolutionary way to advance upon armed men, however inferior in number, and none of the brave Marseillais felt inclined to engage the Swiss in open combat. Some of the insurgents happened, however, to be armed with long pikes hooked at the end, and these ruffians now ventured forward and, whilst remaining out of range of the sentinels' swords, contrived to harpoon five of the unfortunate men, dragging them at the same time towards them by means of the hooks affixed in their clothing. This manoeuvre delighted the mob, who gathered round with shrieks of laughter, whilst the five Swiss were disarmed, stripped, and finally massacred at the foot of the staircase. Suddenly a shot was fired, by whom contemporaries are unable to agree in stating. The revolutionaries, of course, declared the Swiss were the aggressors, but Dossonville, an eyewitness, afterwards an agent of the Comité de Salo public in the terror, who as a revolutionary could have no object in whitewashing the Swiss, asserts that several rebels having dressed up in Swiss uniform slipped amongst their ranks, fired on the insurgents, and directly the first report was heard, women, purposely stationed on the terrace, 
began to call out, Ah! The rascals of Swiss are firing on our brothers the patriots. At the same moment the fight began, and became general. This is what has remained unknown but what I saw and observed. But it was necessary to say that the king had ordered the attack when he had expressly forbidden it. The question of this discharge is, however, a matter of little importance, for the point is not who fired the first shot, but who shed the first blood. It was not the report of a gun that gave the signal for battle, but the cowardly murder of the five sentinels, and if the Swiss then fired they were in no way the aggressors. At any rate they did fire now, and they fired vigorously, a perfect hail of musketry swept the front ranks of the assailants, whereupon the Swiss on the upper floors, with the nobles and the national guards, joined in the fusillade, shooting down at the crowd from the balconies, roofs, and windows. The effect of this was terrific, for the insurgents, after responding with a few cannon balls, so uncertainly aimed as to do little damage, were suddenly overcome with panic, and all at once the vast mass of people that filled the courtyards and the carousel wavered, drew back, and finally stampeded. The scene that followed was indescribable, hardy Breton, brave Marseillais, red-capped Sancalot armed with pikes, female patriots dragging terrified children by the hand, all running madly for their lives, and even springing over the parapet into the river, mounted police tearing away at full gallop, crushing passers-by beneath their horses' feet, and all pale as spectres, all screaming as they fled, to arms, citizens, to arms. They slaughter your parents, your brothers, your sons. Through every exit from the carousel they rushed frantically, falling over each other in the struggle, on through the streets they ran, nor did some stop running until they reached the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, where they bolted themselves within their doors for safety. The chateau had now scored a complete victory, the only insurgents who remained to carry on the siege took refuge behind the buildings at the other side of the carousel, from which point they continued to discharge their cannons spasmodically at the palace, and, by way of variation, set fire to the buildings surrounding the courtyard. The Swiss, seeing that the whole front of the chateau was now cleared of assailants, triumphantly descended to the courtyards, and carried off some of the cannons left behind by the Marseillais in their flight. Why did no one tell the king the true state of affairs? Why was no man of energy forthcoming to point the way back to his palace and his throne reconquered for him by the gallant Swiss? But that malignant fate which ordains that at every crisis of the revolution the king should fall a victim to treacherous counsels, still pursued him, and a lying message was brought to the assembly that the Swiss were massacring the people, and also that the chateau was about to be forced. Panic-stricken deputies gathered around him, entreating him to intervene on behalf of his people. Louis XVI, who knew nothing beyond what he was told, which seemed to be confirmed by the roar of battle and the crashing of cannon balls on the roof of the assembly, concluded that his orders not to fire on the mob and had been wantonly disobeyed, and therefore allowed himself to be persuaded to write the fatal message to the Swiss, commanding them to cease fire and join him at the hall of the assembly. This order, says Bewley, may be regarded as the last blow dealt at the monarchy. I have reason to believe, on account of all I observed, that if the king's defenders had made the most of their advantage the king would, in the course of the day, have been on his throne again. I know that several battalions were on the march to defend the chateau, and amongst them those of the champs Elysee and the Pont Neuf. If only one of these had arrived in time it would have sufficed to ensure victory and give courage to the Swiss, who till then had acted alone, but when these battalions saw that all had been abandoned they joined themselves to those they had wished to repulse against those they intended to defend, this is what has always been seen and always will be seen to happen in all revolutions. This disastrous act which sealed the fate of the monarchy was quickly noised abroad, and put fresh heart into the revolutionary legions. The Swiss had been forbidden by the king to fire on them, therefore they might with impunity return to the charge and massacre the Swiss. When, in obedience to the king's order, two columns of Swiss abandoned their posts and marched through the garden of the Tuileries, a hail of musketry fire was directed on them by insurgents concealed behind the trees. One column succeeded in reaching the assembly in safety, and these men, together with their comrades who had accompanied the king to the assembly, were deposited in the church of the Fuelants and survived the massacre. But the other column, which had marched on towards the swing bridge leading to the place Louis XV, were pitilessly butchered, many fell beneath the chestnut trees of the garden, the rest having reached the statue of Louis XV. In the center of the great square, formed themselves into a phalanx and prepared for defense, but the mounted police charged them with their sabers and cut them down almost to a man. Napoleon, 
who passed through the garden at this moment, declared at the end of his life that none of his battlefields had given him the idea of so many corpses as the Tuileries on this August morning strewn with the bodies of the Swiss. The entire garrison, however, had not evacuated the palace, 300 to 400 Swiss, who had either not heard or not obeyed the order to retire, still remained in the king's apartments, where a cannonball, bursting in amongst them, had killed or wounded a great number. These soldiers, a few nobles and ladies of the court, and about one hundred servants were, therefore, the sole occupants of the chateau, which after the king's order to cease fire put up no further defence. The insurgents behind the carousel, finding that their fire now met with no reply, ventured at last timorously forward across the courtyards, and finally entered the hall of the palace, evacuated five minutes earlier by the two columns of Swiss. The impunity with which this manoeuvre was executed reassured the crowd that lingered at a distance, stragglers poured in from all sides, and before long an immense tumultuous mob burst into the hall of the chateau. So they had burst into this same hall seven weeks earlier, so they had stormed up the great staircase breathing threatenings and slaughter, only to be brought to bay when they reached their goal, now, with the ferocious Marseillais at their head, there was to be no pause, no relenting, and like a devastating torrent they swept onwards and spread themselves all over the palace. A mad rage for destruction possessed them, everything animate or inanimate fell beneath the blows of their pikes and muskets, furniture was flung from the windows, the great mirrors in which Medici Antoinette had bestudied the hypocritical airs she showed in public flew into a thousand fragments, treasures of art, clocks, pictures, porcelain, silver, jewels, were pillaged or destroyed. All the Swiss, the soldiers who had remained at their posts, even the wounded lying helpless on the floors and the doctors bending over them to dress their wounds, were barbarously butchered, rivers of blood flowed over the shining parquet of the great apartments. Everywhere the savage horde pursued their victims, the grey-haired porters were dragged forth from their lodges, fugitives were tracked down to the deepest cellars, up to the remotest attics, and put to death. In the Queen's bedroom women of the town tore open the wardrobes and dressed themselves in the Queen's gowns, one throwing herself on the bed cried out that someone was concealed beneath the bedding, and the mattress being torn off amidst drunken laughter, a trembling Swiss was discovered and massacred. The scenes that took place were so unspeakably hideous that one would thankfully draw a veil over what followed, but if we are to understand the French Revolution as it really was, if we are to see this 10th of August, so vaunted by revolutionary writers, in its true colours we must look facts in the face. And in full justice to the people one circumstance must not be forgotten, the mob that committed these atrocities was literally mad with drink. For in that first wild on Russia band of insurgents had found their way down to the cellars and gorged themselves with wine and liqueurs. No less than two hundred, says Pridom, died of the effects. Then, whilst some remained lying in helpless stupor on the cellar floors, others bore supplies to their comrades up above, the contents of ten thousand bottles were distributed amongst the mob, the garden and courtyards around the chateau became a sea of broken glass. The effect of this indiscriminate carousing on unaccustomed liquors wildly mingled was to produce in the people a condition of complete dementia, and it is as creatures deprived of all reasoning faculty, of all semblance to humanity, no more responsible for their actions than bedlam suddenly turned loose, that we must regard them. For on this dreadful 10th of August, alone amongst all the great days of the revolution in Paris, it was by the people that these atrocities were committed. The savage Marseillais showed themselves less ferocious. All the ladies of the court were spared by order of their leaders, the word being given, we do not kill women. Fifty or sixty of the flying Swiss were also saved by them, stranger still, the warlike old Maréchal de Mailly succeeded in disarming his assailants. The face of the Maréchal, says Solavi, having arrested the hand of a confederate who had raised his arm to kill him, this man asks who he is, seizes him, pretends to ill-treat him, tells him to keep silence, pushes aside the crowd, and leads him back safe and sound to his house. The king's doctor, Lemonnier, was likewise led home in triumph. During the invasion of the chateau he had remained quietly seated in his study, suddenly men with blood-stained arms battered on the panels of the door. The old man opened to them. What are you doing here? They said. You are very quiet. I am at my post. What are you at the chateau? Do you not see by my coat? I am the king's doctor. And are you not afraid? Of what? I am unarmed. Does one injure a man who does no injury? You are a good fellow. Listen, it is not well for you here, 
others less reasonable than us might confound you with the rest. You are not safe. Where would you like to be taken? To the palace of the Luxembourg. Come, follow us and fear nothing. I have already told you I have no fear of those to whom I have done no harm. Then they led him through the serried ranks of bayonets and loaded guns, crying out before him as they went, Comrades, let this man pass. He is the king's doctor, but he is not afraid, he is a good fellow. It is not, then, to the Marseillais that the greatest atrocities of the day must be attributed, but to the people, or rather to the populace of Paris, above all to the women, and, as in all the revolutionary outbreaks, it was the people themselves who fared worst at their hands. To the servants in particular the mob showed no mercy. They, poor souls, had not thought of flying, many, indeed, were imbued with revolutionary doctrines, and, little dreaming that the rage of the populace would be turned against themselves, remained calmly at their work, in the midst of which the drunken mob surprised them. The kitchens, like the gilded apartments up above, became a shambles, every man from the head chefs to the humblest scullions perished, the cooks' heads fell into the saucepans, where they were preparing the viands. Oh! Height of barbarism? Cries Mercier, a wretched undercook, who had not had time to escape, was seized by these tigers, thrust into a copper, and in this state exposed, to the heat of the furnace. Then falling on the provisions every one seizes what he can lay hands on. One carries off chickens on a spit, another a turbot, that one a carp from the Rhine as large as himself. Monsters with human faces collected in hundreds under the porch of the Escalier du Midi, and danced amidst torrents of blood and wine. A murderer played the violin beside the corpses and thieves, with their pockets full of gold, hanged other thieves on the banisters. Still worse horrors took place that cannot be written, nameless indecencies, hideous debaucheries, ghastly mutilations of the dead, and again, as after the siege of the Bastille, cannibal orgies. Before great fires, hastily kindled in the apartments, cutlets of Swiss were grilled and eaten, the actor Grammont, one of the earliest hirelings of the Duc d'Orléans, and the last man to insult the queen on her way to the scaffold, in a fit of revolutionary frenzy drank down a glass of blood. Outside, in the garden of the chateau, ghastly scenes met the eye, on the lifeless bodies of the Swiss women perched like vultures, gloating over their victims, a young girl of eighteen was seen plunging a sabre into the corpses. Needless to say, the mass of the true people took no part in these atrocities. Peaceful citizens, says Mercier, whom curiosity had attracted to the Tuileries to discover whether the chateau still existed, wandered slowly, struck with gloomy stupor, along the terrace covered with broken bottles. They did not weep, they seemed petrified, dumbfounded, they shrank with horror at each footstep at the odor and the aspect of these bleeding corpses. The role of the leaders. But whilst the true people shuddered, the authors of the day knew no pity. To them the 10th of August was a glorious day, for which each one was now eager to claim the responsibility. Directly the chateau had fallen and the mob had proved victorious, every patriot came bravely to the fore. Danton, says Louvet, who had concealed himself during the battle, appeared after the victory armed with a huge sabre, and marching at the head of a battalion of Marseillais, as if he had been the hero of the day. The other great revolutionaries had all remained likewise in their hiding places until the danger was past. What, asks Bredom, were the leading Jacobins doing during the attack on the chateau? They knew everything, none of them appeared in arms at the siege of the Tuileries. Marat, Robespierre, Danton, not one of them dared to show himself. All these people invariably displayed the greatest bravery, but only in the tribune, the tongue was their favorite weapon. The few Jacobins who came out prudently placed themselves at the tail of the bands of Marseillais and Breton. There is nothing more cowardly than a revolutionary from speculation. But if it was not to the efforts of these men that the 10th of August owed its triumph, the excesses of the day lie at their door alone. Is not the instigator of a crime infinitely more criminal than the wretched instrument who commits it? And were not the orators and writers, Mara, Danton, Desmalin, Brissot, Cara, Madame Roland, more truly the authors of these excesses than the crazed and drunken populace who put their precepts into practice? For the cannibals of the Tuileries, the horrible women of the Paris faubourgs plunging their knives into the bodies of their victims, had not evolved such deeds from their own inner consciousness, for months they had been trained for the part at the society's fraternelles of the Jacobins, where murder and violence were systematically preached, 
and every means employed to excite their passions. It will be urged that they themselves must have been inherently evil to respond in so atrocious a manner to the suggestions of their leaders, the old theory of Parisian ferocity will be brought forward to explain the phenomenon. But we have only to study the memoirs of the period to discover that it was not the women of Paris alone on whom these doctrines produced the same dehumanizing effect. Thus, for example, Thiebaud, himself an ardent democrat, relates that soon after the 10th of August he dined with certain Prussian friends of his, Monsieur and Madame Bitorp, and amongst the guests were Chamfort, the Orleanist, and an English authoress, Helen Maria Williams. Chamfort delighted Miss Williams with his revolutionary verses, and Thibault adds, the thing that struck me most was the political exaggeration of Miss Williams, who showed herself an enthusiast for our revolution, even for its excesses, which in my opinion damned it. Still more amazing was the attitude of the two good Germans. That Monsieur and Madame. Vitorb, says Thibault, who were both over sixty, who were all that is best on this earth, who were distinguished, he for his merit, she for her fine and gentle wit, should have shown themselves more revolutionary than their two guests, that they should have become apologists of the 10th of August, that astounded me. But it is not the only example I could quote of this kind of aberration. In order to appreciate the attitude of Miss Williams and her worthy German friends, we must refer to a description of the state of Paris at this moment given by Mr. Burgess in a letter to Lord Auckland, dated September 4th. The English messenger, Morley, Burgess writes, has just returned from Paris, where he relates that pestilence is now expected. It was found easier to kill than to bury the victims of the tenth. Those who were amused by shedding blood soon grew tired of digging graves of course great numbers were put out of the way somewhat carelessly, and the cellars and other subterraneous places were found convenient receptacles for the dead bodies, into these immense numbers were thrown, and when they were full they were shut up in the best way the hurry of the operation would permit. The natural consequences of interment now began to manifest themselves pretty strongly. Morley says that, being obliged, the last day or two he continued in Paris, to run about the town a good deal for his passports, he was saluted in several streets with such whiffs of putrefaction as to be obliged to cover his face and run off as fast as he could. Under these circumstances it was not possible for a moment to forget the recent massacres, whilst the chaotic state of the capital made it evident that the atrocities, which had just taken place, were but the prelude to others still more dreadful. Ah! How fortunate you are not to inhabit this town, writes a Parisian to a friend in the country on August 16th. People who think know no rest night or day. Every day, on rising, one hears of the death of neighbors or friends. So far these are only rose leaves, the end of the month provides us with greater dangers. You think, write to other contemporaries, that one can see these horrors without shuddering one would be almost a barbarian. Yet it is no barbarian but an educated Englishwoman, an intellectual and a sentimentalist, that we find dining out amidst these ghastly scenes and enthusiastically applauding them. Let us have done, then, with the futile theory of Parisian ferocity by which panegyrists of the revolution would explain its crimes, these crimes were not accidental to the revolution, they were not the outcome of the Latin temperament, but the direct result of those doctrines which produced in men and women of all nations, whether English, French, or German, a ferocity that knew no relenting. The role of the intrigues Helen Maria Williams was not unique amongst her race, for although the great mass of the English people shuddered at the atrocities of August 10, and the court of St. James's withdrew its ambassador from Paris, the English Jacobins accorded their whole-hearted approval to their French allies. We shall reserve their congratulatory letters and addresses, however, till the end of the next chapter, for it was not until the massacres of September that their admiration was roused to its fullest pitch. Prussia, needless to say, found likewise cause for rejoicing in the attack on the Tuileries, the subsequent imprisonment of the royal family in the temple the most splendid dream a king can dream, Frederick the Great had been known to say, is to dream that he is king of France. The 10th of August had removed all cause for envy from Frederick's successor. As to the Girondins and Orleanists who had engineered the movement, their triumph was destined to be short-lived. True, the throne was now vacant, and thus the first step had been taken towards a change of dynasty. But the laying of the mine had proved unskillful, too much dynamite had been employed, and the charge by which they had intended to blast their way to power had produced an explosion so terrific as to involve the whole existing order of things in chaos. The effect of the 10th of August was to paralyze France. The terror that it spread, 
says Hua, was almost universal. In a few places there was an attempt at resistance, but nowhere could it be organized. All action to be powerful must emanate from a center, the revolution proved a thousand times that the fate of the departments is decided in Paris, those same authorities that had protested so energetically against the day of June the 20th were silent before that of August the 10th. Lafayette alone dared to raise his voice in remonstrance, and as soon as the news of the events in Paris reached him on the frontier, he issued a proclamation to the army asking them, as good citizens and brave soldiers, to rally around the constitution that they had sworn to defend to the death. But although the troops immediately under his orders showed by their cries of indignation that they shared the sentiments of their general, and the district of Sedan where he was encamped, together with the department of the Ardennes, accorded him their vigorous support, Lafayette's efforts proved unavailing owing to the opposition of his fellow generals, Luckner, hitherto loyal to the king, prudently went over to the stronger side, the Jacobins, Dumayet resumed his Orleanist intrigues, Dillon, who at first had seconded the protests of Lafayette, grew panic-stricken and recanted. The power of the Jacobins carried all before it. The mayor of Sedan and the administrators of the Ardennes were arrested, and on the 19th of August the assembly, trembling beneath the dictates of the commune, issued a writ against Motier Lafayette, heretofore general of the Army of the North, convicted of the crime of rebellion against the law, of conspiracy against liberty, and of treachery to the nation. Then Lafayette, once the jailer of his king, himself tasted the pleasures of captivity. Reduced to the same expedient, as the unfortunate Louis XVI, flight to the frontier, he was arrested by the Austrians and imprisoned in the fortress of Magdeburg, where he had leisure to reconsider his earlier dictum that insurrection is the most sacred of duties. The insurrection of August 10 appeared, at any rate to Lafayette, an immeasurable disaster, it was not, however, the final destruction of the old regime, but the destruction of newfound liberty he deplored. I know well, he wrote to the Duc de Rochefoucauld on the 25th of August, that they will have talked about plots at the chateau, collusion with the enemy, follies of all kinds committed by the court, I am not its confidant nor its apologist, but the constitutional act is there, and it is not the king who has violated it, the chateau did not go to attack the Faubourgs, nor were the Marseillais summoned by him. The preparations that have been made during the last three weeks were denounced by the king. It was not he who had women and children massacred, who gave over to execution all those who were known for their attachment to the constitution, who in one day destroyed the liberty of the press, of the posts, judgment by jury. In a word, everything that assures the liberty of men and of nations. Lafayette had not overstated the case, in the chaos that followed on the 10th of August the cause of liberty perished utterly, and the people, ostensibly the victors of the day, lost everything they had gained by the revolution. At first the rage for destruction that had held the mob under its sway during the attack on the Tuileries, and that continued throughout the weeks that followed, gave to the people some semblance of power. Whilst overthrowing the splendid statues of the kings in all the squares of Paris, the populace were able to imagine themselves indeed the sovereign people, but already their new masters were at work forging the chains that were to bind them in a servitude such as they had never known before. On the 17th of August, at the instigation of Robespierre, the tribunal criminal, precursor to the revolutionary tribunal of the terror, was inaugurated by the commune. Five days later Dr. Moore records that a new kind of lettre de cachet are being issued by the Commune of Paris in great profusion, and what makes this more dreadful is, that a man when arrested and sent to prison does not know how long he may be confined before he has an opportunity of proving his innocence. More sinister still was the appearance on the place du carousel of that new instrument, the guillotine, symbol of the new era that was to dawn on France. For although revolutionary factions and populace alike rejoiced at their supposed victory, the 10th of August inaugurated the reign of neither Orleanists, Girondins, nor sovereign people, but of one intrigue only, the intrigue that from the beginning of the revolution had been slowly gaining force, and that in sweeping away king, nobles, and clergy was to destroy not only the throne itself, but all government, all religion, and establish in their place, the reign of anarchy. The Massacres of September with the deposition of Louis XVI, and the rise to power of the Commune, the revolutionary movement entered on a new phase. The royal authority had been overthrown, but the counter-revolutionaries yet remained to be dealt with, thus it is now less against the unhappy prisoners in the temple than against the gangrene portion of the nation that the invectives of the revolutionary leaders are henceforth directed. What is the truth about this gangrene? Did it exist? In a sense, yes. 
But to understand how it came into being we must cast our eyes back over the history of the last 20 years. When Louis XV, looking around him at the end of his reign, said, things will last my time, but after me the deluge. He diagnosed with remarkable accuracy the disease that afflicted the state. France, as she existed at this date, could not last, because no state in which one class is oppressed can maintain its vigor. Under Louis XV, the peasants, if less wretched than is popularly supposed, for feudal benevolence did more than history tells us to counteract the oppression of the old regime, were, nevertheless, ciphers in the state, their wishes did not count, their voice was not heard, their needs were not officially recognized, and thus, by constriction, they became like a mortifying limb spreading germs of death throughout the body. Louis XVI, as we have seen, from the first moment of his accession, resolved to remedy this state of affairs, to loose the bonds that bound the people down, to give the constricted limb free play. It was not too late to do this, as certain writers would have us believe, the limb responded admirably to the treatment, never had the people of France displayed greater vigor than on the eve of the revolution. The body of the state, as Monsieur Dorban points out, was at this moment anything but inert and passive. Everywhere thought, passion, and blood circulate. The almost unanimous wish of the K.A.s testifies to the force of cohesion in opinion and the power of the public mind. Paris has no greater share in the spirit that animates it than Marseille, Bordeaux, and the other parts of France. In the three years that follow what enthusiasm, what ardor, what vitality in the provinces. But, at the very moment that the people were released from bondage, the revolution intervened and reversed the process by seizing on two other limbs of the state, the nobility and clergy, and binding them down relentlessly. It was not even as if the revolutionaries had said to the privileged orders, you have enjoyed too long exclusively the good things of life, now you shall share them with your fellow men. Come, give up your chateau and your rolling acres, and till the ground with the rest. Nothing of this kind was suggested, not the faintest glimmer of socialist ideals, seems to have illumined the minds of the earlier revolutionary extremists, their only idea was to subject the hitherto privileged orders to a far worse oppression than that from which the people had been delivered. For if under the old regime the people had been neglected, ignored, crushed by taxation, under the revolutionary regime the nobles and clergy were actively ill-treated, insulted, spat upon, assaulted, robbed of all their goods, driven from the country, or massacred. The people had been left to struggle for existence, the nobles and clergy were denied the very right to live. They were also, as a class, denied any virtues. No distinction was drawn between the liberal nobles who had marched in the vanguard of reform and the reactionaries who mustered around the Comte d'Artois, between the courtiers who for purely selfish reasons clung to the old regime and the provincial seigneurs who devoted themselves to the welfare of the peasants on their estates. The generous enthusiasm with which, on the 4th of August, the nobles in a body had voluntarily relinquished their privileges was rewarded by the revolutionary leaders only with insults and abuse. All royalists, said Camille de Milan at the Jacobin Club, live on the sweat of the people, they have neither wits nor virtue but for intrigue and villainy. Under these circumstances what wonder that the nobles became irreconcilable, and that many who had sympathized with the revolution turned against the whole movement, reviled the constitution, and used all their efforts to restore the old order in its entirety. Damn liberty, I abhor its very name. An indignant Frenchman exclaimed to Dr. Moore, and the sentiment was doubtless echoed by thousands of his fellow countrymen who, embittered by persecution, now desired a return to pre-revolutionary conditions. Nor was this resentment confined only to the nobles and clergy, for since, as I have shown, the revolution had resulted in the ruin and misery of great numbers of the bourgeois, and the people, discontent prevailed in all classes. Thus, by a process precisely identical with that employed by Louis XV, but applied to a different portion of the nation, a fresh center of mortification was set up, and the new order became as moribund as the old. Each revolutionary faction had worked only for momentary popularity, each demagogue in turn had proceeded on the principle, things will last my term of power, but after me the deluge, and, in order to prolong that spell of power, had striven not for the welfare of the nation as a whole, but to obtain the favor of one portion only, the mob of Paris. Mara. This, then, was the situation that, after the cataclysm of August 10th, confronted the Commune, which now held the reins of power. 
On one side was a raging populace, intoxicated with the joy of newfound liberty to burn and to destroy, and, on the other, a great silent nation, amongst whom, as the protests following on the 20th of June had shown, a bitter hatred of the revolution had arisen. For the silence that followed on the 10th of August was not, as the leaders well knew, the silence of assent but of momentary stupefaction, from which those of the nobles and clergy who remained in the country would make every effort to arouse the nation. It was this that, in the opinion of the Commune, made the Third Revolution necessary, the influence of the anti-revolutionaries could never be counteracted, therefore the anti-revolutionaries themselves must be destroyed. Marat had all along understood this. Like Louis XV, he shrewdly diagnosed the disease from which the state was suffering. The other revolutionaries recognized the existence of the gangrene, but overlooked the fact that it was of their own making. Marat alone traced it to its real cause. If, he once said to Camille de Milan, the faults of the Constituent Assembly had not created for us irreconcilable enemies in the old nobles, I persist in believing that this great movement might have advanced in the world by pacific methods, but after the absurd edict which keeps these enemies by force amongst us, i.e. the decrees against emigration, after the clumsy blows struck at their pride by the abolition of titles, after violently extorting the goods of the clergy. I maintain there is now no way of rallying them to the revolution. We must give up the revolution or do away with these men. What I propose to you is not a vain rigor supported by laws. I want an armed expedition against foreigners, who have voluntarily placed themselves outside our government. We are in a state of war with intractable enemies, we must destroy them. In a word, the only remedy for the disease was amputation. Isnar, the Girondon, in one terrible phrase, had ten months earlier proposed the operation, let us cut off the gangrene part, so as to save the rest of the body. But it was never the way of the Girondins to carry their sanguinary theories into practice, they only suggested, and then recoiled in horror when their words were interpreted by bolder men into action. Isnar, who had condensed in his proposal the whole system of the terror, was later on to devote all his eloquence to denouncing that same system, when it had passed from the region of ideas into a frightful reality. The scheme of the philosopher Isnar, was left to the surgeon Mara to execute. Jean Paul Mara, son of Jean Mara, a Spaniard, who had settled first in Sardinia, then in Switzerland, was born at Boudry, near Neuchâtel, and had spent many years in England, where he studied medicine, and practiced for a time in Church Street, Soho. In 1777 Mara went to France, where he became brevet surgeon to the Comte d'Artois bodyguard, but the office appears to have proved unremunerative, for he was obliged to supplement his income by compounding quack medicines for a few confiding aristocratic patients. During his stay in London he had, however, already embarked on his revolutionary career by the publication of a pamphlet entitled The Chains of Slavery, in which, posing as an Englishman, he endeavoured to stir up the nation against the government. Britain failed entirely to respond to this appeal and the pamphlet was a complete failure, but on the outbreak of the revolution in France Danton, realizing Marat's value as an agitator, took him into his employment. Before long Marat's seditious writings attracted the attention of Lafayette, who marched a regiment against the wretched dwarf, and so terrified him that he was obliged to retire below ground into hiding. During the weeks that Marat spent in the cellars of Paris, he had leisure to evolve further political schemes in which it would be impossible to discover any consistent plan of government. He certainly did not advocate a republic, but either a monarchy under Louis XVI, or the Duc d'Orléans, or a dictatorship under a man of the people or himself. The only continuous theme we can find running through all his writings is the abolition of all class distinctions, for which purpose every resisting element in the community must be destroyed. The petty persecutions of the Orleanists under Girondins had only served to irritate the privileged classes, attacks on property had alienated the bourgeoisie, and nothing but wholesale massacre could now relieve the situation. This idea became an obsession, by the end of his sojourn in the cellars Marat undoubtedly was mad. Marat, said his admirer Panis, remained six weeks on one buttock in a dungeon, hence Panis regarded Marat as a prophet, a second Saint Simeon Stylites. It would be nearer the truth, to describe him as a fakir. The banks of the Ganges team with prophets of this variety, victims of an ide fix, who have spent long years in precisely this attitude, gazing at the tips of their noses or repeating the sacred incantation, Ram Sita Ram. Like the monotonous chant of the fakir, Mara's cry for heads was also a confession of faith, 
but it was nonetheless a symptom of insanity, the result of homicidal mania. The fact that at moments he could reason logically does not disprove this assertion, lunatics are frequently saying to dullness on every point except their own particular mania. In appearance Mara was not unlike the malignant dwarfs one encounters in the villages of his native Switzerland. Under five feet high, with a monstrous head, the broken nose of the degenerate, a skin of yellowed parchment, the aspect of the friend of the people was more than hideous, it was supernatural. His portrait in the Carnavalet Museum, is not the portrait of a human being but of an elemental, a materialization of pure evil emanating from the realms of outer darkness. Physically, says one who knew him, Mara had a burning and haggard eye like a hyena, like a hyena his glance was always anxious and in motion, his movements were short, rapid, and jerky, a continual mobility gave to his muscles and his features a convulsive contraction, which even affected his way of walking, he did not walk, he hopped. Such was the individual called Mara. When to this outward appearance are added such mental peculiarities as furious exaltation, perpetual overexcitement, chronic insomnia, folly de grandeurs, the mania that one is the victim of persecution, it is impossible to regard Mara as a responsible human being. People feared to speak before Mara, says his panegyrist Esquiros, at the slightest contradiction he showed signs of fury, and if one persisted in one's opinion he flew into a rage and foamed at the mouth. But, apart from all other evidence, Mara's writings are clear enough proof of his insanity, we have only to turn over the pages of Lamy du Poupla or the Journal de la République Française to realize that we are listening to the ravings of a mind in delirium. For example, never go to the assembly without having your pockets full of stones destined to throw at the rascals who have the impudence to preach maxims. Citizens, erect eight hundred gibbets in the gardens of the Tuileries, and hang there all the traitors to the country. At the same time that you construct a vast pile in the middle of the basin of the fountain to roast the ministers and their agents. Citizens, let the fire of patriotism be rekindled in your bosoms and your triumph is assured, rush to arms, you know today which are the real victims that must be immolated for your salvation, let your first blows fall on the infamous general, Lafayette, immolate the whole staff. Immolate the corrupt members of the National Assembly. Cut the thumbs off the hands of the former nobles who have conspired against you, split the tongues of all the priests who have preached servitude. It is not the retirement of the ministers, it is their heads we need. Etc. The number of heads demanded by Mara increased steadily as the revolution proceeded, in July of 1790 he asked only for 600, five months later no less than 10,000 would suffice him, later the figures grew to 20,000, to 40,000, until by the summer of 1792 he explained to Barbaru that it would be a really humane expedient to massacre 260,000 men in a day. Undoubtedly, adds Barbaru, he had a predilection for this number, for since then he has always asked for exactly 260,000 heads, only rarely he went to 300,000. It would be unnecessary to enlarge on the theories of so obviously disordered a mind, were it not for the immensely important part played by Marat during the last year of his life. As Laclos had been the soul of the Orleanist conspiracy, and therefore of the First Revolution, as Madame Roland was the soul of the Gironde, and therefore of the Second Revolution, Marat was, as Bugart truly says, the soul of the Commune, and therefore of the Third Revolution, of the massacres of September and the Reign of Terror. For although Mara died before the Great Terror began, it was he who had inspired the system that produced it, it was he who became the evil genius of Robespierre and of Danton, who stimulated the destructive fury of the Hebatists, and let loose the horde of wild beasts that at the end of 1793 devastated the provinces of France. Mara plans the massacres. Directly after the 10th of August Mara began to incite the populace to massacre the royalists and Swiss, who had been imprisoned after the siege of the chateau. What folly, he wrote, to bring them to trial. And again he launched into the history of imaginary persecutions, how much longer will you slumber, friends of the country, whilst your ruin is being planned with more fury than ever. Shudder at the fate that awaits you. Thirty-seven amongst you, in which number the friend of the people, Mara himself, had the honor to be included, were destined to be fried in boiling oil if the monsters of the Tuileries had been the victors, as certain valets of Antoinette have admitted, and thirty thousand citizens would have been barbarously massacred. Let us hope for no other fate if we allow the victory to be taken from us. Up, Frenchmen, you who wish to live freely, up, up, and may the blood of traitors begin to flow. It is the only way to save the country. 
But already Mara had realized that the people were not to be depended on to carry out these schemes, and had consulted with Danton on the best method for clearing out the prisons. Two days after Danton was made Minister of Justice, that is to say on the 14th of August, Pradom relates Mara said to Danton, Futra. Would you like to have all the rascals who are in the prisons judicially punished? Why? Danton asked him. Because if you do not dispatch them as in the Glossier d'Avignon, those ruffians will succeed in butchering us all, there is a heap of nobles we must get rid of as well as priests. Danton answered him, I know quite well that a Saint Barthélemy is necessary, but the means for carrying it out seem to be difficult. Marat replied, Leave it to me, on your account prepare the deputies with whom you are acquainted, we have hairy ruffians, bougas à poil, in Paris who will give us a hand. The next day they circulated the rumor of a great conspiracy on the part of the prisoners to massacre the patriots. Camille de Milan was in the secret, as also Fabre de Glantine and Robert, all three secretaries of Danton. Danton was then deputed to confide the plan to Robespierre. But Robespierre, still at this period opposed to violent measures, demurred. You must not trust absolutely to Mara, he said, he is too hot-headed, say un mauvais tête. It was not the first time Robespierre had objected to the bloodthirsty schemes of Mara. Already a year earlier he had reproached Mara with having destroyed the immense influence of his journal by dipping his pen in the blood of the enemies of liberty, in talking of ropes and daggers. To these remonstrances Mara replied by reiterating his demand for wholesale massacres. Robespierre, wrote Mara in his account of the incident, listened to me with consternation, he grew pale and was silent for some time. This interview confirmed me in the opinion I had always entertained of him, namely, that he combined the enlightened views of a wise senator with the integrity of a virtuous man and the zeal of a true patriot, but he lacked equally the views and the audacity of a statesman. To Robespierre the massacre in the prisons proposed by Marat seemed then too audacious, yet it is impossible to concur with his panegyrists in absolving him from all complicity. Robespierre knew of the projected crime, and never offered any serious opposition, according to Prudhomme and Prusinal he was even present at two meetings of the leaders, afterwards he justified all that had taken place, Robespierre must therefore be regarded as an accomplice, if not actually an author, of the massacres. Organization of the massacres. The manner in which the massacres in the prisons were organized differed entirely from that employed in the former revolutionary outbreaks. In these, as we have seen, the plan had consisted in stirring up the people to rise en masse and fall upon the victims designated by the leaders. This plan had failed, and the commune, led by Mara, realized the futility of depending on Balaam's ass as a mode of progression, on the 20th of June it had refused to go forward, on the 10th of August it had gone mad and terrified its riders. The murder of cooks and common soldiers, the hideous scenes of cannibalism and drunken fury that had taken place at the Tuileries, though applauded by the revolutionary leaders, served no real purpose, and if repeated might become dangerous to the leaders themselves. Marat, who had never trusted the people, voiced this fear later on when, in reply to the accusation of his enemies that he aspired to the supreme power, he declared that if the whole nation at once were to place the crown on my head I should shake it off, for such is the levity, the frivolity, the changeableness of the people that I should not be sure that, after crowning me in the morning, they would not hang me in the evening. The people of Paris, those pitiable revolutionaries, must therefore not be invited indiscriminately to cooperate, so on this occasion no army of pikes and rags was summoned from the faubourgs, no mob leaders were called out, no conciliabules took place in the taverns of the Soleil d'Or or the Cardaran Blur. In a word, the old revolutionary machine was scrapped, it had served its purpose, and must be superseded by a more effectual system. According to Pradom the secret councils that preceded the massacres of September took place at the Comité de Surveillance of the Commune, and were attended by Marat, Danton, Manuel, Bio Varenne, Calud Herboy, Panis, Sergeant, Tallien, and, on the aforesaid two occasions, Maximilian Robespierre. Here the whole scheme was mapped out with diabolical ingenuity. First of all a number of fresh prisoners were to be incarcerated, principally wealthy people, for the massacres were to be not merely a method of extermination, but a highway robbery on a large scale. The commune wanted money, for what purpose we shall see later, and the systematic pillage it had inaugurated after the 10th of August, when not only the Tuileries and other royal chateaux but the houses of many private people had been looted by their agents, had not yet brought in sufficient sums. But, 
Besides the men whose death was to be effected merely as the means of acquiring their possessions, a number of victims were designated for other reasons by different members of the commune, and over this question heated discussions arose. Robespierre at one of these meetings, fearing indiscriminate slaughter, had said, we must bring only the priests and nobles to justice. But when Marat proposed to add certain members of the rival faction, Brissot and Roland, to the list, it seems that Robespierre's scruples vanished, and from after events it is evident that the hope of finally ridding himself of the hated Brissotins did more than anything else to reconcile Robespierre to the idea of the massacres. Danton, however, showed himself magnanimous. He, too, would gladly have seen Roland removed from his path, for the Minister of the Interior had an inconvenient habit of asking the Minister of Justice to tender his accounts to the Assembly, and Danton had recently drawn the sum of 100,000 acus from the public treasury for purposes he declined to reveal, contenting himself with the vague statement that he had given 20,000 francs to such an one, 10,000 to another, and so on, for the sake of the revolution, on account of their patriotism, etc. Roland, who shrewdly suspected that it was his own patriotism Danton had seen fit to reward, persisted in his demands for the names of the persons to whom these sums had been paid, thereby profoundly irritating Danton. But whether he retained some sense of gratitude for Madame Roland's soup, of which he had recently partaken, or whether, through their common intrigue with the English Jacobins, he had some secret understanding with the Brissotins, Danton did not wish to have them murdered. So to the proposal that they should be included in the massacres he answered firmly, you know that I do not hesitate at crime when it is necessary, but I disdain it when it is useless. Not content with this remonstrance, Danton went to Robespierre and interceded for Brissot and Roland. Robespierre said coldly, are not these two individuals counter-revolutionaries? Danton answered, that is not yet proved, besides, we can always find a good moment to judge them. But Robespierre already had his plans for bringing them to justice, which he executed two days later. Danton then hurried to Mara at the commune. You are a blackguard, he said in the language habitual to them both, you will spoil everything. Mara replied, I answer for success on my head, if you were all ruffians, de boogers, like me there would be ten thousand butchered. The difficulty of achieving a massacre on a large scale became the subject of discussion at several meetings of the leaders. Even if only 2,000 prisoners were incarcerated, how was so vast a number of human beings to be disposed of? Marat, says Pridom, proposed to set fire to the prisons, but it was pointed out to him that the neighboring houses would be endangered, someone else advised flooding them. P.O. Varen proposed to kill the prisoners. Another said, you propose to kill, but you will not find enough killers. P.O. Varen replied with warmth, they will be found. Talion, who refused to take part in the discussion, showed disgust, but had not the courage to oppose the project. Bio, who, according to most contemporaries, showed himself the most ferocious of all the men who organized the massacres, finally undertook to provide the necessary instruments, and in cooperation with Maya, he who had led the women to Versailles on the 5th of October, succeeded in forming a band of assassins amongst the Marseillais and the revolutionary elements of Paris, but, contrary to his expectations, this contingent proved insufficient, and it was found necessary to swell its numbers by liberating a quantity of thieves and murderers now in the prisons. Yet even to this criminal horde the leaders dared not avow their true intentions, and a lurid tale of conspiracies was invented by way of inducement to them to carry out the dreadful work. They described to the assassins, says Maton de la Varenne, Paris given over to the enemy by rascals whose leaders were in the prisons, where they were still conspiring, gibbets planted in all the streets on which to hang the friends of the revolution, their wives and children massacred beneath their eyes, Coppé insolently reascending the throne and carrying out the most horrible vengeances. Wine flowed in torrents throughout and after this infernal and slanderous harangue, and the lives of those whom they called the traitors were placed at thirty levers independently of the spoils. The same fabulous story of conspiracies, the same false alarms, were now spread abroad amongst the people in order to prepare their minds for the massacres and ensure their assent. For, though the people were not to be invited this time to cooperate, the whole movement was nonetheless to be attributed to them. In each prisoner mock tribunal was to be set up at which judges provided by the commune, and assassins hired by them, armed with lists of prescription drawn up at the secret councils of the leaders, were to carry out so-called justice and this was to be described by the high-sounding title, the Tribunal of the Sovereign People. 
The massacres were then to be represented as simply the result of irrepressible popular effervescence, produced by sudden panic at the approach of Brunswick, and the discovery of collusion between the invading armies and the conspirators in the prisons. For this purpose a phrase was invented, which was afterwards to be said to have passed from mouth to mouth amongst the terrified Parisians, namely, that before marching on the enemy they must put all these conspirators to death. The pretext was palpably absurd. Paris has never been wont to give way to panic in the face of danger from the outside, and it awaited the advancing legions of Brunswick with its habitual sang-froid. Whilst the Prussians were in Champagne, says Mercier, who would not have thought that profound alarm existed in all minds. Not at all, the theatres, the restaurants, both full, displayed only peaceful newsmongers. All the vainglorious threats of our enemies, we did not hear, of all their murderous expectations we were far from having the least idea. The capital, whether by its size or by the feeling of its strength, always believed itself unassailable, sheltered from all reverses in battle, and calculated to overawe its enemies. The plans of defense, regarded as absolutely unnecessary, were laughed at, since no one would ever dare to attack the great city. This stoicism was one of the greatest ramparts of liberty. Never were the people seriously intimidated, either by the banquets of the bodyguard, at which Antoinette was described under the name of Tigress of Germany, holding the Dauphin in her arms and inciting the most bloodthirsty hostilities, or by the flight of the king, which seemed to dissolve all government, or by the taking of Verdun, or by the manifestos of all the kings of Europe. It was impossible to make them feel terror of the enemy. And these were the people who were to be represented as so craven-hearted that, in a fit of blind panic, they fell upon their fellow countrymen, and put them indiscriminately to death. As to the fear of a conspiracy in the prisons, no such idea ever entered into the heads of the Parisians. How could people, shut up behind bolts and bars, cut off from all communication with the outside world, conspire? How could the priests, against whom the movement was principally directed, form an effectual reinforcement to the trained legions of Brunswick? How could unarmed men, women, and children take part in a massacre? The idea was preposterous, and originated in the minds not of the people but of the members of the Commune, who circulated it through Paris by means of agents placed in the crowd for the purpose. That a certain number of citizens believed it is undeniable, but to attribute to the intelligent Parisians the authorship of such a fable, or the cowardice of acting on it by falling on the prisoners, is a gross and hideous calumny which should be finally refuted. Domiciliary Visits On the 29th of August the incarceration of wealthy prisoners began. At one o'clock in the night commissioners from the Commune were sent all over the city to carry out the inquisition known as domiciliary visits, which consisted in arresting all citizens the Commune chose to regard as suspect. Peltier has vividly described the horror of this beautiful summer night, whilst the silence of death reigned over the once brilliant city. All the shops are shut, everyone withdraws into his home and trembles for his life and property. Everywhere people and possessions are being hidden, everywhere is heard the intermittent sound of the padded hammer striking slow muffled blows to complete a hiding place. Roofs, attics, sewers, chimneys, all are the same to fear that takes no risks into calculation. This man withdrawn behind the panelling that has been nailed over him seems to be part of the wall, and is almost deprived of breath and life, that one stretched along a strong wide beam in a closet covers himself with all the dust the place contains. Another suffocates with fear and heat between two mattresses, another rolled up in a barrel loses all sensation of life by the tension of his nerves. Fear is greater than pain, they tremble but they do not weep, their hearts are withered up, their eyes are dull, their breasts contracted. Women surpassed themselves on this occasion, it was intrepid women who hid the greater number of the men. During the three nights of August, 29th to 31 that the domiciliary visits lasted an enormous number of people were arrested, according to some accounts 3,000, according to others 8,000. A certain proportion were released, the rest were collected at the Hôtel de Ville to await incarceration in the different prisons. Pillage on a large scale took place during these visits, and, in order to make sure of sufficient booty, the priests, whose houses no doubt offered small opportunity for looting, were told that they would shortly be sent on a long journey, and must, therefore, provide themselves with money, they were advised, in fact, to carry all their valuables on their persons. By this means the victims of the massacres were found in possession of all the gold watches, snuff boxes, money and jewels that afterwards found their way into the hands of the commune. 
The greater number of priests thus arrested were accused of no crime, but that of refusing to violate their consciences by taking the oath of fidelity to the civil constitution of the clergy. Some, however, seem to have been the objects of private vengeance on the part of members of the commune. Amongst these was a certain Abbe Sicar, who had devoted his life to the teaching of deaf mutes. On the 26th of August the Abbe was accordingly arrested. A few days later a deputation of his pupils presented themselves at the assembly with a touching petition for his release, the assembly harshly replied that no exception could be made in favor of the abbe, and the deaf mutes were sent away with the empty consolation that they had been accorded the honors of the sitting. The members of the commune, however, were well able to make exceptions in the case of people in whom they were interested, thus Danton secured the release of a friend of his who was a thief, Camille de Milan that of a priest to whom he was attached and Fabre de Glantine that of his cook, whom he had had arrested for stealing from him. At the same time money played its part, and many aristocrats obtained their liberty by means of largesse judiciously distributed amongst the demagogues. Alarm in Paris. All was now ready, it only remained to give a popular air to the movement by starting the proposed panic on the subject of the conspiracy in the prisons. On the 1st of September a wretched wagoner named Jean Julian, who had been condemned to ten years' hard labor, was, according to the barbarous custom still preserved under the reign of liberty, publicly exhibited on a pillory in the place de Greve. Thus exposed to the jeers of the mob the man grew frantic, and broke out into furious cries of Vive la Roy! Vive la Reine! Down with the nation! By the order of the commune he was thereupon removed to the conciergerie to await further trial, and the people were then informed that during his detention he had confessed his complicity in an immense royalist plot which had ramifications in all the prisons. As a matter of fact Julian stated nothing of the kind, as the register of the criminal tribunal afterwards revealed, but he was condemned to death as a conspirator, and guillotined on the place du carousel. It is not possible, wrote Dr. Moore indignantly, that the court could have believed that this wagoner intended to excite any sedition, what he said was a mere rash retort on the mob who insulted him in his misery. If their cry had been vive la roi et la reine, his would have been vive la nation. It is plain, therefore, that he was condemned to die to please the people. Dr. Moore, unacquainted with the undercurrent of events, misinterpreted the incident, the unfortunate Jean Julian was sacrificed not to please the people, but to whet their appetite for blood in preparation for the events of the morrow, and also to give color to the story of the conspiracy in the prisons. The same day pamphlets were distributed announcing, Great Treachery of Louis Coppet. Plot discovered for assassinating all good citizens during the night of the second and third of this month. Meanwhile the lying rumor of the fall of Verdun was purposely circulated throughout Paris, and nothing, remarks Madame Roland, was forgotten that could inflame the imagination, magnify facts, and make the dangers seem greater. But it was not until twelve o'clock on the following day, Sunday, the second of September, that the imminent arrival of the Prussians was officially proclaimed. The enemy is at the gates of Paris, Verdun, which arrests his march, can only hold out for a week. Citizens, this very day, immediately, let all friends of liberty rally around its banner, let an army of sixty thousand men be found without delay, let us march on the enemy. At the same time the toxin rang, cannons were fired, the general was sounded, and from all sides citizens flew to arms. Dr. Moore, coming out of church, found people hurrying up and down with anxious faces, groups. Formed at every corner one told that a courier had arrived with very bad news, another asserted that Verdun had been betrayed like Lingui, and that the enemy were advancing, others shook their heads and said it was the traitors within Paris and not the declared enemies on the frontiers that were to be feared. But it was not amongst the people this last alarm arose, the panic mongers were emissaries of the commune sent out to circulate the parrot phrase composed by the leaders. Directly after the proclamation had been issued, says Bewley, the men who have the orders to begin the massacres cry out that, whilst the friends of liberty are grappling with the soldiers of despots, their wives and children will be at the mercy of the aristocrats, and that before starting they must exterminate these scoundrels more eager for the blood of the patriots than the Prussians and Austrians themselves. A great number of citizens listened with astonishment to these suggestions, asking themselves why at the least danger people should find pleasure in throwing Paris into a state of alarm, in striking all its inhabitants with terror, instead of maintaining in their hearts that masculine energy which befits warriors and ensures victory in battle. Was this not, indeed, an effectual method for undermining their courage? 
But those who did not know the secrets of the conspirators were soon enlightened by their own experience. Meanwhile at the assembly Danton was delivering his famous speech. It is very gratifying, messieurs, for the minister of justice of a free people to have the task of announcing to it that the country will be saved. You know that Verdun is not yet in the power of our enemies. One part of the people will march to the frontiers, another will dig trenches, and the third will defend the interior of our towns with pikes. The toxin, which is about to sound, is not a signal of alarm, it is the charge against the enemies of the country. In order to overcome them, messieurs, we need audacity, more audacity, always audacity, and France is saved. These words, which have sounded down the years as the trumpet call of patriotism, must be studied in their context in order to understand their true significance. Posterity that at a moment of national danger sighs, oh for a Danton. Takes it for granted that the audacity to which the great demagogue referred was to be displayed towards the advancing Austrians and Prussians. In this case, why employ the word audacity? In referring to soldiers marching against their country's enemies, we may speak of them as bold or courageous, we may describe them as daring for undertaking some novel or hazardous method of attack, but we do not call them audacious. Audacity does not merely signify bravery, it implies a certain degree of effrontery, of insolent contempt for public opinion, the mental resolution to bring off a coup and brazen out the consequences. It was precisely in this sense that it was applied by Danton, for the toxin to which he referred was not a summons to Frenchmen to march against Prussians, but the call to Frenchmen to fall upon Frenchmen, it was a signal for the massacres of September. Danton, having uttered his famous apostrophe, returned home, and said to his colleagues who awaited him, Futra. I electrified them. Now we can go forward. Which, says Prusinal, meant we can begin the massacres. It was then twelve o'clock. The men of blood who were waiting this signal went out hurriedly from the ministers, soon the toxin and the cannon of alarm were heard, the assassins started for the prisons, and the massacres began. A certain lawyer named Grandpre, relates Madame Roland, was employed by Roland at this time to visit the prisons, and, finding that great alarm prevailed there concerning the rumour of a projected massacre, where lay Danton the same morning as he came out of a meeting of council at the Ministry of the Interior, and begged him to ensure the safety of the prisoners. He was interrupted by an exclamation from Danton, shouting in his bull's voice, with his eyes starting out of his head, and with a furious gesture, what do I care about the prisoners? Let them take care of themselves. Jeremy F. Bien de prisonnier. Qu'il devienent si qu'il porunt. Grand Pre was not the only man to approach Danton on this fatal morning. Predom the journalist, seated in his office, hearing the sound of the toxin and the cannon, hurried to the Ministry of Justice, where he found Danton, and said to him, What means this cannon of alarm, this toxin, and the rumor of the arrival of the Prussians in Paris? Keep calm, old friend of liberty, answered Danton, it is the toxin of victory. But, persisted Prudhomme, they speak of massacring, yes, said Danton, we were all to have been massacred tonight, beginning with the purest patriots. These rascals of aristocrats who are in the prisons had procured firearms and daggers. At a certain hour indicated tonight the doors were to be opened to them. They would have scattered into all the different quarters to butcher the wives and children of patriots who march against the Prussians. Prudhomme, bewildered by this monstrous fable, inquired what means had been taken to prevent the execution of the plot. What means? cried Danton, the irritated people, who were told in time, mean to administer justice themselves to all the scoundrels who are in the prisons. At this Pridom declares he was stupefied with horror, we may question whether he ventured, however, to remonstrate at the time with quite the courage he afterwards attributed to himself. When, a moment later, Camille de Milan entered, Pridom goes on to relate, Danton turned to him with the words, Pridom has come to ask what is going to be done. Yes, said Pridom, my heart is rent by what I have just heard. Then you have not told him, Camille said, turning to Danton, that the innocent will not be confounded with the guilty. Pridom continued to remonstrate, but Danton answered firmly, every kind of moderate measure is useless, the anger of the people is at its height, it would be actually dangerous to arrest it. When their first anger is assuaged we shall be able to make them listen to reason. But if, Pridom suggested, the legislative body and the constituted authorities were to go all over Paris and harangue the people. No, no, answered Camille, that would be too dangerous, 
for the people in their first anger might find victims in the persons of their dearest friends. Pridom went out sadly, and on his way through the dining room perceived a pleasant dinner party in progress, Madame de Milan, Madame Danton, and Fabre de Glantine were amongst the guests. Word being brought at this moment to Danton that all was going well, the Minister of Justice complacently took his seat at the table. So at the very moment that the assassins started forth on their terrible work, the authors of the crime sat down to feast. The first massacre at the Abbey A. Punctually at twelve o'clock a troop of Marseille and Avignonais confederates, amongst whom were a number of men who had taken part in the Glossier d'Avignon, arrived, obedient to orders and singing the Marseillaise, at the Hôtel de Ville, to transfer the first batch of prisoners to the Abbey A. Twenty-four priests, among which, in spite of the appeal of the deaf-mutes, the Abbe Sicard was included, were thrust into several cabs, and the drivers received the order to proceed slowly through the streets under pain of being massacred on their seats if they disobeyed. The Confederates, who formed the escort, loudly informed the prisoners that they would never reach the Abbey A, as the people to whom they were to be delivered intended to massacre them on the way. In order to facilitate this operation the doors of the cabs were left open, and all efforts on the part of the priests to close them were overcome by the soldiers, who, pointing at the prisoners with their sabres, cried out to the disorderly crowd following in the wake of the procession, These are your enemies, the accomplices of those who delivered up Verdun, those who only awaited your departure to murder your wives and children. Here are our pikes and sabres, put these monsters to death. But if the leaders had hoped to give a popular air to the proceedings by inducing the mob to begin the massacres, they were disappointed, for the people around the cabs contented themselves with shouting insults, and the Marseillais were obliged to make use of their weapons themselves. After cutting at the defenseless priests with their sabres, one of the soldiers finally mounted on the steps of a carriage and plunged his sabre into the heart of the first victim. His comrades quickly followed his example, thrusting at the prisoners through the open doorways, but the blows being ill-directed only a few were mortally wounded, and it was not until the procession stopped at the doors of the Abbey, where Maillard and his hired assassins were waiting, that the massacres began in earnest. Out of the twenty-four prisoners, twenty-one perished, two, including the Abbe Sicard, succeeded in escaping to the neighboring committee of the section, and, throwing themselves into the arms of the commissioners there assembled, cried out, Save us! Save us! Several of these men, terrified for their own lives, roughly repulsed the unhappy priests, answering, Go away! Would you have us massacred? But one, recognizing the Abbe Sicar, led them into the inner hall, and closed the door on the mob. Here they might have remained in safety had not a fury in the crowd, who happened to be an accomplice of the Abbe Sicar's enemies, rushed to inform them of his escape. The next moment heavy blows sounded on the doors and voices called aloud for the two prisoners. The Abbe Sicard felt that his last hour had come. Handing his watch to one of the commissioners he said, Give this to the first deaf mute who asks for news of me. The blows on the door redoubled. The Abbe Sicard fell on his knees, offered his last prayer, then, rising, embraced his comrade and said, Let us hold each other close and die together, the door is about to open, the murderers are there we have not five minutes to live. The next moment the assassins burst into the room and rushed upon the prisoners. The Abbe Sicar's companion fell dead at his side, Sicar himself saw a pike leveled at his breast, when suddenly one of the commissioners of the section, a clockmaker named Monat, thrust his way through the crowd, and, throwing himself between the assassins and their victim, bared his breast to their blows, crying out, here is the breast through which you must pass to reach that one. He is the Abbe Sicar, one of the men who have rendered the greatest service to his country, the father of the deaf mutes. You must cross my body to get to him. At these words the murderous pike was lowered, and for a moment it seemed that the brave clockmaker had succeeded in disarming the assassins. But outside the hall the rest of the ferocious band waited, howling like wolves for their prey. Then the good abbe, showing himself at the window, obtained a moment of silence, and spoke in these words to the raving herd, My friends, here is an innocent man, would you have him die without giving him a hearing? Voices answered, you were with the others we have just killed. You are guilty as they were. Listen to me a moment, and if after hearing me you decree my death I shall not complain. My life is in your hands. Learn, then, what I do, who I am, and then you will decide my fate. I am the Abbe Sicar. A murmur went round, he is the Abbe Sicar, the father of the deaf-mutes, we must listen to him. The abbe continued, 
I teach the deaf mutes from their birth, and, as the number of these unfortunate ones is greater amongst the poor than amongst the rich, I belong more to you than to the rich. Then a voice cried, The Abbe Sikar must be saved. He is too valuable a man to perish. His whole life is employed in doing a great work, no, he has not time to be a conspirator. Immediately a chorus took up the last words, adding, We must save him. We must save him. Whereupon the assassins, standing behind the abbe at the window, seized him in their arms, and led him out through the ranks of their blood-stained comrades, who fell on his neck, embraced him, and begged to be allowed to lead him home in triumph. Nothing is stranger in all the strange history of the revolution than the evidence of latent idealism, that seems to have lingered in many ferocious hearts, how did it come to pass that, amongst this fearful horde, men could be found to applaud a noble life and perceive its value to the world, whilst themselves employed only in crime and destruction. But, although the Abbe Sikar had succeeded in disarming his terrible assassins by a direct appeal to their better feelings, he was quite unable to touch the hearts of the men who had ordained the crime, for, having refused to leave the prison until legally released by the commune, he waited in vain for this order to arrive, two days later we find him still writing plaintive appeals to the assembly to rescue him from the place of horror in which he is confined, and where he is perpetually threatened with a hideous death. The assembly contented itself with passing on the letter to the commune, but since it was there his death had been decreed, the unfortunate abbe was left to his fate, and it was not until seven o'clock in the evening of the 4th of September, by the intercession of the deputy pastorette with Aero de Seychelles, that the Abbe Sicar obtained his release. At five o'clock in the evening of the 2nd, when the carnage was temporarily suspended, Biovaren arrived in his pew-scoloured coat and black wig, wearing his municipal scarf as delegate of the commune. Stepping over the bodies of the dead priests, he thus addressed the assassins, respectable citizens, you have killed scoundrels, you have done your duty, and you will each have twenty-four levers. This discourse aroused afresh the fury of the assassins, and they began to call aloud for further victims. Then Maiar, known as Tape Der, answered loudly, There is nothing more to be done here, let us go to the calms. The Massacre at the Calms. At the Couvent des Calms, in the Rue de Vaugirard, between 150 and 200 priests had been incarcerated after the 10th of August. For a time they had believed themselves to be threatened merely with deportation, but during the two days preceding the massacres a number of sinister indications showed them that they had only a little while to live. The patriarch of this band, the venerable Archbishop of Arles, who, in spite of his age and infirmities, insisted on sharing every hardship and privation with his companions, succeeded in inspiring them all with his own heroic spirit, and it was thus that in perfect calm and resignation they awaited their end. When on this terrible Sunday afternoon, the 2nd of September, Joachim Sirat, the principal organizer of this massacre, whose inveterate hatred of religion filled him with unrelenting fury towards its ministers, ordered them all to leave the church which served as their prison and assemble in the garden, they well knew that their last moment had come. Yet it was still with undisturbed serenity that for half an hour they paced the shady alleys, whilst the terrible band of Maya came steadily nearer. Then suddenly, at the entrance to the convent, cries of rage were heard, through the bars was seen the flash of sabres, and at this the priests, retreating into a small oratory at the far end of the garden, fell on their knees and gave each other the last blessing. The Abbe de Panini, standing in the doorway of this chapel with the Archbishop of Arles, said, Monsignor, I think they have come to assassinate us. Then, said the Archbishop, this is the moment of our sacrifice, let us resign ourselves and thank God we can offer him our blood in so splendid a cause. And with these words he entered the oratory, and knelt in prayer before the altar. Even as he spoke the garden gates were broken down, and a drunken band of assassins, armed with pistols and sabres, threw themselves with savage howls upon their victims. The first to perish was Père Jolt, who, absorbed in his breviary, walked up and down beside the fountain in the middle of the garden, the second was the Abbe Salan, who had hurried to the side of his fallen comrade. Meanwhile another group of murderers made their way towards the oratory, calling out furiously, Where is the Archbishop of Arles? Where is the Archbishop of Arles? The Archbishop, hearing his name, rose from his knees and came towards the doorway. In vain his companions attempted to hold him back. Let me pass, he said, may my blood appease them. Then, standing on the steps of the chapel, he fearlessly confronted his assassins. It is you, old scoundrel, who are the Archbishop of Arles, cried the leader of the band. Yes, 
Messieurs, it is I. It was you who had the blood of patriots shed at all. Messieurs, I have never had the blood of anyone shed, nor have I ever injured anyone in my life. Well, then, I will injure you, answered the murderer, striking the archbishop across the forehead with a saber. A second assassin dealt him a fearful blow with a scimitar, cleaving his face almost in two. The heroic old man uttered never a murmur, but, still erect on the steps of the chapel, raised his hands to the streaming wound, then, at a third blow, fell forward at the feet of his murderers, and a pike was thrust through his heart. At this sight a savage howl of triumph rose from all the assassins, and, leveling their pistols at the kneeling priests inside the chapel, they began a murderous fusillade, in a few moments the floor was strewn with the dead and dying. Amongst the priests who had not taken refuge in the oratory were a certain number of young men less resigned than their superiors, and these, seeing the massacre in progress, attempted to elude their murderers. Then in the old garden a terrible manhunt began, around the trunks of trees, in and out amongst the bushes, the raging horde pursued their victims, uttering foul blasphemies against religion and singing the bloodthirsty refrain, Dansins la Carmagnole, vive le son. Vive le son? Dansins la Carmagnole, vive le son du canon. A few of the young priests, with extraordinary agility, succeeded in scaling the ten-foot wall of the garden into the neighboring rue Cassette, helping themselves upward by means of the stone figure of a monk that stood close against it, but some of these, after reaching safety, were stricken with remorse lest their escape should make the fate of those they had left behind more terrible, and with sublime courage they climbed back again into the garden and met their death. Suddenly in the midst of the butchery a voice cried, Halt! This is not the way to go to work. It was Maya who, interposing between the assassins and their victims, ordered those of the priests who still survived to be driven into the church, whilst a tribunal was set up for their judgment. At the calms this so-called tribunal of the sovereign people was even more a mockery than at the other prisons, for here none of the populace were even admitted to watch the massacre, indeed, the ladies of the quarter, that is to say, the poor women from the surrounding streets, who had collected outside the gate where they could catch a glimpse of the scene taking place in the garden, loudly protested against the shooting of the priests. And it seems to have been mainly for this reason that it was decided to finish the massacre in a more orderly manner out of view of the street, whilst at the same time a cordon of gendarmes nationaux, stationed at the gates, prevented the people from breaking in and interfering with the assassins. A table was then arranged in a gloomy cloister of the convent, and here either Maillard or a commissioner named Violette seated himself with the list of the prisoners, drawn up by Joachim Surat, spread out before him. Needless to say, no trial of any kind took place, for Surat that morning had pronounced the verdict, all who are in the calms are guilty. A few managed to find hiding places and survived the massacre, a few others succeeded in melting the hearts of the assassins, the rest, summoned two by two from the church to appear before the tribunal, rose from their knees blessing God for the privilege of shedding their blood in his cause, and clasping the scriptures in their hands, with eyes raised to heaven, went out into the corridor to meet their death. In less than two hours 119 victims had perished. The second massacre at the Abbey. At seven o'clock in the evening, after the massacre at the Calms, Maillard and his band returned to the Abbey, where a number of prisoners still remained incarcerated, for the murder of the contingent in cabs at the entrance had been only the prelude to a general massacre. The Abbe de Salamon, a young papal nuncio, whose account of these September days is perhaps the most thrilling of all existing records, has described, with frightful minuteness, the agony of mind in which he and a company of fellow priests passed that interminable Sunday afternoon. At half past two, when they had just finished dining in the long dark hall assigned them as a prison, the jailer noisily drew the bolts, and threw open the door with the words, Be quick, the people are marching on the prisons, and have already begun to massacre all the prisoners. It was, in fact, at this very moment that the procession of cabs arrived at the Abbey and the carnage began. At this news, says the Abbe Salamon, there was great agitation amongst us. Some cried, What will happen to us? Others, then we must die I many went to the door to look through the keyhole, a hole that did not exist, for prison locks only open from outside and show no opening on the interior. Others sprang up on their heels as if to look out of the windows, which were fourteen feet high, finally, others walking up and down without knowing where they were going knocked their legs violently against the seats and tables. We began to hear the cries of the people, it was like a great distant murmur. Standing apart were two young Minim brothers, 
the youngest one had an angelic face. The Abbe Salamon, going up to them, spoke words of comfort. Ah, mon Dieu, monsieur, answered the younger, I do not regard it as a disgrace to die for religion, on the contrary, I am afraid they may not kill me because I am only a sub-deacon. The Abbe Salamon, none too devout himself, admits that he blushed at these words, worthy of the earliest martyrs of the church. But the hour for martyrdom, had not yet arrived, the band of assassins, after murdering the priests at the entrance of the convent, had gone on to the calms, and for some hours all was quiet. The priests spent the rest of the afternoon in prayer and confession. Then suddenly the door was thrown open again, and the voice of the jailer called out roughly, the people are more and more irritated, there are perhaps two thousand men in the abbey. Eh? And, indeed, the tumult, and the howling of the mob could now be heard distinctly by the prisoners. The jailer added brutally, it is just announced that all the priests in the calms have been massacred. At these words the assembled company threw themselves with one accord at the feet of the cure de saint jean en Greve, a saintly old man of eighty, who retained all the serenity of a noble soul, and begged him to give them absolution in articulo mortis. After this had been given all remained kneeling, whilst the old cure said, we may regard ourselves as sick men about to die. I will recite the prayers of the dying, join with me that God may have pity on us. But at the opening words, uttered with so great dignity by the aged priest, depart, Christian souls, from this world in the name of God the Father Almighty. Almost all burst into tears. Some lay brothers loudly lamented at dying so young, and gave way to imprecations against their assassins. The good cure interrupted them, representing to them with great gentleness that they must generously pardon, and that perhaps if God were pleased with their resignation he might create means to save them. Such were the men who were represented as planning to massacre the wives and children of the citizens. Meanwhile, outside the gate of the prison in the Rue Sainte Marguerite, the massacre of the prisoners had begun. A band of assassins, preceding that of Maillard, which was still occupied at the calms, had besieged the gate clamoring for victims, and the concierge, fearing to resist them, had handed out several prisoners committed to his care. It was thus that, when Maillard and his band returned from the calms, they found the hideous work already begun. This band of massacrers, says Felamacy, comes back covered with blood and dust, these monsters are tired of carnage but not sated with blood. They are out of breath, they ask for wine, for wine, or death. What reply can be made to this irresistible desire? The civil committee of the section gives them orders for twenty-four pints to be drawn at a neighboring wine merchant. Soon they have drunk, they are intoxicated, and contemplate with satisfaction the corpses strewn in the courtyard of the abbey. It was then decided, in order to give an air of justice to their proceedings, that again a so-called popular tribunal, under Maillard, should be set up. Maillard, who was himself a thief, had brought with him twelve swindlers to act as his accomplices, and these men, mingling in the crowd as if by accident, came forward in the name of the sovereign people and seized the registers of the prison. At this the turnkeys tremble, the jailer and the jailer's wife faint, the prison is surrounded by furious men, cries and tumult increase. Suddenly one of the commissioners of the section appeared on the scene, and standing on a footstool attempted to soothe the mob, whom he took to be the cause of the uproar, my comrades, my friends, you are good patriots. But you must love justice. There is not one of you who does not shudder at the frightful idea of soaking his hands in innocent blood. Even this vile mob, collected by the leaders to abet them in their crimes, showed itself amenable to sentiments of humanity and justice, and cried out loudly, yes, yes. But those who had ordained the massacres had prepared against any eventualities of this kind, and a man in the crowd was ready with the prescribed phrase. Springing forward, with blazing eyes and brandishing a blood-stained sword, he interrupted the orator in these words, say, then, Monsieur Le Citoyen, do you wish to lull us to sleep? I am not an orator, I delude no one, and I tell you that I am the father of a family, that I have a wife and five children whom I am willing to leave here under the protection of my section in order to go and fight the enemy, but meanwhile I do not mean that the rascals who are in this prison, or the others who will open the doors to them, shall go and murder my wife and children. So by me, or by others, the prison shall be purged of all these cursed scoundrels. Instantly the mob, rallying to the word of command, shouted, he is right, no mercy. And Maillard's accomplices called out for a tribunal to be formed by their leader, Monsieur Maillard. Citizen Maillard as president. 
He is a good man, citizen Meyer. In a hall opening on the garden of the convent the terrible tribunal was then set up. At a table covered with a green cloth, on which ink, pens, and paper were arranged, Meyer, in his black coat and powdered hair, took his place, with the register of the prison spread before him. This register, preserved by the prefecture of police, long remained one of the ghastliest relics of the revolutionary era, on the greasy pages great marks of wine and blood might be seen, and all down the list of names bloodstained fingerprints left by the assassins, as they indicated the prisoner concerning whom they asked for orders. Needless to say, the verdicts had been arranged beforehand, and it was then agreed that instead of pronouncing sentence of death the words to la force, should be employed. By this means the victims, imagining themselves to be acquitted and about to be transferred to this other prison, would go forward without a struggle into the arms of their assassins. The ruse, no doubt, served a double purpose, for in cases where no evidence was forthcoming against the prisoner the so-called judges could absolve themselves of the injustice of condemning him, and attribute his death to the uncontrollable passions of the people. The first victims of this mock tribunal were the Swiss, who had been imprisoned after the siege of the Tuileries on the 10th of August. These, to the number of 43, were all common soldiers, for their officers, with the exception of Monsieur de Redding, who lay wounded in the chapel of the Abbaye, had been taken to the conciergerie. A voice, speaking through the window of the hall occupied by the tribunal, and declaring itself to be entrusted with the wish of the people, now exclaimed loudly, there are Swiss in the prison, lose no time in examining them, they are all guilty, not one must escape. And the rabble obediently echoed, that is just, that is just, let us begin with them. The tribunal thereupon pronounced the words, to la force. Maya then went to the Swiss and ordered them to come forth. You assassinated the people on the 10th of August, today they demand justice, you must go to la force. The unhappy Swiss, instantly understanding the significance of these words, for the howls of the mob had reached them in their prison, fell on their knees, crying out, mercy. Mercy? But Maya was inexorable. Two of the assassins followed, saying harshly to the prisoners, come, come, make up your minds. Let us go? Then lamentations and horrible groans arose, the unhappy Swiss, all huddling together at the back of the room, clung to each other, embraced, gave way to pitiful despair at the sight of so hideous a death. A few white-haired old men, whose looks resembled those of Coligny, almost succeeded in disarming their murderers. But a relentless voice cried, well, which of you is to go out the first? At this a tall young man in a blue overcoat, with a noble countenance and martial air, came forward fearlessly, I pass the first. He cried, I will give the example. Throwing off his hat he advanced proudly, with the apparent calm of concentrated fury, and faced the raging crowd. For a moment the horde, stupefied by his intrepidity, fell back, a circle formed around him, with folded arms he stood defiant, then, realizing that death was inevitable, suddenly rushed forward upon the pikes and bayonets, and the next moment fell pierced with a hundred wounds. All but one of his unhappy comrades shared the same fate, this sole survivor, a boy of ingenuous countenance, succeeded in enlisting the sympathy of a Marseillais, who bore him forth triumphantly amidst the applause of the crowd. Four other victims followed, accused of forging a synets, then Montmorin, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, and archenemy of Brissot and the pro-Prussian party. Montmorin had been summoned before the bar of the Assembly on the 22nd of August and accused by the Girondins of having opposed an alliance between France and Prussia, and of wishing to maintain the Franco-Austrian alliance, but the Assembly, not entirely dominated by this faction, had acquitted Montmorin, and so his death by violent means was decreed. Can we doubt that Peltier was right in saying that this foul crime lay at the door of Brissot, and may not the hand of Prussia also be detected here? Yet this too was attributed to the fury of the people. The register of Meyer bears these words, beside the name of Montmorin, on the 4th of September 1792, the Sieur Montmorin has been judged by the people and executed on the spot. Other victims followed quickly, Thierry de Ville d'Ivry, valet de chambre to the king, and guardian of the guard Merbler where the crown jewels were kept, was condemned with the words, like master, like man. Two magistrates, Bourb and Bosquillon, who had started an inquiry on the events of the 20th of June, the Comte de Saint-Marc, the Comte de Wittgenstein, the solicitor Saran, accused of calumniating the nation because he had complained of being rudely awakened from his sleep on the night of his arrest, were all put to death with indescribable barbarity. 
Jagniak de saint murd has vividly described the agony of mind in which he and his fellow prisoners passed this terrible night and the no less terrible day that followed, for the piercing screams of the victims penetrated to them in their prison, and none doubted that before long their own turn must come. The principal thing with which we occupied ourselves, says saint murd was to know what position we should assume in order to receive death the least painfully when we entered the place of massacre. From time to time we sent one of our comrades to the window of the tower, to tell us what position those unfortunate people took up who were then being immolated, so as to calculate from their report that which it would be best for us to assume. They reported that those who held out their hands, suffered much longer, because the saber cuts were stopped before reaching their heads, there were even some whose hands and arms fell before their bodies, and that those who held them behind their backs, seemed to suffer much the least. Well, it was on these horrible details we deliberated. We calculated the advantages of this last position, and we advised each other to assume it when our turn came to be massacred. It was not until nearly midnight, that the company of priests, which included the Abbe Salamon, was led before the terrible tribunal. We walked, says the nuncio, who certainly had not acquired the resignation of his more devout companions, escorted by a crowd in arms, in the midst of a great number of torches, and under the rays of a beautiful moon that lit up all those vile scoundrels. Arraigned before the green-covered table they awaited their sentence, whilst a quarrel took place amongst the judges. At last Meyer, by loudly ringing his bell, obtained silence, and one of his assistants addressed the crowd, here are a lot of rascals who are waiting for the just punishment of their crimes. All these people are priests, they are the sworn enemies of the nation, who would not take the oath. They are all aristocrats, we must begin with them, certainly they are the most guilty. The form of interrogatory was confined to the one question, have you taken the oath? The first to answer it was the old curé de saint jean en Greve, who, owning courageously that he had not taken it because he regarded it as contrary to the principles of his religion, asked only to be spared a lingering death in consideration of his great age and infirmity. Instantly a storm of blows descended on the venerable head, and a moment later the lifeless body was dragged out to the cries of vive la nation. Nearly all his companions shared the same fate, amongst the last to fall were the two Minim brothers, over whom a furious struggle took place, some of the assassins wishing to take them out and kill them, others to detain them in the hall. I noticed, says Salamon, that the underdeacon who so desired to die opposed less resistance to those who wished to drag him out than to those who wished to save him. In the end the scoundrels triumphed, and they were massacred. Such was the nature of the gangrene which the regenerators of France held it necessary to destroy. Of such stuff was made the clergy of the old regime, described to us as vicious and defeat, whose fate was but the just retribution of their deeds. Amongst the priests who perished on these September days was not a single one who had been distinguished for profligacy or extravagance, the great majority were humble, saintly men, many white-haired and venerable, whose lives had been passed in doing good, and who in death displayed a heroic resignation never surpassed in the earliest days of Christendom. No, the old order was not a feat that produced such men as these. The lay prisoners, however, were not all of the stuff of which martyrs are made. Some defended themselves vigorously. Two quite young men, who had been recognized as members of the king's new bodyguard, were dragged forward and denounced to the mob as Chevalier du Poignard, who must be punished on the spot, whereat the mob replied with savage howls of death. Death. They were, says the Abbe Salamon, two young men of superb figures and handsome countenances. The crowd began to overwhelm them with insults, then one man, more cowardly than the rest, gave the tallest one a violent blow with a sabre, to which he replied only with a shrug of the shoulders. Then began a horrible struggle between these vile drinkers of blood and these two young men, who, although unarmed, defended themselves like lions. They threw many, of their assailants, to the ground, and I think if only they had had a knife they would have been victorious. At last they fell on the floor of the hall all pierced with blows. They seemed in despair at dying, and I heard one crying out, must one die at this age, and in this manner. All through this dreadful night the massacres continued in the courtyards of the prison. The Abbe Sicar, still detained in the hall of the section, could hear the cries of the victims, the howls of the murderers, the savage songs and dances taking place around the bodies of the dead. At intervals an assassin, with sleeves rolled up, clutching a blood-stained sabre, would come to the section clamoring for more drink, our good brothers have been long at work in the courtyard, they are tired, their lips are dry, 
I come to ask for wine for them. And finally the committee tremblingly ordered them four more flagons. Then, crazed with the fumes of alcohol, the massacres returned to their hideous task. One, says the Abbe Sicar, complained that these aristocrats died too quickly, that only the first ones had the pleasure of striking, and it was decided to hit them only with the flat of the sword, and then make them run between two rows of massacres, as was formerly the practice with soldiers condemned to be scourged. It was also arranged that there should be seats around this place for the ladies and gentlemen. One can imagine, Sicards, significantly, what ladies these were. The Council of the Commune had taken care to provide not only the actors but the audience. The women of the district, trained at the Société Fraternelle, were reinforced during the massacres of September by a terrible brigade of female malefactors released from the prisons, whose role was to applaud the assassinations and incite the murderers to further violence. It was this legion that afterwards peopled the tribunes of the terror, and became known as the trecators or furies of the guillotine. Nothing had been left to chance by the organizers of the massacres. In the middle of the night members of the commune, alarmed lest under the influence of fiery drinks and excitement some of the spoils they counted on might elude them, deputed Biovar and again to harangue the massacres. My friends, my good friends, cried Bio, standing on a platform in their midst, the commune sends me to you to represent to you that you are dishonoring this beautiful day. They have been told that you are robbing these rascals of aristocrats after executing justice on them. Leave, leave all the jewels, all the money and goods they have on them for the expenses of the great act of justice you are exercising. They will have a care to pay you as was arranged with you. Be noble, great, and generous like the profession you follow. May everything in this great day be worthy of the people whose sovereignty is entrusted to you. And these were the massacres that the commune afterwards declared itself powerless to prevent. Even to the most ingenuous observer it was evident that the atrocities taking place were not a matter of misdirected popular fury, but the result of a deep laid scheme. Honest, Dr. John Moore, a stranger to all intrigues, had been told earlier in the day that the people had broken into the Abbey and were massacring the prisoners. But at midnight, as he sits writing in his hotel, close by the prison, a sudden flash of revelation comes to him, all at once he understands, and with a thrill of realization writes these illuminating words, is this the work of a furious and deluded mob? How come the citizens of this populous metropolis to remain passive spectators of so dreadful an outrage? Is it possible that this is the accomplishment of a plan concerted two or three weeks ago, that those arbitrary arrests were ordered with this view, that false rumors of treasons and intended insurrections and massacres were spread to exasperate the people, and that, taking advantage of the rumors of bad news from the frontiers, orders have been issued for firing the cannon and sounding the toxin, to increase the alarm, and terrify the public into acquiescence. While a band of chosen ruffians were hired to massacre those whom hatred, revenge or fear had destined to destruction, but whom law and justice could not destroy. It is now past twelve at midnight, and the bloody work still goes on. Almighty God! Massacre at La Force! Not only at the Abbey A was the bloody work in progress, during the same night the Chatelet and the Conciergerie, had been invaded by other bands of massacrers. At one o'clock in the morning, the 3rd of September, the massacre began at La Force. It was here that a number of aristocrats had been incarcerated after the 10th of August, these included Monsieur de Rouliers, ex-commander of the Mounted Guard of Paris. De Bourdin and de la Chenay, who had remained in command at the Tuileries after the murder of Mondar, several of the Queen's ladies, Madame and Mademoiselle de Tourzel, Madame de saint Brice, the Princess de Lamballe, Madame de Macau, Madame Bazir, and Madame de Navarre, also a foster brother of the Queen's named Weber, and Matone de la Varenne, the author of the memoirs already quoted. There were also ten or twelve priests, the rest of the prisoners were common malefactors. Very few of the aristocrats perished, only about six in all, these included de Rouliers and de la Chenay. Weber and Matone de la Varenne, though both ardent royalists, were acquitted, amidst the frantic applause of the populace. All the Queen's ladies, with one tragic exception, were likewise set at liberty by the Commune through the influence of Manuel. But there was one victim whom even Manuel was powerless to save. This was the Queen's friend, the ill-fated Princess de Lamballe. The condemnation of the Princess de Lamballe, m. Bukas et Roux have the infamy to write, is it not quite simply explained by the particular hatred the people bore her? 
No blacker calumny was ever uttered against either the princess or the people. Amidst all our agitations, even the revolutionary Mercier admits, she had played no role, nothing could render her suspect in the eyes of the people, by whom she was only known for innumerable acts of benevolence. On the estates of her father-in-law, the Duc de Penthever, with whom she had lived since the early death of her husband, she was known as the good angel, in the whole world she had but one implacable enemy, her husband's brother-in-law, Philippe d'Orléans. It has been said that the princess's dowry had excited the cupidity of the duke, and that by her death he hoped to add it to his waning fortune, whether this was so or not the duke had a further reason for resentment, namely, that the princess, recognizing his complicity in the march on Versailles on the 5th of October 1789, had refused from that time onward to associate with him. This was enough to arouse all the bitter hatred of which Philippe showed himself peculiarly capable, and under the influence of wounded vanity he planned a terrible revenge. Manuel, who had hitherto been a partisan of the Duc d'Orléans, had, however, been paid the sum of fifty thousand acus to save the princess, and, unlike Danton, Manuel displayed a certain degree of integrity with regard to compacts of this kind. Accordingly he carried out his promise to rescue Madame and Mademoiselle de Tourzel, for whom he had received a large ransom, and also gave orders that the Princess de Lamballe should be set at liberty. But the accomplices of the Duke were too strong for him. Once again the services of the bloodthirsty Rotondo had been enlisted, Rotondo who, after the disbanding of the Compagnie du Sabbat, still remained in the pay of the Orleanist conspiracy, and now placed himself at the head of a band of ferocious assassins, specially hired to carry out the vengeance of the Duke. The men that composed this gang were Goner, a wheelwright, Rignier, known as Le Grand Nicolas, an agitator of the Palais Royal called Petit Momain, Grisin, and Charlotte. At eight o'clock in the morning of September 3rd the Princess de Lamballe was brought before the so-called tribunal presided over by Heber, hereafter to become forever infamous as the author of the atrocious accusation against the Queen at her trial. The verdict was, of course, a foregone conclusion. When the Princess had arrived before this frightful tribunal, says Peltier, the sight of the blood-stained weapons of the murderers, whose faces and clothing were marked with blood, caused her so great a shock that she fell into one fainting fit after another. Then, as soon as she had sufficiently recovered consciousness, her cross-examination began. Who are you? Marie-Louise, Princess of Savoy. Your position. Superintendent of the Queen's household. Have you any knowledge of the plots on the 10th of August? I do not know whether there were any plots on the 10th of August, but I know that I had no knowledge of them. Take the oath of liberty, of equality, of hatred for the king, the queen, and royalty. I will willingly swear to the first, but not to the last. It is not in my heart. Someone whispered to her, swear, if you do not, you are dead. But this heroic woman, whose excessive nervousness had excited even the kindly derision of her friends, now that the supreme moment had come, never faltered in her resolution, over the quivering flesh the indomitable spirit rose triumphantly. Without a word she walked towards the wicket, well knowing the fate that there awaited her. The judge then said, set madam free. These words were the signal of death. Instantly the hired band of assassins closed around her. The gate was opened. It is said that at the sight of the corpses piled around her she cried out faintly, fie, law, and that two of her murderers, of whom one was goner, holding her beneath the arms, forced her to walk forward, fainting at each footstep, over the bodies of the dead. But the hideous story of her end is already known to everyone, and need not be related here. For the purpose of this book it is necessary only to follow the intrigue that ordained the crime, and to prove the non-complicity of the people. The chief murderer of the Princess de Lamballe was thus an Italian, Rotondo. Of this there can be no doubt whatever, for, besides the assertions of Montjoie, we have the evidence of Matone de la Varenne, who was in the prison of La Force at the time, and of Peltier, who was in London when Rotondo at a tavern in that city openly boasted of his share in the crime. Moreover, when Rotondo later fled to Switzerland he was arrested by the government as one of the assassins of the Princess de Lamballe, and imprisoned by the King of Sardinia. A further light is thrown upon the incident by a curious document that has been preserved amongst the Chatham papers at the record office in London. Apparently Pitt was in the habit of employing secret agents to give him information concerning the revolutionary intrigues, and from one of these he inquired about Rotondo, whose boast in the tavern had possibly reached his ears.
To this inquiry his correspondent makes the astonishing reply that Rotondo was the husband of one of the Princess de Lamballe's kitchen maids, who helped to dismember the body of her mistress. Now it was said in Paris that several of the princess's footmen, disguised as massacrers, had attempted to save her, but they were recognized amongst the crowd and overpowered. Who so likely to recognize them as their fellow servant? And since Rotondo had been for more than two years in the pay of the Duke d'Orléans, is it not possible that his wife, also perhaps an Italian, had been introduced to the Hôtel de Pentheva as an accomplice of the Orléanist conspiracy? It is evident, moreover, that the gang had been hired for this crime alone, since none of them were paid by the commune, nor do they appear to have taken any further part in the massacres, but as soon as they had carried out their sanguinary mission they marched off with their trophy, the head of the princess, to show to their employer. By a refinement of brutality they halted first at a hairdresser's for the long fair curls to be washed of blood stains and freshly powdered, then, led by Charlotte carrying the head on the pike, they went on to display it to the two best friends of the dead princess, Gabrielle de Beauvau, abbess of the Abbaye de Saint-Antoine, and Marie Antoinette at the temple. After this the procession marched on amidst the roll of drums and the sound of Saira. To the Palais Royal. The Duc d'Orléans was just sitting down to dinner with his mistress, Madame Buffon, and several Englishmen, when the savage howls of triumph that heralded this arrival attracted his attention. Walking to the window he looked out calmly on the scene, contemplated with a perfectly unmoved countenance the dead, white face, the fair curls fluttering round the pike head, and without a word returned to his place at the table. One of the Englishmen present, overcome with horror, rose and left the room, the others remained to feast with the murderer. Who these men were we shall see later. But once again Philippe d'Orléans had overreached himself, the effect of this atrocious crime was to alienate the sympathies of at least two of his supporters. Manuel, says Montjoie, outraged by the assassination of the Princess de Lamballe, from this moment declared war to the death against d'Orléans. Impulsive in his passions, knowing moderation neither in good nor evil, he was no longer either a republican, or a royalist, or a constitutional, or a monarchist, he was nothing but anti-Orléanist. It was not hatred, it was rage. The Abbe Fortchett was taken with the same fury. He began to compose a newspaper which was nothing but a long tissue of insults and imprecations against the party he had finally abandoned. Often when re-reading his pages he would say, Ah but my God! What must one do to have the honor of being butchered by these people? Several members of the convention later on ranged themselves on the side of Manuel and Fortchett. Most of the assassins of the Princess de Lamballe ended as miserably as their chief, after the 9th of Thermidor an inquiry was made into the massacres of September, and Rhenia, the Grand Nicholas, was condemned to twenty years in irons, petty mom into deportation, Charlotte, bearer of the princess's head, and guilty of further outrages that cannot be described, was put to death by the soldiers of the regiment in which he enlisted, to whom he had boasted of his crime, whilst Rotondo, leader of the gang lived a hunted life execrated by all his fellow men, and died either in prison or on the gallows. The Victims of the Massacres It is mercifully unnecessary to the purpose of this book to describe the rest of the massacres, which lasted for five days and nights in succession, enough has already been told to give some faint idea of the horrors that took place throughout that week of infamous memory, the whole truth would be unbearable to read, still more to write. It only now remains to show who were the principal victims. The number of aristocrats who perished was, as we have seen, comparatively infinitesimal, several of the most ardent royalists succeeded in disarming their assassins. At the Abbey, where the massacre continued for two days and nights almost without intermission, the heroic Princess de Tarrant, having refused, in almost the same words as the Princess de Lamballe, to betray the Queen, was carried home in triumph by the crowd. Mademoiselle de Cazotte, with her arms around her white-haired father, touched the hearts of the spectators, and the old man was set at liberty by the populace, only to fall a victim to the revolutionary tribunal three weeks later. Mademoiselle de Sombeil, who really did drink the glass of blood to save her father's life, also secured for him a temporary reprieve. Jergniac de saint merd was acquitted after boldly admitting himself to be a frank royalist. The Abbe de Salamon was saved by his housekeeper, Madame Blanchet, a heroic old peasant woman, who had followed him weeping to the door of the Abbey, and waited about there patiently for five days without touching solid food. Hearing at one moment that her master had been massacred, Blanchet and a friend, a woman of the people as robust and courageous as herself, made their way into the courtyard of the Abbey, 
resolved to know the worst. Then, weeping bitterly the while, the two poor women turned over the naked corpses one by one, fearing each time to find the face they sought. When they had thus examined about a hundred of the dead, Madame Blanchard cried out with tears of joy, he is not there. And from that moment she importuned every one she met to obtain his release. These efforts meeting with no success, Madame Blanchard at last seized a deputy of the assembly by the collar of his coat as he made his way through the Tuileries garden, and forced him to intercede for the Abbé de Salamon. By this means the faithful Blanchard achieved her purpose, and her master was given back to her alive. Whilst a number of aristocrats were thus saved from the massacres, to the people, as on the 10th of August, the revolutionaries showed no mercy. For although the object of the massacres was, as we have seen, to rid the state of that gangrened limb, the nobility and clergy, the operation was very imperfectly carried out, whilst on the other hand drastic amputation was exercised on the people. Thus at the conciergerie, where the massacre began on the night of September the 2nd to the 3rd, the prisoners were, with the exception of Monsieur de Montmorin, governor of Fontainebleau, and seven or eight Swiss officers, all ordinary criminals of the poorer classes, and of these at least 320 were massacred without even the formality of a trial. Thirty-six who survived were set at liberty on the condition they should join themselves to the assassins, and seventy-five women, mostly thieves, were enrolled with the rest of the liberated female delinquents to swell the ranks of the future tracateurs. Only one woman, a flower seller of the Palais Royal, perished here after the most inhuman tortures. The Chatelet, attacked on the same night, contained nothing but men of the people, all were thieves, 223 perished also without a trial. Of these poor victims of the cause of liberty we have no record, in the great whirlpool of the revolution they went down in one indistinguishable mass, no chronicler was there to describe their last moments, no survivor wrote his memoirs, of several hundred, indeed, it is unrecorded whether they lived or died, they simply disappeared. One trait of heroism stands out from the darkness of oblivion, a poor criminal, who had been offered his life on condition he should enroll himself amongst the massacres, set himself to the ghastly work, struck one or two elamed blows, then, overcome with horror at himself, flung down the hatchet, crying out, No, no, I cannot. Better be a victim than a murderer. I would rather be given my death by scoundrels like you than give it to disarmed innocents. Strike me. And instantly he fell beneath the blows of his assassins. On the following day, the 3rd of September, the Tour Saint Bernard was attacked, here seventy-five men condemned to the galleys were put to death, and their bodies robbed of their poor savings. But of all the brutalities that took place on these September days, the massacre at Bercetra was the most atrocious. Bercetra had always been the prison of the people, and, as we have seen earlier in this book, far more dreaded by them than the Bastille. We might then have expected the breaking open of this stronghold of despotism to end, as did the taking of the Bastille, with the triumphant liberation of its victims. If the revolution had been made by the people this no doubt is what would have happened, but it was by the revolutionary sections of Paris, under the control of the Commune, that the attack on Bicetra was organized, and by them cannons were provided for the purpose. They went to Bicetra with seven cannons, says the lying report of the assembly, the people in exercising their vengeance thus showed their justice. What form did this justice take? The massacre of 170 poor people, amongst whom were a number of young boys of 12 years old and upwards, unfortunate little street urchins detained, in many cases, at the request of their relations, as a punishment for minor offences. In all the annals of the revolution there is no passage more heartrending than the account of this foul deed given more than forty years later by one of the jailers, they killed thirty-three of them, the unhappy ones. The assassins said to us, and indeed we could see it for ourselves, that these poor children were far more difficult to finish off than grown-up men. You understand that that age life holds hard. They killed thirty-three of them. They made a mountain of them, over there in the corner. At your right. The next day, when we had to bury them, it was a sight to rend one's soul. There was one who looked as if he were asleep, like an angel of the good God, but the others were horribly mutilated. At the Salpetriere, a house of correction for women, as Bicetra was for men, unspeakable barbarities took place, thirty-five victims in all perished, and these were not the most unfortunate. The abominations committed towards little girls of ten to fifteen years cannot be described. If you knew the frightful details. Madame Roland wrote later of the massacre at the Salpetriere, women brutally violated before being torn to pieces by these tigers. 
You know my enthusiasm for the revolution, well, I am ashamed of it, it is dishonored by villains, it has become hideous. That the people were therefore the principal sufferers in the massacres of September is not a matter of opinion but of fact. The following table gives the precise statistics concerning the class of victims sacrificed, if, therefore, we accept the 69 soldiers who perished as the last defenders of royalty, we arrive at the enormous total of 1,000, and 11 victims from amongst the people who had no connection whatever with the political situation. Yet it was this senseless and wholesale butchery that the revolutionary leaders described as just and necessary, but that, when they realized the universal horror it inspired, they basely attributed to the people. It was a popular movement, Robespierre afterwards declared, and not, as has been ridiculously supposed, the partial sedition of a few scoundrels paid to assassinate their fellows. And with revolting hypocrisy he added, we are assured that one innocent perished, they have been pleased to exaggerate the number, but even one is far too many without doubt. Citizens, weep for the cruel error, we have long wept for it. But let your grief have its term like all human things. Let us keep a few tears for more touching calamities. Mara likewise heaped all the blame on to the people, the disastrous events of the 2nd and 3rd of September were entirely provoked by the indignation of the people at seeing themselves the slaves of all the traitors who had caused their disasters and misfortunes. It was a perfidious insinuation to attribute these popular executions to the commune, executions that, in the same breath, Mara, with his usual wild inconsequence, describes as unfortunately too necessary. If necessary, why was it perfidious to attribute them to the commune? The historians who have made it their business to whitewash Mara, Danton, and Robespierre, effect their purpose by the same process of blackening the people. We believe that the massacre at the prison of the Abbaye, writes Bugart, the adorer of Mara, was executed by the people, by the true people. Mara cannot be accused of it, for he did everything before and during the event to prevent such horrible atrocities. Of all calumnies on the people uttered by the men who called themselves their friends, this accusation of having committed the massacres of September is the most infamous and the most unfounded. Apart from the revelations of Prudom, to whom the authors of the massacres confided their designs in the dialogues already quoted, apart from the evidence of eyewitnesses who saw the assassins being paid by the emissaries of the commune, we have documentary proof of these facts, the registers of the commune recording the sums paid were preserved, a number of receipts signed by the murderers were still in existence until 1871. The immense researches of Monsieur Granier de Cassagnac and Monsieur Mortimer turn no long ago laid bare the whole plot, and no revolutionary writer has ever succeeded in disproving their assertions. Yet, in spite of all this overwhelming evidence, we still read in English books, not merely the books of fanatics, but dry histories and manuals for schools, that the people of Paris, overcome by panic, marched on the prisons and massacred the prisoners. The Assassins who were the men that the leaders succeeded in enlisting for the hideous task? Very great pains have been taken, Dr. John Moore wrote on the 10th of September, to urge the notion that the assassins were no other than a promiscuous crowd of the citizens of Paris. This was absolutely untrue. The assassins formed an organized band of not more than 300 men, a point on which all contemporaries not in collusion with the leaders agree. Nor is there any mystery concerning their identity, for the names and professions of the greater number are known, and have been published by Monsieur Granier de Cassagnac. There were then, in addition to the Marseillais and released convicts who formed the nucleus of the gang, a certain number of men who might be described as citizens of Paris, and, strangely enough, these were not mostly rough brutes from the barges on the Seine or the hovels of Saint Marceau, but boutiquiers or small tradesmen, bootmakers, jewellers, tailors, two of these were Germans, some, indeed, appear to have been men of education. It is this latter class that seems to have lent itself most willingly to the hideous work, the rest were persuaded by various methods to cooperate. The greater number undoubtedly yielded merely to the lust for gold, to the promise of wine and booty in addition to their salary, others, the more ignorant no doubt, believed the story told them of the plot hatched by the prisoners to massacre their wives and children, and went forth in all good faith to destroy the supposed enemies of their country. As to the ferocity they displayed once they had set themselves to the task, it is to be explained in the same way as the outrages committed at the Tuileries on the 10th of August, by the effect of fiery liquor working on overwrought brains. Moreover, this time it was not merely alcohol that had been given to them, but something more insidious that had been purposely introduced into the drink with which they were plied incessantly. 
Maton de la Varen says that Manuel had ordered gunpowder to be mixed with their brandy, so as to keep them in a state of frenzy, but the two friends of liberty declare that they were drugged, it is incontestable that the drink that had been distributed to the assassins was mingled with a particular drug that inspired terrible fury, and left to those who took it no possibility of a return to reason. We knew a porter who for twenty years had carried out errands. In the Rue des Noyers? He had always enjoyed the highest reputation, and every inhabitant of the district blindly confided the most valuable parcels to him. He was dragged off on the 3rd of September to the convent of Sonfermain, where he was forced to do the work of executioner. We saw him six days later when we were ourselves prescribed, and, needing a man who could be trusted to help us move secretly, we addressed ourselves to him. He had returned to his post, he was trembling in every limb, foaming at the mouth, asking incessantly for wine, without ever slaking his thirst and without falling a victim to ordinary drunkenness. They gave me plenty to drink, he said, but I worked well, I killed more than twenty priests on my own account. A thousand other speeches of this kind escaped him, and each sentence was interrupted by these words, I am thirsty. In order that he might not feel inclined to slake his thirst with our blood, we gave him as much wine as he wished. He died a month later without ever having slept in the interval. This circumstance explains the fact that at moments the assassins showed themselves capable of humanity, evidently, when the first effects of the drug had begun to wear off, they returned more or less to a normal frame of mind. Thus the two cutthroats, who conducted the Chevalier de Bertrand safely home, insisted on going upstairs with him to contemplate the joy of his family. The rescuers of Jurgniac de saint Merd, a Marseillais, a mason, and a wigmaker, refused the reward offered them with the words, we do not do this for money. Later on Bewley met these men at the house of St. Merd. What struck me, he says, was that through all their ferocious remarks I perceived generous sentiments, men determined to undertake anything to protect those whose cause they had embraced. The greater number of these maniacs, dupes of the Machiavellian beings who set them in motion, are dead or dying in misery. The role of the people. From the point of view of the leaders, the populace proved disappointing during the massacres of September, for although it had not been thought advisable to march the Faubourgs en masse on the prisons, it was hoped that when the moment came a certain proportion of the Paris mob would join in the killing as they had done at the massacre of Saint Barthélemy. In spite of all the activity displayed, says Pridom, the 30,000 victims, designated by Danton himself, did not find enough executioners. They, the leaders, counted on the people, they accredited them with more ferocity. They hoped that they would not remain idle spectators of five to six thousand massacres executed before their eyes, they supposed that they would themselves strike en masse, and that, after having emptied the prisons, they would go into the houses and repeat the same scenes, but they could never succeed in exasperating the multitude to this extent. On the contrary, even by the mob assembled around the prisons, every single acquittal recorded was hailed with acclamations, often with rapturous applause, a prisoner who made a dash for liberty was certain to find the crowd opening out to let him through. The royalist, Weber, could hardly extricate himself from the embraces of the bystanders, amongst whom savage-looking harridans, concerned for his white silk stockings, cried out reprovingly to the guards who led him, take care there. You are making monsieur walk in the gutter. Yet that the mob, obedient to the suggestions of the leaders, excited with drink and attacked by that strange insanity familiar to all who have studied crowd psychology, did at other moments allow itself to be carried away into applauding the massacres, did indeed throughout stand idly by and utter only occasional words of protest, is undeniable. But were these the people? A thousand times no. We have already seen whence they were recruited, the true men and women of the people remained far from such scenes as these. I will testify to Europe, cries Bigot de saint croix that the people of my country, that those of the capital, did not ordain, did not desire these massacres, that the people did not even see them committed. The people closed their windows, their workrooms, their shops, they took refuge in the furthest corners of their dwellings so as to shut their ears and eyes to the uproar, and to the sight of those beings, strangers to the people and to human nature, who, armed with knives, sabres, and clubs, their faces and their arms stained with blood, carried through the streets heads and fragments of mutilated bodies, and deafened themselves with the ferocious hymn, the Carmagnole, that had been dictated to them. Ah! Why should the people again be calumniated? And Mortimer Turno adds, yes, it is lying to history, 
it is betraying the sacred cause of humanity, it is deserting the most obvious interests of democracy, to calumniate the people, to take for them a few hundred wretches. Going basely to seek their victims one by one in the cells of the Abbey or of La Force. The people, the true people, composed of honest and industrious workmen, warm-hearted and patriotic, of young bourgeois with generous aspirations and indomitable courage, did not mingle for a moment with the scoundrels recruited by Maillard. The people, the true people, were all at the Cham de Mars or in front of the recruiting platforms, offering their best blood for the defense of the country, they would have been ashamed to shed that of defenseless victims. But, it will be urged, why did the people of Paris not interfere? Why, instead of retiring into their houses and shutting their ears and eyes, did they not rush out into the streets and arrest the murderers? Instead of mustering at the Cham de Mars, march on the prisons and deliver the victims. All Paris let it happen, lace affair, Madame Roland writes indignantly, all Paris is accursed in my eyes, and I hope no longer that liberty may be established amongst cowards insensible to the worst outrages that could be committed against nature and humanity, cold spectators of crimes that the courage of fifty armed men could easily have prevented. Madame Roland well knew the true explanation of the people's conduct, her own behavior during the massacres we shall refer to later, she was perfectly aware that it was the cowardice of the authorities of her friend Pétion, of the virtuous Roland himself that made it possible for the Commune to carry out its designs unhindered, that prevented the people from interfering. If the people, says Prudhomme, did not put a stop to the murders committed in their presence, it was that, on seeing that their representatives, their magistrates, and the staff of their armed force made no attempt to prevent this butchery, they could only believe that these were acts of justice of a new kind. Here, then, is the explanation. In the first place, the people of Paris were told, and in some cases made to believe, that the massacres were a necessary act of precaution in view of the conspiracy amongst the prisoners to massacre the citizens, secondly, the massacres were carried out officially under the eyes of the authorities, presided over by officials wearing their municipal scarves, and executed in some instances by assassins masquerading in the uniform of the National Guards, and thirdly, the people were prevented by armed force from interfering. We know from the researches of Monsieur Mortimer Temo and Monsieur Granier de Cassagnac that Santerre, the commander general, was authorized to surround the prisons with troops during the massacres, in order to prevent accidents, and the nature of these accidents is elsewhere very clearly revealed. Thus, as we have already seen at the calms a cordon of police was provided to protect the assassins from the crowd, and Sinart relates that the same precaution was demanded at La Force, the butcher legendary went to find one of the commanders of the arsenal, and asked him for two hundred armed men to go to La Force in order to second the murderers and protect them, because the number of prisoners was very great and there were not enough massacrers. A request with which the honest commander indignantly refused to comply. But the fact that the massacrers were given armed protection during their hideous task received additional confirmation just a hundred years later. In the Entremediere des Chasseurs et Curieux for April 20, 1892, Monsieur Alfred Beges related that he had recently acquired a copy of a pamphlet, by Garot, that had belonged to Sergeant, who, with Panis, the brother-in-law of Santerre, had been entrusted with the police and the prisons as members of the Comité de Surveillance of the Commune. Now in this pamphlet, which was annotated throughout by the hand of Sergeant, Garot asked the question why the people allowed the massacres of September how is it that so much blood flowed under other blades than that of justice without the legislators, without the magistrates of the people, without the whole people themselves summoning all the public forces to the place of these sanguinary scenes. To this question Sergeant made reply in the margin, the massacres of the Abbey asked to be protected during their dreadful work by a guard which was granted to them. The mob of Paris collected round the prisons had then attempted to interfere, since the murderers were obliged to ask for protection, and this was the kind of accident the armed forces were sent out to prevent. Undoubtedly we must blame the soldiers for obeying this monstrous order, but it should be remembered that all the normal elements in the army were collected on the frontier, and that the only forces remaining in Paris were those of which the revolutionary leaders had made sure, the Confederates from Marseille, or Brest, or the camp at Soissons. The call to arms had thus admirably served their purpose by ridding them of all those loyal and patriotic citizens who might have been expected to prevent bloodshed. The authors of the massacres. The truth is, then, that the only men who attributed the massacres of September to the people of Paris were the men who themselves had devised and ordered them. With consummate hypocrisy the Commune declared that it had sent emissaries to the prisons to oppose disorders, but that they could not succeed in calming the people. Apart, however, from the evidence of eyewitnesses, 
who unanimously asserted that the emissaries of the Commune incited the assassins to greater violence. We have further documentary proof of the Commune's guilt in the atrocious proclamation publicly sent out by it on the 3rd of September to the provinces, urging them to carry out the same butchery all over France, and passing on to them the same word of command that it had served in Paris as a pretext for the massacres. The Commune of Paris hastens to inform its brothers in all the departments that a portion of the ferocious conspirators detained in the prisons have been put to death by the people acts of justice which seemed to it indispensable in order to restrain by terror the legions of traitors concealed within its walls at the moment when it was about to march on the enemy, and without doubt the whole nation, after the long series of treacheries which have led it to the edge of the abyss will hasten to adopt this measure so necessary to public safety, and all the French will cry like the Parisians, we will march on the enemy, but we will not leave behind us brigands to murder our wives and children. Signed, Duplain, Panis, Sergeant, Lenfant, Jurduel, Marat, Lamy du Poplar, de Forges, du Four, Cali. That Marat was the principal author of the proclamation cannot be doubted, but it was sent forth under the countersign of Danton, the Minister of Justice. To Danton, then, attaches the greater blame, for Mara cannot be regarded as a responsible human being, whilst Danton throughout the revolution retained full possession of his faculties. That Mara, says Mortimer Turno, the most shameless liar and the most daring forger who ever existed, we make use of the exact expressions that M. Michelet and Louis Blanc employ with regard to this man, that Mara, we say, should have drawn up this frightful circular, and on his own authority should have appended to it the signatures of his colleagues, is strictly possible. But the two men who can never clear themselves of having cooperated in the propagation of this bloody work are Danton and Fabre de Glantine, the Minister of Justice and his secretary. It is doubtful, indeed, whether Danton wished to clear himself of the responsibility of the massacres of September, or of the proposal to repeat them in the provinces. Now that the monarchy was overthrown, Danton knew that he had nothing to fear in avowing his share in the crimes of the revolution, securely encamped on the strongest side he was able to win that reputation for audacity which has aureoled him in the eyes of posterity. The massacres of September were, therefore, primarily the work of the anarchists, but they were condoned, if not actually assisted, by the other intrigues, as we shall now see. Role of the Orleanists On this point little remains to be said, for by September of 1792 the Orleanists had ceased to be a distinct party, and had become indistinguishable from the anarchists. According to many contemporaries, Danton and Marat, in promoting anarchy, were working solely in the interests of the Duc d'Orléans, Mournjois believes that it was in order to effect a change of dynasty the massacres were devised. But apart from these vague charges, there can be no doubt that the Duc d'Orléans had some secret connection with the leaders, of this the murder of the Princess de Lamballe by his agents is sufficient proof. Moreover, it was precisely at this moment, on the 2nd of September, that Mara publicly demanded 15,000 francs from the Duke for the printing of several of his pamphlets, and apparently obtained it, for henceforth we shall find him always favorably disposed to the citizen Egalité, the name the Duke d'Orléans soon after assumed when seeking election as deputy to the convention. But whatever were the ultimate intentions of these men who devised the massacres, and on this point no one can speak with certainty, their immediate purpose can be expressed in one word only, anarchy. Role of the Girondins The part played by the Girondins in the massacres of September was merely one of criminal connivance. With the exception of Pétion, whose sympathies were undoubtedly Orleanist, no member of this faction seems to have taken an active part in the movement. Vernio, indeed, loudly denounced the arbitrary arrests that preceded the massacres, but since by this time the walls of Paris were already placarded by Marat with invectives against the deputies of the Gironde, this was perhaps less an act of courage than a measure of self-defense. At any rate, from the moment the massacres began, not one member of this faction attempted to interfere. On the 5th of September, whilst the third day of the massacre at La Force was in progress, Duhem afterwards related, he dined at Pétion's house with Brissot, Genjorna, and several other deputies. Towards the end of dinner the folding doors opened, and I was surprised to see two cut throats enter, their hands dripping with blood. They came to ask the orders of the mayor concerning the eighty prisoners who still remained to be massacred at La Force, Pétion gave them drinks and sent them away, telling them to do everything for the best. As to Madame Roland, who afterwards cursed the people of Paris for their non-intervention, how was she employed? On the evening of September 2nd, she relates, when the butchery had begun, a crowd of about two hundred men, 
violently agitated, came to the Ministry of the Interior to ask for arms, we know from other sources that they were the massacrers, who, imagining Roland to be one of their employers, asked also for the payment of their salary, and, according to Felamacy, they received it. But Felamacy as a Dantoniste need not be believed. At any rate, after this frightful scene, whilst the massacres were in full swing next day at La Force, the Abbey A, and the Tour Saint Bernard, Madame Roland saw fit to give a luncheon party, or, as the two o'clock meal in those days was called, a dinner, to a number of her friends and acquaintances, amongst whom the events of the day formed the topic of conversation. One of the guests, afterwards disowned by Madame Roland, was the Prussian Baron Plutz, whom we shall meet later on as the Apostle of Universal Brotherhood, and who distinguished himself during the massacres of September by inventing the word to Septemberize, it was a matter of regret, he afterwards declared, that they had not Septemberized enough. The same day, however, the virtuous Roland ventured to utter a feeble protest against the continuance of the massacres. Beginning with a lengthy dissertation on the necessity for controlling the irrepressible indignation of the people, who, according to Madame Roland's later writings, he well knew were not the authors of these crimes, amidst redundant eulogies of his own courage and disinterestedness, Roland thus described the massacres of September 2nd, yesterday was a day over the events of which we should perhaps draw a veil, I know that the people, terrible in their vengeance, yet bring to it a sort of justice. But now the moment had come for the legislators to speak, for the people to listen, and for the reign of law to be re-established. The fact is that something had happened the evening before which made it highly desirable, from the Girondin's point of view, that the activities of the commune should be restrained. Robespierre had been thwarted by Danton in his plan of including Roland and Brissot in the lists of prescriptions made out for the massacres, but he had not abandoned all hope of his prey. Under cover of the general confusion that reigned in Paris on the 2nd of September the Tiger Cat had seized the opportunity to spring. Supported by his ally B.O. Varenne, Robespierre presented himself at the evening meeting held by the Council General of the Commune, and openly accused Brissot and a powerful party of conspiring to place the Duke of Brunswick on the throne of France. This accusation has been represented by the antagonists of Robespierre as a mere fable invented by him to bring about the downfall of Brissot, but, as we have already seen, the intrigue in favour of Brunswick was by no means fabulous, on the contrary, it was a matter of common knowledge. Had not Kara publicly proclaimed it six weeks earlier in his journal? And was not Kara still the trusted confidant of Brissot and the Rolands? Robespierre, then, was perfectly just in accusing Brissot, two days later, in private conversation with Pétion, whose own intrigues he was apparently far from suspecting, he repeated his conviction that Brissot was on the side of Brunswick. That by his timely denunciation he hoped to envelop the Brissotins in the massacres we cannot doubt, yet we must admit that in this he showed himself more logical than the other members of the commune. For if any people were to be put to death on the suspicion of collusion with the Prussians, should they not be the members of the party still at liberty who had definitely proposed to hand the country over to the head of the invading armies, rather than a defenseless crowd of priests, unarmed men, women, and children safely imprisoned behind bolts and bars? Brissot's reply to this accusation of Robespierre was characteristic of the ostrich policy displayed by the Girondins. Yesterday, Sunday, he wrote to his fellow citizens, I was denounced at the Commune of Paris, as also a part of the deputies of the Gironde, and other men equally virtuous. We were accused of wishing to give France over to the Duke of Brunswick, and to have received millions from him, and to have planned to escape to England. I, the eternal enemy of kings, who did not wait till 1789 to manifest my hatred towards them, either partisan of a duke. Better perish a thousand times than acknowledge such a despot. Etc. But considering that before 1789 Brissot had violently denounced in print the abominable crime of attacking monarchy, that he had described Ravaillac and Damiens as monsters vomited by hell, and that only six weeks before the massacres of September, on July 25, 1792, he had declared that the blade of the law should strike anyone who attempted to establish a republic, considering, moreover, that he had never disassociated himself from Kara, the avowed partisan of Brunswick. Brissot's defense was far from convincing. The Brissotins, then, constituted a very real danger to the country at the moment when it was threatened by foreign invasion, but we should admire Robespierre's courage and patriotism in attacking them more if he had not waited so long to shoot his bolt. The intrigue with Prussia had been going on for at least 18 months, why had he not exposed it earlier? 
While the publication of Kara's preposterous plea for Brunswick did not Robespierre arise and denounce him as a traitor, or at least demand his expulsion from the ranks of patriots at the Jacobin Club. But no, Robespierre had hitherto maintained complete silence with regard to all three intrigues, the Orleanists, English Jacobins, and Prussians, and had even, as we have seen, joined in ridiculing Ribes for denouncing them. The explanation lies undoubtedly in Robespierre's natural timidity, it was never his way to fight his opponents, but always to remain quiescent until an opportunity offered for killing them outright, the tiger cat knew better than to show his claws before the moment came to spring. The massacres of September had appeared to be the propitious moment, but Danton barred the way, next time he was to say with tears, I cannot save them. The Girondins well realized the danger that had threatened them, and therefore, after condoning the massacres, ended by denouncing them. But if they now deprecated the reign of anarchy, it was principally because they saw the movement they had helped to produce turning against themselves, and the abyss into which they had precipitated the monarchy yawning beneath their own feet. The English Jacobins the news of the massacres of September filled the same portion of the English people with indignation, and alienated even those who, misled by the propaganda of the Whigs and the revolutionary societies in England, still retained a lingering sympathy with the supposed struggle for liberty taking place across the Channel. The late horrors in France, Mr. Verger's rights to Lord Auckland on the list of September, have at least been attended with one good consequence, for they have turned the tide of general opinion here very suddenly. French principles, and even Frenchmen, are daily becoming more unpopular, and I think it not impossible that in a short time the impudence of some of these levellers will work so much on the tempers of our people as to make England neither a pleasant nor a secure residence for them. A messenger from Paris reported to Lord Auckland on the 10th of September that the details passed all conception. It is impossible for me to express the horror that I still feel, I could not have believed till now that human nature was capable of such abominations. Lord Auckland himself is so affected that he can hardly write of it, all Gibbon's history, though the bloodiest book he ever read, does not contain a story of such unprovoked and wanton cruelty. Lord Stanhope, however, had nothing but pity and contempt for squeamishness that could recoil at such scenes as these. The French Revolution, he wrote on September 18, has frightened some weak minds, Mr. Payne's works others. And the late events in France have intimidated many. However despicable such feelings may be, abstractly considered, when they are pretty general, they must be treated with some respect. Amongst weak minds we must certainly include those of almost the entire population, for these despicable feelings were more than pretty general, they were shared by all classes of the community. The sympathies of the nation were with the victims, not with the authors of the revolution, and the unhappy émigrés, flying from the horrors of Paris to the shores of England, met with an enthusiastic welcome. One must have lived through three years of revolution, says one of these émigrés, amidst Girondins, Jacobins and others, to understand what the first glimpse of the English conveyed, the ecstasy of arriving in this isle of serenity from the regions of terror, it was the gentle awakening of the soul that, long tormented by the vision of monsters and furies, comes out of this frightful dream. Once again humanity and compassion became a reality. Every boatload of priests was awaited by a sympathetic crowd, even the sailors, seeing in these men the martyrs of religion, fell on their knees before them on the beach to ask their blessing. I was a witness, says Peltier, of the zeal and eagerness with which all classes of society welcomed these unhappy pastors. From the throne to the simplest cabin, everywhere was there asylum, everywhere was consolation. In London a subscription raised by Burke, Wilmot, Stanley, and others met with an immense response, the poor like the rich brought their contributions, and those who could not give money gave the work of their hands, potato sellers insisted on providing the priests with their wares for no remuneration, seamstresses offered their services for nothing, artisans worked overtime to earn money for them, a day laborer, touched to tears by their appearance, cried out, I am very poor but I can work for two. Give me one of these priests and I will feed him. It was, then, only amongst an infinitesimal minority, composed of such men as Lord Stanhope and the middle-class malcontents who formed the revolutionary societies of London and of the manufacturing towns of the North, that the revolution found sympathizers. By these associations the massacres of September were greeted with frenzied approbation. On the 27th of September a long address of congratulation was forwarded to the Jacobin Club of Paris by the members of the Constitutional Society, and the Reformation Society of Manchester, the Revolution Society of Norwich, the Constitutional Whigs, the Independents and Friends of the People. 
a few passages of this precious effusion must be quoted, Frenchmen, our numbers may seem small compared to the rest of the nation, but know that they are steadily increasing. We can tell you with certainty, free men and friends, that education is making rapid progress amongst us. That men ask today, what is liberty? What are our rights? Frenchmen, you are free already, but Britons are preparing to become so. Divested at last of these cruel prejudices industriously inculcated in our hearts by vile courtiers, instead of our natural enemies, we see in the French our fellow citizens of the world, the children of that universal Father who created us to love and help each other, not to hate and murder one another at the command of feeble or ambitious kings or corrupt ministers. In seeking our real enemies we find them in the partisans of that aristocracy which rends our bosoms, aristocracy hitherto the poison of all countries on earth, you acted wisely in banishing it from France. Dear friends, you are fighting for the happiness of all humanity. Can there be any loss to you, however bitter, compared to the glorious and unprecedented privilege of being able to say, the universe is free, tyrants and tyrannies are no more, peace reigns on earth, and it is to the French we owe it. To these advocates of universal brotherhood it was a matter of poignant regret and bitter shame that the British government refused to throw in its lot with the organizers of the late massacres in the prisons by taking up arms in defense of the French Revolution. To their profuse apologies on this subject the French Jacobins, under Airho de Seychelles, replied, Believe, generous Englishmen, that in preserving this demeanor, of neutrality, you are nonetheless joining with us in the work of universal liberty. Leave us to make a few more steps along the course where you were our precursors, and let us rejoice beforehand in a common hope for the epoch, not far distant, when the interests of Europe and of the human race will invite both nations to hold out the hand of friendship to each other. The hope was echoed by the Society for Constitutional Reform of London, which now wrote expressing the belief that, after the example given by the French, revolutions would become easy, and that before long the French would be writing to congratulate the National Convention of England. The Jacobins of Paris were ready to promise more than this, they intended, they declared, to seal an eternal alliance with their English brothers, who had only to let them know that their liberty was being attacked for the victorious phalanxes of their French allies to cross the Straits of Dover and fly to their defence. Thus was the suggestion calmly entertained by our exponents of universal brotherhood in 1792, that the revolutionary horde of cutthroats and assassins, who had just carried out the massacres of September, should land on our shores and produce the same horrors in England, as had taken place in France. The anti-patriotism of a section of so-called, democracy in England, has never been better exemplified. To men of this mentality it matters not whether it is with democracy or autocracy abroad that they strike a league of friendship, the enemies of their country can always make sure of their support. Until the Germans of today England never had bitterer enemies than the Jacobins of France. Hatred of England, of the English character, of English ideas of liberty, was one of the first tenets of their political creed. In this they differed fundamentally from the earlier revolutionaries, the men who had framed the constitution of 1791, and also from the Girondins, who no doubt entertained a sincere admiration for England, the Jacobins, into whose hands the power was now passing, were, with the exception of Danton, the sworn foes not only of the English government but of English democracy, they repeatedly declared that they despised Mr. Fox as much as they hated Mr. Pitt. The leading spirit of the anti-English campaign was undoubtedly Robespierre, always the opponent of internationalism, hence his ground of accusation later on against the Prussian Klutz, he never concealed his distrust of foreign sympathizers with the French Revolution, four months earlier, supported by Calude Herboy, he had deprecated the correspondence of the Jacobins with their brothers in Manchester, and again in September it was he who opposed the election of Dr. Priestley to the convention. For the present, however, the French Jacobins were quite ready to make use of their English allies, hypocritical professions of friendship cost nothing, and met with very substantial rewards. Already in April, as we have seen, a subscription had been raised in aid of the French Revolution, and it seems probable that further sums were forthcoming during the course of the summer. In August Dr. Moore heard with incredulity of the great number of English guineas now in circulation in Paris, which, as usual, were attributed to the court of Great Britain, whose object was to excite sedition in France. If these mysterious guineas were not, as Dr. Moore believed, mythical, they were obviously those of Orleans or of the English Jacobins. At any rate, it is to the latter source that the English gold which arrived in Paris three weeks later can, with certainty, be traced, for the address of congratulation on the massacres of September, 
forwarded by Lord Semple and three other members in the name of the London Constitutional Society, was accompanied by a present of 1,000 pairs of shoes for the army and 1,000 pounds in money. Besides this an immense quantity of arms was provided by the English Jacobins from the manufactories of Birmingham and Sheffield, for which a further public subscription was raised by means of an appeal in the newspapers to all those who favoured the cause of liberty in France against the infamous conspiracy of crowned brigands. It is, moreover, in the late summer of 1792 that, for the first time, we find Englishmen personally cooperating in the revolutionary movement in Paris. Amongst these was Thomas Paine, who left the shores of England amidst the jeers and hisses of the crowd, I believe had we remained much longer, a fellow traveller remarks, they would have pelted him with stones from the beach. In spite of the fact that his face reminded Madame Roland of a blackberry powdered with flour, for Payne was constantly inebriated, the exponent of the rights of man was received with enthusiasm by the Girondins, and through their influence succeeded in becoming a member of the convention. Besides Payne a band of English Jacobins arrived in Paris at the same time. Dr. Priestley, Mr. Verger's rights to Lord Auckland on September 4, is also there, and is looked upon as the great adviser of the present ministers, being consulted by them on all occasions. There are also eight or ten other English and Scotch who work with the Jacobins, and in great measure conduct their present manoeuvres. I understand these gentlemen at present are employed in writing a justification of democracy and an invective against monarchy in the abstract, which is to be printed at Paris, and distributed through England and Ireland. The names of some of them are Watson Wilson of Manchester, Oswald a Scotsman, Stone an Englishman, and Mackintosh who wrote against Burke. All these men, then, were in Paris during the massacres of September, and not one uttered a word of protest. Oswald, indeed, in his tirades to the Jacobins, with whom he sought to ingratiate himself by insulting his king and country, showed himself more violent than them all, vied with Marat in his invectives against royal tigers, and rivaled Heber in his foul accusations against the imprisoned Queen of France. This being so, are we to regard it as impossible that Englishmen were present at the massacres in the prisons? One would willingly remove this stain from our national character, but if we are to know the exact truth about the intrigues of the French Revolution, one cannot pass over the accusation in silence. The evidence on which it rests is, firstly, that of Jordan, president of the Section des Quatre Nations, who was sent to the Abbaye during the massacre and stated that he saw two Englishmen plying the assassins with drink, and secondly, Pridom, who says that Englishmen were seen at La Force amongst the commanders of the butchery, and that these Englishmen were the guests of the Duc d'Orléans, they dined with him immediately after the death of the Princess de Lamballe. These, then, were the Englishmen dining at the Palais Royal when the princess's head was carried under the windows. The only one of the number whose name is known was a certain Mr. Lindsay, who described the scene with horror to Mr. Burgess after his return to England two days later, and whom it is impossible to suspect of collusion with such atrocities. But the contemporary Playfair distinctly states that the guests of the Duc d'Orléans at this particular dinner were English Democrats. This supplies the key to the whole mystery. Since we know that the English Democrats then in Paris were ardently in sympathy with all the excesses of the revolution, that their colleagues in England wrote letters of congratulation, and that Lord Stanhope, one of their most influential members, applauded the massacres, why should they not have personally encouraged the assassins? From applauding at a distance to assisting on the spot is surely but a step. Moreover, their presence at the Duc d'Orléans dinner coincides exactly with Mongeois' assertion that certain English revolutionaries, notably Lord Stanhope, were in league with the Orleanists. We know that precisely at this moment Lord Stanhope was in correspondence with Richard Sayer, or Sayer, the English agent in Paris, who had been deputed by the Revolutionary Societies of England to supply arms to the Jacobins of France, and the exceedingly compromising letters addressed by Sayer to Lord Stanhope, ingenuously published by the latter's admiring biographers, show clearly that the English revolutionaries in Paris, of whom Lord Stanhope was the leading spirit, were engaged in some guilty intrigue with the enemies of their country. The massacres of September cannot, therefore, be regarded as solely the work of the French, they were devised and organized by the Spaniard, Marat, in cooperation with Frenchmen, executed by Frenchmen, Italians, and Germans, applauded by the Prussian Klutz, applauded and actively assisted by Englishmen. Again, as on the 10th of August, it is therefore to the doctrines that inspired them, not to the temperament of the nation amongst which they occurred, that the horrors which took place must be attributed. Prussia? Whilst anarchists, 
Orleanists, Girondins, and English Jacobins were fighting for the mastery in Paris, Prussia played her part in the final ruin of the French monarchy. The cannonade of Valmy, it cannot be described as a battle, that on the 20th of September checked the advance of the Allied armies on the capital, is one of the enigmas of history which will never perhaps be entirely solved. Pro-revolutionary historians have endeavored to explain the retreat of the best trained troops of Europe, before the undisciplined revolutionary army by the state of the weather, the muddy condition of the ground, by the fact that dysentery had broken out amongst the Prussians, or merely by the irresistible valor inspired by democratic doctrines. These legends have now been almost universally accepted as fact, but in the minds of well-informed contemporaries no doubt exists that some further explanation must be sought for the check to the allied armies at Valmy and their subsequent retreat. Thus Lord Auckland, writing to Sir Morton Eden from The Hague on October 19, 1792, hazards the opinion that a complete victory, for the Allies, might have been on the 20th, at Valmy, if the royal personage who was present had not prevented the engagement for unknown reasons. A note adds that this royal personage was the King of Prussia, but Fersen declares that the King of Prussia wished to attack, and that it was only the cowardice and indecision of the Duke of Brunswick that prevented the engagement. Tubo, then with the army on the frontier, takes the same view. Matilda Hawkins, whose memoirs were published in 1824, relates that her friend, the Comte de Jarnac, who was with the army at the time of the Duke of Brunswick's unaccountable retreat from Paris, told her that the Duke himself said, why I retreated will never be known to my death. According to prevailing opinion at the time the retreat after Valmy was effected by negotiation, and three different theories were advanced as to the authors of these negotiations. Firstly, then, Bewley and Puget assert that Louis XVI, assured by Manuel, Pétion, and Cassaint that the presence of the Allied armies was the main cause of irritation against him, allowed himself to be persuaded to write and ask the King of Prussia to withdraw, in return for which the three deputies promised him his life. Secondly, the mountain, represented by Camille de Milan, declared that the retreat was brought about by an understanding between the Girondins and the Prussians, and when we remember the eulogies lavished by Cara on the Duke of Brunswick in July, and find that Cara was the man chosen by Pétion to go with Sillery on the 24th of September to Dumier's camp at La Lune and confer with Monstein, the representative of the King of Prussia, this seems not improbable. Thirdly, Dallanville, the author of the memoir Secrets, states that it was Danton who negotiated the defeat of the Prussians at Valmy, and their subsequent retreat by the simple method of bribery. This was effected through the agency of Dumier, at this moment Danton's ally, to whom he wrote immediately after Valmy, instructing him to drive back the Prussians without attempting to destroy them, since the Prussians were not the natural enemies of France. The manner in which Danton procured the necessary sums is thus described by Dallanville B. O. Varenne, who left Paris after the massacres of September, had reached the army on the 11th and had opened negotiations, of which the sums promised, but not yet paid, alone delayed the conclusion. Two or three millions, the fruit of the pillage of the 10th of August, were all that the Commune of Paris possessed, and it was not enough. Why do you not rob the guard Merbler, i.e. the depository where the crown jewels were kept? cries Panis, and this thing was done on the 16th of September by the orders of Tallien and Danton, which produced, in different species, a sum of thirty millions. The first overtures had facilitated the escape of Dumier from the position in which he would have been irrevocably lost, others prevented him from being driven from his position during the cannonade of Valmy, and from the 22nd to the 23rd negotiations were, as we have said, actively carried out. This evidence is exactly confirmed by General Mycord, who was with the armies at the time. The deputies of the Gironde, Mycord declares, were not in the secret of the negotiations with the Prussians, and it is to the Orleanist schemes of Danton that these are to be attributed. It is only with audacity and yet more audacity that we can save ourselves, said the Minister of Justice. Danton was, no doubt, a very audacious man, but when he pronounced these words it is certain that he knew of the secret negotiation, since he himself was directing it with his colleague Le Brun. Already he was assured that the Prussians would not get to Paris, he knew that it was only a matter of satisfying them, and fulfilling the engagements entered into by Dumier. Hence this resolution to remain in the capital, to pillage the guard Merbler, to massacre the prisoners and plunder the victims. So it might be said, without exaggeration, that the horrible system of blood and terror, was a consequence of what had taken place in Champagne between the Prussians and the leaders of the revolution, who were no other than the leaders of the Orleanist faction. The theft of the crown jewels was not attributed to Danton by royalists alone. 
when on the night of the 16th to the 17th of September the guard Merbler was broken into and the crown jewels were removed, no one seriously believed that the coup could be attributed to ordinary burglars, and by Girondins as well as royalists it was declared to be the work of the Commune. Why, indeed, should it not be so? The Commune, as everyone knew, had ordered the pillage that took place after the 10th of August, and it was again the Commune that had taken possession of the greater part of the spoils wrested from the victims of the massacres. When several large burglaries have been effected by the same gang in the same district, it is only reasonable to attribute a further one to the same agency. Madame Roland had no hesitation in designating Danton as the chief burglar of the Crown Jewels and Fabre de Glantine as his assistant, although, as usual in the case of crimes ordained by the revolutionary leaders, the obscure instruments who carried out the deed were arrested and put to death. At any rate, whatever were the means employed, it is clear that some pressure was brought to bear upon the Prussians in order to ensure their retreat. The unaccountable part of the affair lies not so much in the fact that their triumphant advance was checked by a reverse at Valmy, but that this one reverse should have turned the tide of the whole war, yet should not have resulted in the rout of the Allied armies. For if the revolutionary troops were strong enough to arrest finally the enemy's advance, why did they not follow up their victory at Valmy with greater vigor? This problem was so apparent to everyone at the time that it was admitted even by de Milan, the ally of Danton, though, at the instigation of Robespierre, he cleverly turned it into an accusation against the Girondins. Is it not inconceivable to everyone and unheard of in history, wrote Camille de Milan in his Histoire des Brissotins, as I said to Dumier himself when he appeared at the convention, that a general who with 17,000 men had held back an army of 92,000 men, after Dumier, Ajax Bernonville, and Kellerman had announced that the plains of Champagne would be the tomb of the King of Prussia's army, like that of Attila, and that not one man would escape should not have cut off the retreat of this army when it was reduced to nearly half by dysentery, when its march was impeded by nearly 20,000 sick, and that, on the other hand, the victorious army had increased, to more than 100,000 men. All the soldiers of the vanguard of our army will tell you that when the rearguard of the Prussians called a halt, we called a halt, when they went to the right, we marched to the left, in a word, Dumier led back the King of Prussia rather than he pursued him, and there was not a soldier in the army, who was not convinced that there had been an arrangement between the Prussians and the convention by the medium of Dumier. Such, then, in the words of the revolutionary leaders themselves, was the irresistible elan of the victorious revolutionary army. Whether, therefore, the retreat of the Prussians was due to the Girondins or Orleanists, whether Cara was acting in the interests of the Duke of Brunswick or the Duke d'Orléans, whether Danton had an understanding with the Girondins and afterwards discerned them, or whether he was carrying on an intrigue with Dumier as the agent of the Commune, and later on betrayed him, representing him through de Milan as the accomplice of the Gironde. It is evident that something happened at Valmy which has never been explained to this day. Valmy and its sequel remain an insoluble mystery. Only, in the light of our present knowledge of Prussian diplomacy, it seems not impossible that some profounder policy may have underlain the action of both Frederick William and the Duke of Brunswick than has yet been attributed to them. At any rate, whether they realized it at the time or not, the defeat of Valmy was a superb victory for Prussia. For to march on to Paris at this crisis must have been to re-establish the Bourbons on the throne, and to leave the way open to a renewal of the Franco-Austrian alliance, by leaving France to tear herself to pieces Frederick William worthily carried out the traditions of the great Frederick, and assured the future supremacy of Prussia. Valmy had but paved the way for Sadow and Sedan. Goethe, looking on at the famous fusillade, is said to have uttered these prophetic words, from this place and from this day forth begins a new era in the world's history, and you can all say that you were present at its birth. A new era in truth, an era wherein the civilization of old France should be utterly destroyed and the great barbaric German Empire should rise upon the ruins. The Golden Age had ended, the Age of Blood and Iron was to begin. The Reign of Terror. The 2nd of September, said Calut Herboy, is the great article of the Credo of Our Liberty. In other words, the massacres in the prisons were the prelude to the Reign of Terror, the first manifestation of that organized system of destruction which for ten months held sway over France. This is why, in relating the history of the terror, it is necessary to begin at September 1792, in order to show the progressive stages which led up to the final climax. For, before this system could be pursued with impunity, the demagogues were obliged to remove three principal obstacles from their path, these were, firstly, the monarchy, 
and consequently the constitution of 1791, secondly, the king, and thirdly, the Girondins. It was the struggle to effect this threefold purpose that for a year arrested the course of the terror, which otherwise must have followed directly on the September massacres. We shall now see how one by one these obstacles were overthrown, and how, in each case, the schemes of the demagogues triumphed over the will of the people. The Proclamation of the Republic The idea no doubt prevails in this country that France became a republic because the French nation was finally convinced of the advantages offered by a republican form of government. Nothing is further from the truth. France, as the Cahiers had shown, was solidly monarchical, and the protests following on the 20th of June gave evidence that this sentiment still prevailed throughout the country. The Republicans, said Danton in September 1792, are an infinitesimal minority. The rest of France is attached to the monarchy. If, however, any doubt existed on this point, if the demagogues had any reason to suppose that the opinion of the people had changed since the formation of the K.A.s, the only course in accordance with the principles of democracy would have been to make a fresh appeal to the nation. For, however impossible it may be to consult the people on the details of legislation, it is obviously a farce to describe a state as democratic in which the form of government is not the choice of the nation as a whole. The only legitimate method by which the form of government can be changed is, therefore, a referendum to the people. Nothing of this kind was done in France. When, on the list of September, the convention that now superseded the Legislative Assembly held its first sitting, none of the deputies, amongst whom all the leading revolutionaries, Girondins, Dantonists, and Robespierreists alike, were included, had made any attempt to discover the real wishes of their constituents on the question of abolishing the monarchy, whilst in the provinces the idea of a republic had not even been considered. At one moment it seemed as if the new assembly were endowed with some appreciation of the principles of democracy, for it began by passing this admirable resolution, the National Convention declares that there can be no constitution unless it is accepted by the people. Yet after this, at the very same sitting, it proceeded with ludicrous in consequence to discuss the fundamental point of the constitution, the question of a republic, without any reference whatever to the wishes of the people. It was Couton, the ally of Robespierre, who had first proposed the abolition of the monarchy, and the proposal was now seconded by Calud Herboy amidst universal applause. True, one obscure member named Cunet rose to observe, it is not we who are the judges of the monarchy, it is the people. We have only the mission to form a definite government, and the people will choose between the old one which included the monarchy, and the new one which we shall present to them. But the protest of Cunet was overruled by Gregoire who declared that no one could ever propose to preserve in France the disastrous race of kings. We know too well that all dynasties have only been devouring races living on human flesh. I ask that by a solemn law you should ordain the abolition of monarchy. In vain Bazir interposed with the remonstrance that the assembly should not allow itself to be carried away by a moment of enthusiasm, that the question of abolishing the monarchy should at least be discussed by the assembly. What need is there for discussion? answered Gregoire when everyone is agreed. Kings are in the moral order of things what monsters are in the physical order. The history of kings is the martyrology of nations. Since we are all equally penetrated by this truth, what need is there for discussion? And, in response to this dignified discourse, the Assembly, without further debate, passed the resolution, the National Convention decrees that monarchy is abolished in France. Thus, in flagrant violation of the first principle of democracy, rule by the will of the people, in direct contradiction to the resolution passed by the convention itself at that same sitting, the republic was proclaimed by an infinitesimal minority of political adventurers. For if these men who took upon themselves to overthrow the ancient government of France had been honest in their intentions, if they had themselves been convinced of the advantages of a republic over a monarchy, their action might, to a certain extent, be condoned by their enthusiasm. But it was not so. These men were not Republican by conviction, for, as we have already seen, they were actuated by various policies far removed from Republicanism. Still, at the inauguration of the convention, it seems that the same schemes for a change of dynasty survived, the factions had merely undergone some slight modifications. Now, although at most stages of the revolution we find contemporaries disagreed on the aims of the factions, it is curious to notice the extraordinary resemblance between the explanations given by writers belonging to completely different parties of the motives that inspired the proclamation of the Republic. According to such divergent authorities as Mongeois, Paget, Prudhomme, 
and the two friends of liberty, Cara and his party still inclined to the Duke of Brunswick, Briso and his party to the Duke of York, Sillery, C.A.S., and Laclos to the Duke d'Orléans, Dumayet, Byron, and Valence to the Duke de Chartres, whilst Marat and Danton, now less disposed to support the Duke d'Orléans, began to think of their own elevation and joined forces with Robespierre, in order to establish either a dictatorship under one of their number or a triumvirate composed of all three. Owing to these conflicting policies, none of which could be openly avowed, everyone was obliged to profess republicanism, some voted for the republic for fear Orleans should be king, others in order not to appear Orleanists, all wished to acquire or maintain their popularity. This was what Robespierre meant when he said later on, the republic slipped in furtively between the factions. But once the republic had been proclaimed and the monarchy declared to be finally abolished, it became necessary for the factions to reconstruct their policies, and so three main parties were formed in the convention. These became known as the Gironde, the Plain, and the Mountain. The first of these parties consisted of the deputies of the Gironde who had sat in the Legislative Assembly, Vergniaud, Guardat, Genjorna, Ducos and Fonfried, and also Brissot with his following, which included Bozot, Valais, Isnar, and Condorcet. All these were henceforth described collectively as Girondists or Girondins, and it was they who, as time went on, came to represent the truly Republican party in the convention. The Plain or Marais was composed of several hundred nondescript deputies, non-committal in their views, and afraid to move boldly in any direction. But the real force of the assembly lay in the mountain, that fierce and subversive minority dominated by Danton, Mara, and Robespierre, and including the most violent members of the Jacobin and Cordelier clubs, Camille de Milan, Bio Varenne, Calude Herboy, Fabre de Glantine, Hannes, Sergeant, Legendary, and also the Duc d'Orléans, who, by the usual methods of bribes and cajolery, by dinners lavished on the new members of the Commune, and, in the opinion of many contemporaries, by the payment of 15,000 livres to Marat, succeeded in securing election as a deputy for Paris. Inevitably the Montagnards carried all before them, it was they and not the pedantic Girondins who understood the art of rousing popular passions. Hitherto, as we have seen, even the mob of Paris had needed to be systematically stirred up in order to take part in the revolutionary movement, and this is not surprising, for the issues at stake were outside their comprehension. What mattered to them whether the patriot ministers were recalled or not, whether the king had the right of veto, whether the non-during priests were deported, and so forth. As to the leaders of the legislative assembly, none had appealed to their mentalities, the eloquence of Vernio left them cold, the speeches repeated parrot-like by the so-called deputations from the Faubourgs were unintelligible alike to orators and audience. But when Marat, Danton, and Robespierre assumed the reins of power everything was changed. Marat spoke a language the populace could understand, instead of bewildering their minds with political subtleties he simply ordered them to go out and burn and pillage and destroy. By this means he appealed irresistibly to the craving for excitement which distinguishes the populace in every city, particularly in Paris, whilst his ostentation of poverty imposed for a while on some of the more credulous amongst the people themselves. It has been said that Marat loved the poor, that from the beginning of the revolution he had lived on the barest necessaries of life. This we now know to be untrue, Marat, though of filthy and neglected appearance, lived in the greatest comfort, and was never known to make any personal sacrifices for the poor of Paris. The vicious, the wastrel, the degraded alone inspired his sympathy, honest and law-abiding men of the people, especially those who by their industry had achieved some degree of prosperity, became the objects of his contempt and hatred. Give me three hundred thousand heads, he said, and I will answer for the country being saved. Begin by hanging at their doors the bakers, the grocers, and all the tradesmen. When the people failed to respond to these suggestions, Mara turned and rent them, oh! Babbling people, if you but knew how to act. Or again, eternal idlers, with what epithets would I not overwhelm you if, in the transports of my despair, I knew of any more humiliating than that of Parisians. In this lay the difference between the policies of Robespierre and Mara. Robespierre aimed at democracy, not in the sense of government by the people, but of a state solely composed of the people, he would have liked to turn the whole world into a vast working man's settlement, of which he would be the presiding genius, whilst Mara wanted ochlocracy, a state dominated by that small portion of the people known as the mob, making of the world a huge thieves' kitchen, in which he would play the part of brigand chief. Robespierre, now falling more and more under the influence of Mara, 
began to realize the superiority of Mara's method, he perceived that in times of revolution it is to the subversive minority that a demagogue must look for support, and that to appeal to the reason of the people must ever prove less effectual than to rouse the passions of the mob. Hitherto he had sought to establish his popularity by fulsome adulation of the people's virtues, but from this time onward we find him gradually abandoning the attitude of moderation he had maintained during the preceding year, and reverting to the subversive methods he had employed at the outset of the revolution. In vain against the rich and great, appealing always to cupidity and envy, it was principally amongst the women of the Societe Fraternelle and the female convicts released during the massacres of September that he found his following, and this disheveled band that Danton derisively described as the Dupont's Grave Robespierre filled the tribunes of the convention and the Jacobin Club, drowning the debates in their clamor. Danton, on the other hand, never theorized about democracy. Too lazy to put pen to paper, he is almost the only revolutionary leader who owned no journal and wrote no pamphlets, his speeches, admirably suited to a recruiting platform with their sounding refrains of let us beat the enemy, let us save the country, served merely to electrify the assembly, especially the tribunes, and afford evidence of no definite or coherent political creed. It is, therefore, by his sayings that we know Danton best, words flung out at impetuous moments, recorded by innumerable contemporaries, and bearing so strong a family resemblance that it is impossible not to believe that some at least are authentic. It was thus that, like Mirabeau, he frankly admitted his own corruptibility. Danton, says Pridom, was known as a man who displayed little delicacy in revolution, that is why he was always surrounded by bad characters and swindlers. Here is a remark habitual to him, the revolution should profit those who make it, and if the kings enriched nobles the revolution should enrich patriots. We shall find Danton giving vent to the same sentiments up to the very foot of the scaffold. Danton's own greed for gold led him to believe that the people were to be won by the same means, money he held to be the great lever by which the revolutionary mobs could be moved to action. The fact is, Danton was not a politician, but simply a great agitator, the people to whom he openly referred as the canai must be made to serve the purpose of the demagogues, and he moved amongst them with no show of fraternity like Robespierre or Mara, but, as Garot expressed it, like a grand seigneur of the sans culottery, scattering largesse and thundering words of command. Robespierre's scheme of a socialist state held, therefore, little attraction for Danton, who had no desire to exchange his comfortable flat in Paris and his chateau at Arcis or Org for a cottage in a working man's settlement. But, although divided in their ultimate aims, and also secretly hostile to each other, the members of the triumvirate that headed the mountain were agreed in regarding a period of anarchy as necessary to the realization of their schemes, and were therefore content to work together in order to destroy existing conditions. For this purpose it was necessary to enlist the aid of the mob, that portion of the people, mainly women, who, having nothing to lose by general confusion, were ready in return for adequate remuneration to stamp and shout for each party in turn. Buzot has thus described the aspect of the deputations and audiences collected by Marat and Robespierre at the convention, it seemed as if they had sought in all the slums of Paris and of the large cities for everything that was filthiest, most hideous, and polluted. Dreadful earthen faces, black or copper-colored, surmounted by a thick tuft of greasy hair, with eyes half sunken in their heads, they gave vent with their fetid breath to the coarsest insults and shrill screams of hungry animals. The tribunes were worthy of such legislators, men whose frightful appearance gave evidence of crime and wretchedness, women whose shameless air expressed the foulest debauchery. When all these, with hands, feet, and voices, made their horrible din, one would have imagined oneself in an assembly of devils. Such were the elements that now usurped the power, taking as their watchword the cry that Taine truly calls the resume of the revolutionary spirit, the will of the people makes the law, and we are the people. Henceforth the revolution enters on a new phase, monarchy and aristocracy have both retired from the lists, and the struggle has begun between democracy and ochlocracy, between the people and the populace. And since the demagogues are on the side of the populace, inevitably ochlocracy triumphs, and everywhere, in the tribunes of the convention and of the Jacobin club, in the streets and public places Mara's rabble, though an infinitesimal minority, holds sway over the great mass of the people. The death of the king. It is significant that even at this crisis, when the revolutionary leaders had at last succeeded in obtaining a following amongst the populace, the attempt was not renewed to achieve the death of the king at the hands of the mob. But the new demagogues were too expert crowd exponents not to realize the futility of such a project. 
Madame Roland might imagine that the Faubourgs of Paris could be incited to regicide, Marat, Danton, and Robespierre well knew that if the king were to die they themselves must perform the deed. For in this matter even the populace they had enlisted in their service was not to be depended on. The people, writes a contemporary during the king's trial, even that portion of the people who have so often steeped themselves in blood during the revolution, does not wish to shed that of the king, but there is a party to which it is necessary, and at this moment it dominates Paris, and even the convention. Dr. Moore, mingling at this date with the people of Paris, likewise realized, that the ferocity attributed to them was confined to their so-called representatives. New fears, he writes, have been expressed in the convention of massacres taking place in the streets. If there is really any danger of such an event, the inhabitants of Paris must be the worst of savages, but the only people I see of a savage disposition are certain members of the convention and of the Jacobin Club, and a great majority of those who fill the tribunes at both those assemblies, but the shopkeepers and tradespeople, and I take some pains to be acquainted with their way of thinking, seem to be much the same as I have always known them. I am persuaded that there is no risk of massacres or assassinations but from a set of wretches who are neither shopkeepers nor tradesmen, but idle vagabonds, hired and excited for the purpose. When I hear it asserted from the tribune of the convention, or of the Jacobin society, that the people are impatient for the death of the king, or inclined to murder unfortunate men while they are conducted to prison, and yet can perceive no disposition of that nature among the citizens, I cannot help suspecting that those orators themselves are the people who are impatient for those atrocities, and that they spread the notion that this desire is general among the people on purpose to render it easier to commit them, and to make them more quietly submitted to after they have been committed. In vain the commune marshaled deputations from the revolutionary sections to the bar of the assembly to demand the death of the tyrant, the people in the streets and cafes gave the lie to all such demonstrations. Thereupon Prudhomme, still the king's implacable enemy, angrily apostrophized them Frenchmen, where will all this lead you? Every hour of the day takes away millions of partisans from the republic to give them to royalism. Already in your restaurants hired singers, screech inane but touching laments on the fate of the tyrant. This lament to the tune of Pauvre Jacques begins thus, O oh mon people, que taille je fait. It is being sold in thousands. The hymn of the Marseillais is forgotten for it, I have seen, yes, I have seen the toper let fall a tear into his wine in favor of Louis Coppet. The French Republic is already three, quarters royalized. On the 2nd of January 1793 a royalist play entitled Lamy de Lois was produced amidst a wild outburst of popular enthusiasm. The piece in itself was dull, but the opportunity it offered for applauding allusions to royalty in the person of the king, and for jeering at the leading demagogues travestied on the stage, drew an immense audience, the crowd struggling to obtain admittance was numbered at 30,000 people. In vain the Père Duchesne proclaimed his grand colère against the Mounty Banks, heretofore actors of the king, in vain the younger Robespierre denounced this infamous piece in which they had the audacity to introduce his brother and the excellent citizen Mara, in vain Santerre, surrounded by his staff and later 150 Jacobins, sword and pistol in hand, attempted to put a stop to the performance. The people responded with deafening cries of Lamy de Lois. The peace, the peace, raise the curtain. The voice of Santerre was drowned in shouts of down with the General Moussa. Down with the 2nd of September. We want the peace, the peace or death. The demagogues were obliged to submit, the piece was played not once but again, four times in all, amidst scenes of indescribable enthusiasm. A still stranger scene took place at Bordeaux, where it was not simply a promiscuous crowd of citizens who protested against the designs of the convention, but the chosen flock on whom the leaders depended for their following. By way of propaganda the Jacobin Society of Bordeaux had invited its members to a patriotic play called The Republic of Syracuse, or Monarchy Abolished. The sentiments this piece contained having been heartily approved by the leading members of the club, it was hoped that the public would receive it with equal favor. This is, however, what occurred, the description must be given in the inimitable words of the Patriot of Bordeaux, whose letter was read aloud at the Jacobin Club in Paris, on the day of the performance all the seats were filled at a very early hour. The curtain rises and the theater represents the place of Monsieur Vito, he is told of the complaints that his people make against him, and of the depredations of Madame. Vito. He gets angry, an insurrection makes him gentler. The people wish to become free and give themselves a constitution, a patriot general is placed at the head of the armed forces, Madame. 
Vito tries to seduce him, but in the peace she does not succeed as in our revolution. The constitution made, the constitutional monarch swears and swears again everything they wish, but keeps nothing, at last the people open their eyes a second time, they see that this monarch is deceiving them, they attack the chateau, take monsieur and madame, veto prisoners, and shut them up in a tower. They are brought to trial and the senate of Syracuse sends them both to the guillotine. Here begins the fifth act. The guillotine on the stage excites a movement of stupor throughout the hall. Some said, how can they represent such things? Women fainted. At last, in the midst of the most absolute silence, Monsieur and Madame Vito arrive at the foot of the fatal instrument. At the moment they mount the ladder a cry from the people demands mercy for them, and condemns them to perpetual imprisonment. At the cry of mercy, the hall resounded with applause, so much as public opinion deteriorated in that city. So no longer there does one hear the general beaten or the cry to arms, flat calm reigns. The patriot Terrasson tried to speak at the society in favor of Mara, Robespierre, Danton, and others, who are regarded as sedition mongers, they would not listen to him. The society passed the resolution that it would suspend all correspondence with the Jacobins of Paris, so long as these members remained amongst them. The convention took a terrible revenge on Bordeaux ten months later. It will be asked, if the people did not wish for the death of the king, why did they not save him? Perhaps if they had known their power they might have done so, but, terrorized as they still were by the September massacres, they no doubt imagined the commune to be far more powerful than it really was. They could not know, as we know now, that the following on which the leaders depended for support constituted approximately first one hundredth part of the population of Paris, and that, had the remaining ninety-nine one hundredth been able to coalesce, they could have swept away the demagogues almost without an effort. Convinced of their own helplessness, they showed the same submission to the decrees of the convention concerning the king as they displayed when their own lives were at stake eighteen months later. But, above all, they lacked leaders, men of their own class to defend their interests against those of the middle-class men who composed the convention. A few energetic working men, placing themselves at the head of the Faubourgs, must have carried the day, for at this stage of the revolution the demagogues would not have dared to fire on them, the people so far were not crushed, they were only paralyzed. Meanwhile, had they only realized it, the convention lived in terror of the people. All through the discussions that took place on the fate of the king there runs a haunting fear lest a popular movement should be made in his favor. It was for this reason that Chabot urged the necessity for avoiding a Sunday or Monday for bringing the king to trial, since on those days the people were not at work and would be free to assemble. Robespierre, the better to expedite matters, proposed that the convention should pass sentence of death without according Louis XVI. The formality of a trial, whilst Saint just advocated simple murder. Caesar, he said, was immolated in the open senate without any further formality than twenty-two dagger thrusts. But the Girondins, either from a desire to maintain a reputation for justice, or because they really wished to save the king, insisted on a trial, and the 11th of December was the day fixed for Louis XVI. To appear at the bar of the convention. The debates that took place in the convention must be read in order to realize the utter futility of the charges brought against the king, from Valais's accusation of monopolizing wheat, coffee, and sugar, to the diatribes of Robert, convicted later of cornering large quantities of rum, who declared Louis XVI. To be guilty of more cruelties than Nero, of having butchered more human beings than his life counted hours or moments, of aspiring to the absurd privilege of bathing in the blood of his fellow men. For want of fresh pretexts all the old threadbare grievances were revived, the closing of the assembly on the day of the oath of the tennis court, the orgy of the guards at Versailles on the 1st of October 1789, the flight to Varennes, the massacre of the Cham de Mars on July 17, 1791, when the king was a prisoner at the Tuileries, the refusal to sanction the camp of 20,000 men, and so on. The charge of conspiring with foreign powers, that looms large in the pages of revolutionary historians, play a comparatively small part in the trial, for no proofs whatever were forthcoming. Great hopes had been entertained of finding incriminating documents in the iron cupboard that Roland had discovered at the Tuileries after the 10th of August, where the king had concealed his private papers, but this find proved disappointing, for though it offered to Roland the opportunity for abstracting documents that could have served to establish the innocence of Louis XVI, 
and also certain other documents that might have convicted Roland and his party of offering to sell themselves to the court, it provided not a shred of evidence that the king had been guilty of traitorous intrigues with the enemies of France. When, finally, Louis XVI appeared at the bar of the convention, and the long list of paltry charges, drawn up in the form of an indictment, was read aloud to him, he contented himself with brief and dignified denials, only when they touched on his most vulnerable point, his conduct towards the people, his serenity momentarily deserted him. Thus at the accusation of Bayer, that he had attempted to conspire by going to the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, and distributing arms amongst the poor workmen of the district, his eyes filled with tears as he answered, Ah! Monsieur, I have never known greater happiness than in giving to those who were in need. At this, one of the wretched women amongst Maras following in the tribunes burst into loud sobs, exclaiming, Ah! Men Dieu, how he makes me weep! When, again, he was accused of shedding the people's blood, the one reproach of all that cut him to the heart, his voice vibrated with emotion as he replied, No, monsieur, no, it was not I who shed their blood. The king's appearance in the convention, says Dr. Moore, the dignified resignation of his manner, the admirable promptitude and candor of his answers, made such an evident impression on some of the audience in the galleries that a determined enemy of royalty, who had his eye upon them, declared that he was afraid of hearing the cry of vive la ROI, issue from the tribunes, and added that if the king had remained ten minutes longer in their sight he was convinced it would have happened, for which reason he was vehemently against his being brought to the bar a second time. On the proposal of Pétion the king was allowed to appoint advocates for his defense. No less than a hundred at once offered their services. The king's choice fell on his old friend Molzeb, who at the beginning of his reign had cooperated with him in the work of reform, on Dices, Tronche, and Target. Target, it seems, had not volunteered, and had the cowardice to refuse the task. At this the Poisards were so indignant that they presented themselves at his door with birch rods to scourge him, and the wretched Target, warned of their intention, was obliged to fly, but to Tronche, who accepted they brought flowers and laurels. They would have crowned, too, the head of brave old Molzeb, that venerable white head that, as the penalty of his devotion, was to fall later upon the scaffold, but Molzeb declined the honor, and the fishwives had to content themselves with hanging their garlands on his gate. All these symptoms seriously alarmed the revolutionary leaders, and when on the 26th of December the king appeared at the convention to hear his defense read aloud by de Says, immense precautions were taken to prevent the people from coming to his rescue. The whole route from the temple to the Manege was lined with troops, a mounted bodyguard as well as one on foot surrounded his carriage, six cannons preceded him and six followed behind, whilst strong patrols paraded the streets. The assembling of this guard had been no easy matter, for the men of the people had absolutely declined to take part in the proceedings. It is said, writes a contemporary that evening, that the Faubourg Saint-Antoine and Saint-Marceau, which are the most thickly populated districts of Paris, refused today to form the king's guard whilst he was at the convention, saying that if any harm is to be done to him they will not be accomplices. It was thus found necessary to form a sort of press gang, and officers were sent to tear peaceful citizens from their beds and force them to join the escort. From the outset it was evident that the king's trial was to be a mere travesty of justice. I look for judges, cried his advocate de says, and I see only accusers. Even the revolutionary leaders themselves, secretly recognized the truth of this indictment. The convention, Prudhomme pointed out to Danton, had not the right to try Louis XVI, if the Parliament of England tried Charles I, it is because it was not a convention, the members of the conventional assembly cannot be at the same time accusers, jury, and judges. You are right, answered Danton, nor shall we judge Louis XVI, we shall kill him. This was the plan they now proposed to put into practice, and as soon as the king had retired Duem rose to demand that his condemnation should be discussed without further delay. The evidence brought forward in his defense was thus not even to be considered. At so monstrous an outrage on humanity and justice one man was found brave enough to protest, Langeonise, a Breton, member for Ile et Vilaine, whose courage and eloquence from this moment until the fall of the Gironde provide a striking contrast to the cowardice and treachery of both Girondins and Montagnards. You cannot, Langeonise cried boldly, remain judges, appliers of the law, accusers, juries for the accusation, juries for the judgment, having all expressed your opinions, having done so, some of you, with a scandalous ferocity.
The voice of Landuan eyes was drowned in howls of indignation. At last, after scenes of indescribable confusion, the convention decided that the judgment of the king should be discussed. It seems that the Girondins now really wished to save the king, if only to arrest the increasing despotism of the mountain, but, too cowardly to protest against his condemnation, they bethought themselves of a way out of the dilemma by proposing an appeal to the people through the primary assemblies. The Montagnards, who knew as well as the Girondins that the verdict of the people would be in favor of the king, naturally offered a furious resistance to the plan. The question was first put to the convention by the Girondin Salles on the 27th of December in an admirable speech. Either, he said, the nation wishes that Louis should die or it does not, if it wishes it, you all who wish it also, your expectations will not be disappointed, but if it does not wish it, what right have you to send him to execution contrary to the wish of the nation? This was, of course, absolutely unanswerable from the point of view of true democracy, but presented no difficulty to the deputies of the mountain. Every tortuous argument the heart of sophist could devise was brought forward during the seven days that the discussion lasted, to prove that an appeal to the nation would be in reality undemocratic, a betrayal of the people's trust. Virtue, Robespierre remarked sententiously, was always in a minority on earth. He seemed to have forgotten he had once said that the people were infallible, on this occasion he evidently feared they might prove subject to error. Saint Just, paying an unconscious tribute to the liberty accorded to public opinion by the old regime, asked, the appeal to the people. Would that not be bringing back the monarchy? Nothing could be truer. Under the monarchy the poorest of the king's subjects had enjoyed the right of bringing him petitions, from St. Louis seated beneath his oak to Louis XVI. Receiving the Poissards at Versailles, access had always been granted to the people. But when deputations of poor women gathered around the doors of the convention to plead for the life of Louis XVI, they were turned away, after waiting long hours, without a hearing, whilst deputies who persisted in demanding an appeal to the people were shouted down with angry cries of death to the traitor. In the streets hawkers shouted, here is the list of the royalists and aristocrats who voted for the appeal to the people. For, as usual at a moment of crisis, the revolutionary leaders had recourse to their great expedient, terror. When the king, against whom nothing had been proved, was finally pronounced guilty, and the appeal to the people was defeated by a majority of 424 to 283 votes, the mountain put all the machinery of revolution in motion to secure a final verdict of death. Amongst the men employed for this purpose the agents of the Duc d'Orléans were the most active. The Orléanists, says Montjoie, clearly understood that the people were not for them, they kept the blade unceasingly raised over the heads of the voters, they surrounded them with assassins. The deputies of the Gironde, says Madame Roland, were obliged to go about armed to the teeth in self-defense, brigands brandishing sticks and sabers pursued them as they left the convention, crying out, his life or yours. At eight o'clock on the evening of the 16th of January the debate began that was to decide the great question, what penalty shall be inflicted on Louis? It is impossible, says Mercier, to describe the agitation of that long and convulsive sitting. Lahadi opened the proceedings by asking what majority would be necessary for the death sentence to be pronounced. Thereupon Landuanis demanded that it should consist in two-thirds of the votes, in accordance with the penal code framed by the Constituent Assembly. But Danton, shrewdly foreseeing that this majority would not be forthcoming, proposed that the convention should pass a decree ordaining that a majority of one voice should be sufficient, in other words, the law was to be altered to fit the case. At this land you and eyes rose again in wrath, you say all the time that we are a jury, well, it is the penal code I invoke, it is the form of trial by jury for which I ask. You have rejected all the forms that perhaps justice and certainly humanity demand, the right of challenging the jury and voting in silence. We seem to be deliberating in a free convention, but it is beneath the daggers and the cannons of the factions. And he ended by demanding that three-fourths of the votes should be necessary for condemnation to death. But the convention without further discussion decreed that a majority of one vote should suffice. Then the voting began and continued for twenty-four hours without intermission. One by one the deputies arose, and through the tense silence of the hall the fatal word rang out again and again, death. Some of the more violent, Mara, Freren, Biovaren, added vindictively, within twenty-four hours, several even amongst the Girondins now allowed themselves to be terrorized into voting for immediate death, others pleaded tremblingly for respite. 
It was reserved for Philippe d'Orléans to give the last touch of infamy to this terrible night. When in the semi-darkness of the hall, illumined only by a few feebly burning candles, the bloated face of Egalité appeared in the tribune, the assembly waited breathlessly for the words that were to fall from his lips, solely occupied by my duty, convinced that all those who have violated the sovereignty of the people deserve death, I vote for death. At this cowardly betrayal of his kinsmen even the convention shuddered, a low murmur of indignation ran through the hall, men rose from their seats with gestures of disgust, crying out incontrollably, Oh! Horror! Oh! The monster! The miserable prince had shown his hand at last, had given the lie once and for all to his apologists, who declared him to be the weak and amiable puppet of a faction, even in the eyes of the regicides he now became a thing of loathing, a pariah to be repudiated by each faction in turn. The vote of the Duke d'Orléans was of paramount importance in the final decision, for, according to the official report, when the votes came to be counted up there were found to be 360 for imprisonment, banishment, for death with respite or conditional death, and exactly 361 for immediate and unconditional death, if this were so, then Philippe's had been the casting vote. And by throwing it into the scale of instant death he murdered the king as surely as if he had stabbed him to the heart with his own hand. But so much jugglery went on behind the scenes, and the votes of many deputies were so vaguely worded, that it is impossible to discover the exact figures. According to a prevailing opinion at the time, there was a real majority of five votes for immediate and unconditional death. They murdered him, Arthur Young wrote indignantly, by a majority of five voices, though their law required three-fourths at least for declaring guilt or for pronouncing death, and the majority obtained by the menaces of the assassins paid by Egalité. The consummation of political infamy. The convention itself recoiled in shame before the crime it was about to perpetrate. The silence of terror, says Bewley, reigned during the deliverance of this disastrous judgment, and even long after the president had ceased speaking. It seemed as if the revolutionaries were already plumbing the abyss they had created without being able to discover its depth. The same evening the news was brought to the king's councils that a majority of five votes had been obtained in favor of death. Thereupon Louis XVI instantly demanded that an appeal should be made to the people, and he says, Tronchet, and Molzerbe came to lay the request before the convention. Molzerbe, overwhelmed with grief, was unable to utter more than a few broken sentences, but his colleagues forcibly portrayed the iniquity of pronouncing the death sentence contrary to the penal code by means of a decree passed at this same sitting. Robespierre replied that the king's defenders had no right to attack great measures taken for public safety, and demanded that their appeal should be rejected. This proposal was adopted by the convention. The Girondins, now more than ever alarmed at the tyranny of the mountain, ventured to remonstrate, Guardet asked that the objections of the king's defenders should be considered. Buzot two days later protested against condemnation on so diminutive a majority, and even went so far as to declare that the party which desired the immediate death of the king wished to place the Duc d'Orléans on the throne. Thomas Paine represented the universal affliction the execution of Louis XVI would create in America, where he was regarded by the people as their best friend, the one who had procured them their liberty. In the end the Girondins succeeded in carrying the motion that the question of postponing the sentence should be put to the vote. But by this time the whole assembly was so cowed by the menaces of Orleans and the mountain that the sentence of immediate death was carried by a majority of 380 to 310. The president then pronounced sentence of death to be executed within 24 hours. Molzeb has related that when he went to the temple to break the news to Louis XVI, he found him seated in the semi-darkness, his back turned to the lamp, his elbows resting on a little table, and his face buried in his hands. As the old man entered the king rose and, looking him in the eyes, said solemnly, Monsieur de Molzeb, for two hours I have been trying to discover whether in the course of my reign I have deserved the least reproach from my subjects. Well, I swear to you in all truth as a man about to appear before God that I have always wished for the happiness of my people, that I have never formed a wish opposed to them. Ah, sire, answered Molzeb with tears, I still have hope, the people know the purity of your intentions, they love you and they feel for you. I found myself, on going out from the debate, surrounded by a number of people who assured me that you would not perish, or at least not until they and their friends had perished themselves. Do you know these people? Louis XVI. Interposed hastily, go back to the assembly, try to find some of them, 
tell them that I should never forgive them if a drop of blood were shed for me, I refused to shed it when it might have saved me my throne and my life. And I do not repent, no, monsieur, I do not repent. The cause of this unrepentance is not far to seek. Louis XVI. Realized that his trust in the people had not been misplaced, for it was not by the people he had been condemned, an appeal to the people must inevitably have saved him. He knew, no doubt, the intrigues that had brought about the fatal sentence. To numberless contemporaries it was evident that the influence of the Duc d'Orléans had contributed even more than that of Robespierre towards this end. According to rumors current at the time a certain Marquis de Lepaletia Saint Fargo had intended to vote against the king's death, and to induce twenty-five of his fellow deputies to do the same, but at the last moment he and his companions were persuaded by Orleans to throw their weight into the opposite scale. Whether this was so or not, it provides the only explanation to a mysterious incident that occurred the evening before the king's execution. Lepaletia was dining in a restaurant of the Palais Royal when a man with black hair, dressed in a long grey overcoat, entered. This man was Paris, a member of the king's old bodyguard, all day he had wandered about the city, sabre in hand, seeking the Duc d'Orléans in vain. Now he had found Lepaletia, and, going up to him, he accosted him thus, you voted for the death of the king. Yes, monsieur, I voted according to my conscience. What matters it to you? But Paris, drawing out his sabre from beneath his cloak, cried, wretch, then you shall vote no more and he plunged his weapon into the body of Lepaletia. So little did the citizens who filled the dining room resent the crime that not a murmur arose, and Paris was allowed to leave the restaurant unmolested. Such manifestations of public feeling were naturally disquieting to the regicides, and now more than ever they dreaded that a popular movement might be made in favor of the king. On the following day a formidable guard was again summoned to surround him on his way to the place de la Révolution. According to two Marseillais very hostile to the king, says Monsieur Madeleine, Paris had been literally placed in a state of siege. Meanwhile Philippe Egalité, foreseeing that Louis XVI might succeed in bringing the crowd to his rescue by words spoken from the scaffold, took elaborate precautions against such an eventuality. Dorléan, says Senart, fears that he may speak to the people, he fears that the people may deliver him, for the head of Coppé was necessary to him at any price. There were various rendezvous for the Orleans faction. It was at one of these rendezvous that Santerre swore to Dorléans, glass in hand, that he would make use of a sure method to prevent Coppé from speaking, and thus was formed the plot of the famous roll of drums which occurred at the death of Coppé. When the wet and dreary morning of January 21 dawned, the city was wrapped in the silence of consternation. All the shops were shut, silent patrols, composed of ill-clad men, moved slowly about the streets, where one met only pale, sad, and gloomy faces, executioners and victims alike seemed aghast at the cruel sacrifice that was to be consummated, stupor alone seemed to inhabit Paris. Such was the situation of that famous city, once so brilliant, and the rendezvous for all pleasures. Mercier, who invariably endeavors to throw on the people the blame for all the crimes of the revolution, has represented Paris as presenting a normal, even a gay appearance on this dreadful day, a testimony eagerly seized on by revolutionary historians, but which is contradicted by innumerable contemporaries, even by Proudhon. Fockety, a member of the convention, has thus confirmed the evidence of Bewley, this day was for France, and above all for Paris, a day of bitterness and grief, of fear and mourning, the capital was in anguish. Almost all the shops and houses were closed, whole families were in tears. Consternation was seen on all the faces one met, a great number of the National Guards, on foot since the morning, appeared themselves to be going to execution. No, never will the scenes I witnessed on that day be effaced from my memory. How many were the tears I saw flow? What imprecations I heard against the authors of such a crime? The assembly that day was silent and gloomy, the voters for regicide were pale and shattered, they seemed to have a horror of themselves. As to the poor people of Paris, they could hardly bring themselves to believe that so dreadful a deed could really be accomplished. On the 21st of January, writes the Comtesse de Baume, I saw upon the ramparts people of the lowest classes weeping, showing openly their grief at the outrage that was to take place. There are too many of them in Paris, they said, they will prevent it. The sun pierced through the clouds, shining on this crime. That national sense of shame that will be transmitted from age to age, of which the remorse will become for every Frenchman a personal offence, weighed heavily upon me.
but the Parisians made no effort to prevent the crime. The little band of royalists, under the Baron de Bats, that dashed towards the king's carriage, crying, Join with us, you who would save the king. Met with neither resentment nor response, the immense multitude stood by stupefied and mute, hypnotized, it would seem, by the horror of the whole proceeding, for not a cry broke from them as the dark green coach passed between their ranks towards the great place de la Révolution. Through the windows the outline of the king's face could be dimly seen beneath the shadow of his large hat, bent downwards to his breviary open at the prayers for the dying. He was, perhaps, the most tranquil man in Paris on that grey January morning. God is my comforter, he had said to his confessor, the Abbe Edgeworth, my enemies cannot take his peace from me. Every effort was made by the revolutionary journalists to minimize the king's courage at the supreme moment. Louis, the thermometer du jour declared, had shown courage and assurance only because he did not believe the sentence would really be carried out, that to the very moment of his death he had reckoned on being saved. When he realized, however, his delusion, his serenity deserted him, and he struggled with the executioner's assistants, by whom at last he was forcibly tied to the plank of the guillotine. It was Sanson, the executioner himself who refuted this lie, by coming forward boldly to testify not only to the king's courage but to the cause that inspired it. Citizen, he wrote to the editor of the thermometer, a short absence has prevented me from replying sooner to your article concerning Louis Copet, but here is the exact truth concerning what passed. On alighting from the carriage for the execution he was told that he must take off his coat, he made some difficulty, saying that he could be executed as he was. On being assured that this was impossible he himself helped to take off his coat. He then made the same difficulty when it came to tying his hands, but he offered them himself when the person who was with him, the Abbe Edgeworth, had said to him that it was a last sacrifice. He inquired whether the drums would go on beating, we answered that we did not know, which was the truth. He ascended the scaffold, and tried to advance to the front as if he wished to speak, but it was represented to him that the thing was again impossible, then he allowed himself to be led to the place where he was tied, and where he cried out loudly, People, I die innocent. Then turning towards us he said to us, I am innocent of all that is imputed to me. I desire that my blood may seal the happiness of the French people. Those, citizen, were his last and exact words. The kind of little debate which occurred at the foot of the scaffold turned on his not thinking it necessary that his coat should be taken off and his hands tied. He also made the proposal to cut off his own hair. And in order to render homage to truth, he bore all this with a sang-froid and firmness which astonished us all, and I remain convinced that he had derived this firmness from the principles of religion, of which no one could seem more persuaded and imbued than he. You can be sure, citizen, but here is the truth in its fullest light, I have the honor to be your fellow citizen, Sanson. Not content with maligning the king, the revolutionaries as usual maligned the people. After the execution, says Mercier again, they laughed and chattered, they walked home arm in arm as if returning from a feast, the theaters remained open as usual throughout the evening. True, hideous scenes of mirth took place on the place de la Révolution, Joy shone out exultingly from the face of Orleans, watching the execution from his cabriolet, around the scaffold brigands danced together, shouting vive la République. A citizen ascending the guillotine plunged his arm into the blood of the king and dashed it in the faces of the crowd. Then once again, like a tiger that has tasted blood, the mob went mad and broke out likewise into dancing, wild, blood-bespattered figures whirled round in each other's arms, all over the great place de la Révolution the horse roar arose, Vive la République. Vive la liberté. Vive le galite. But after this one moment of crowd hysteria it seems that even the mob came to its senses, and Paris once more relapsed into stupor. The people did not go home rejoicing, on the contrary, says Lacretel, they returned gloomy and absorbed, the multitude itself, whether from pity or from resentment at its curiosity being disappointed, loaded Santerre with imprecations for having drowned the last words of the king. All through the day that followed, for the execution took place at half-past ten in the morning, Paris was silent, almost deserted, people shut themselves up with their families to weep. The women, Pradom reluctantly admits, were sad, which contributed not a little to that gloomy air which Paris presented throughout this day. As to the theatres, it is true that they were open that evening, but also they were empty, and the managers found themselves obliged to return the money paid for seats. In the streets, 
say the two friends of liberty people dared not look each other in the face. The day after the execution they had not recovered from this overwhelming dejection. Had France indeed, like Louis XVI, himself, some premonition of the immense misfortunes this day was to bring her. I see the people, he had said to Clary on the night of his condemnation, given over to anarchy, becoming the victim of all the factions, I see crimes following one upon another and long dissensions rending France. For the people he grieved, knowing well in what hands he was leaving them. Here, in the white light of eternity, we see him at his best, his blunders atoned for by his great sincerity. To the cause of despots he had proved a traitor, to aristocracy he had shown scant sympathy, but to the people he had been true. In him they lost not their best but their only friend. Carlyle has written of the great heart of Danton, Danton, whose last words, like those of nearly every one of the demagogues, were to revile the people, for the great heart of Louis XVI. He has nothing but contempt. Yet, of all the men who played their part in the revolution, there was only one who, realizing that no hope for his life remained, could say from the depths of his heart, as he stood on the threshold of the other world, the platform of the guillotine, I desire that my blood may seal the happiness of the French. That one true patriot, that one man ready to die for France and for the people, was the king. England and the death of the king. In England the news of the king's death was received by all classes with horror. I cannot describe to you, Lord Grenville wrote to Lord Auckland on the 24th of January, the universal indignation it has excited here. The audience at one of the playhouses stopping the play, and ordering the curtain to be dropped as soon as the news was announced to them. The Prince of Wales, hearing of the vote for death given by his former boon companion Philippe d'Orléans, pulled down the portrait of the Duke, a masterpiece by Sir Joshua Reynolds from the wall in Carlton House, and tore it into shreds with his own hands. But the lovers of true liberty mourned the most profoundly. It was because the murder of Louis XVI was the greatest crime ever committed against democracy that Arthur Young, that ardent Democrat, denounced it in unmeasured terms, this great abomination, ought to generate, for the real felicity of the human race, a tighter rein in the jaws of that monster. The metaphysical, philosophical, atheistical Jacobin Republican, abhorred forever for holding out to all the sovereigns of the earth that the only prince who ever voluntarily placed bounds to his own power, died for it on the scaffold, and ruined his people while he destroyed himself. He gave ear to those who told him of abuses, he wished to ease his people, he fought popularity. He would not shed the blood of traitors, conspirators, and rebels. This damned event, deep written in the characters of hell, has thrown a stupor over mankind. In Parliament Pitt spoke of the murder of the king as that dreadful outrage against every principle of religion, of justice, and of humanity, which has created one general sentiment of indignation and abhorrence in every part of this island, and most undoubtedly has produced the same effect in every civilized country. It is the foulest and most atrocious deed which the history of the world has yet had occasion to attest. And here, for the honor of our country, it is impossible to pass over in silence the accusation brought against Pitt in this connection by an English historian. Information, wrote the late Lord Acton, was brought to Pitt from a source that could be trusted, that Danton would save him, the king, for forty thousand pounds. When he made up his mind to give the money, Danton replied that it was too late. Pitt explained to the French diplomatist, Maret, afterwards Prime Minister, his motive for hesitation. The execution of the King of France would raise such a storm in England that the Whigs would be submerged. In other words, Pitt was willing for the sake of party interests to act as murderer to Louis XVI. And on what does Lord Acton found this monstrous charge? On the assertion of Maret, a revolutionary emissary to England. Now, even if Pitt had entertained so dastardly a plan, is it conceivable that he would have confided it to such a man as Maret? The only grain of truth in the whole story seems to be that Pitt did refuse to bribe Danton, but as he was very well aware of Danton's true character, was not Bertrand de Molville in London at the time and able to enlighten him on the financial transactions he had conducted on behalf of the king with that thorough patriot. It is hardly surprising that Pitt should have hesitated to put £40,000 into the pocket of a man who would in all probability make no return. The Revolutionary Tribunal was probably much nearer the mark when it declared that Pitt had assisted Molzeb financially in defending the king, a course the great statesman may well have held to be more reputable, and at the same time more expedient than bribing Danton. If any members of the British Parliament are to be accused of complicity in the murder of Louis XVI, it is certainly the Whigs, Pitt, 
whom the revolutionaries regarded as their archenemy, would only have increased their animosity towards the king by interceding for him, but Fox, Sheridan, Lord Lansdowne, Lord Lauderdale, and Lord Stanhope were all on the best of terms with the members of the convention, and might surely have exerted their influence to avert the crime. With the exception of Lord Stanhope, who, we know, definitely refused to intercede for Louis XVI, giving as his reason that new discoveries of his treachery, perfidy, and duplicity had just been made, we may do these men the justice to believe that if they refrained from intervention it was because, like Pitt, they knew it would be hopeless. A rupture between France and England, had now become inevitable, for it was evident, that the anarchists of Paris, not content with devastating their own country, proposed to carry out the same process in every other country which they could succeed in entering. On the 19th of November they had issued the following proclamation. And AMP, 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 NDSP, the National Convention declares in the name of the French nation that she will accord fraternity and assistance to all peoples who wish to recover their liberty, and charges the executive power to give the necessary orders to the generals in order to render assistance to these peoples, and to defend the citizens who have been vexed or who might be so for the cause of liberty. This decree, which the convention ordered to be translated into all languages, was therefore not an appeal merely to the peoples of the countries with which France was then at war, but a call to universal insurrection. A few weeks later the revolutionary leaders explained their intentions towards the countries they had already entered in a further proclamation. On the 15th of December, Combone, in the name of the financial, military, and diplomatic committees, rose to define the line of conduct the generals of the revolutionary armies were to pursue, it is necessary that we should declare ourselves a revolutionary power in the countries that we enter. Your committees consider that, after expelling the tyrants and their satellites, the generals on entering every commune must publish a proclamation, showing the people that we bring them happiness, that they must immediately suppress tithes and feudal rights, and all forms of servitude. But you will have accomplished nothing if you confine yourselves only to these destructions. Aristocracy governs everywhere, therefore all existing authorities must be destroyed. Nothing of the old regime must survive when revolutionary power shows itself. This, however, was not to be effected by the will of the people in the invaded countries, who indeed displayed no great enthusiasm for the benefits of French liberty. As in France, deputations and declarations, purporting to express the wishes of the people, were engineered by Jacobin agents, and in no way represented public opinion. So, although it was announced that Belgium desired to embrace revolutionary doctrines and to be united to the French Republic, the immense majority of the Belgian population remained attached to its old beliefs, and regarded the anarchic schemes of the invaders with horror. In Germany the apostles of democracy met with a like resistance. Mayence boldly protested, at Frankfurt the citizens refused to plant a tree of liberty at the command of Costine. But the revolutionary leaders were not to be baffled by these obstacles, if the people did not accept liberty, equality, and fraternity when offered them with honeyed words, these inestimable blessings must be forced on them at the point of the sword. It was in consequence of this recalcitrance that Combone in the same speech went on to say, but you will have accomplished nothing if you do not loudly declare the severity of your principles against whosoever desires only a half-liberty. You wish that the people against whom you carry arms should be free. If they reconcile themselves with the privileged castes you must not suffer this traffic with tyrants. You must therefore say to the people who wish to preserve the privileged castes you are our enemies, and then treat them as such, since they desire neither liberty nor equality. At the end of this speech, delivered amidst unanimous applause, the convention issued a further decree to each country entered by their armies, declaring that from this moment the French Republic proclaims the suppression of all your magistrates, civil and military, of all the authorities that have governed you, and proclaims in this country the abolition of all the taxes you endure, under whatsoever form they exist, etc. In a word, every country entered by the French was to be thrown into chaos. Beside this proclamation it must be admitted that the manifesto of Brunswick appears almost benign. The Emperor of Austria and the King of Prussia had definitely declared therein, that they had no intention of meddling with the domestic government of France, the revolutionaries announced their determination to destroy the existing form of government whether the people desired it or not. The manifesto of Brunswick, moreover, had repudiated all ideas of annexation, the revolutionaries made no attempt to conceal the fact that the conversion of the invaded countries to democratic doctrines was to be but the prelude to incorporation with the French Republic. The moment the retreat of the foreign armies began, after Valmy, 
the pretext of carrying on war for the defense of France was abandoned, and the Republic embarked on its career of aggrandizement. Belgium, the Rhine provinces, Savoy, and Nice were all successively annexed without any pretext being offered for these acts of brigandage. Writers who enthuse over the glorious successes of French arms from the Battle of Jemap onwards would do well to ask themselves by what right the French Republic pursued the invading armies beyond the frontier for the purpose of annexing territory. It will be answered Louis XIV. Had done the same. True, but was not the spirit of the revolution until 1792 diametrically opposed to the policy of Louis XIV. Had not the French democracy itself declared that war was never justified except in self-defense. Only two and a half years earlier, in May 1790, at the Constituent Assembly, a League of Perpetual Peace had been decreed amidst immense enthusiasm. Let all nations be free like ourselves, a deputy had cried, and there will be no more wars. And on the proposal of Robespierre the Assembly formally declared, the French nation renounces the idea of undertaking any war with a view of conquest and will never employ its forces against the liberty of any people. Yet it was the very men who framed it, Robespierre and his allies, who now repudiated this resolution and advocated pure aggression, and thus the League of Peace proved but the prelude to the greatest war of conquest the civilized world had ever seen. Had not Mirabeau foretold this when, in response to the enthusiasts of 1790, he had declared free people to be more eager for war, and democracies more the slaves of their passions than the most absolute autocracies. It was not, then, as is frequently and falsely stated, that Pitt sought a pretext for joining the coalition of kings against the French Republic, it was the wanton aggression of the Republic culminating in the seizure of the mouth of the skeleton of Antwerp, that in the hands of a dangerous enemy must inevitably prove, as Napoleon perceived, a pistol held at the head of England, it was the example of inhumanity and injustice offered to Europe, by the murder of Louis XVI. Above all it was the declaration of world anarchy published by the convention, threatening not only England but the whole of civilization, that led Pitt to conclude his speech on the death of Louis XVI. By proposing preparations for war, there can be no consideration more deserving the attention of this house than to crush and destroy principles which are so dangerous and destructive of every blessing this country enjoys under its free and excellent constitution. We owe our present happiness and prosperity, which has never been equaled in the annals of mankind, to a mixture of monarchical government. We feel and know we are happy under that form of government. We consider it as our first duty to maintain and reverence the British Constitution. He went on to present the contrast between England and that country, France, exposed to all the tremendous consequences of that ungovernable, that intolerable and destroying spirit, which carries ruin and desolation wherever it goes. Sirs, this infection can have no existence in this happy land, unless it is imported, unless it is studiously and industriously brought into this country. Pitt well knew the efforts that were being made to spread this infection, the insidious influences that emanated from Parliament itself. England has always had her Illuminati, who, holding loyalty and patriotism to be narrow-minded prejudices incompatible with universal benevolence, have ever been ready to plead the cause of their country's enemies, whether these enemies masqueraded under the name of democracy as in 1793, or rallied round the standard of autocracy as in 1800. Now at this most critical moment this band of anti-patriots came forward in defense of the French Jacobins, Fox, Sheridan, Lord Lansdowne, Lord Lauderdale, Lord Stanhope, poured forth floods of oratory to prove that public opinion on the revolutionary leaders had been influenced by the absurdities of madmen, the monstrous propositions of the heated imaginations of individuals, to show by tortuous sophistries that black was really white, that if, indeed, crimes had been committed. The best way to express disapproval would be by shaking hands with the criminals. They themselves, honored by the friendship of such men as Brissot, whom to their indignation Burke at this same sitting described as the most virtuous of all pickpockets, could answer for the pacific disposition of the French revolutionaries, their ardent desire to retain the good opinion of England. Yet less than three weeks earlier Brissot himself had referred at the convention to the comedy played in the House of Commons by the party of the opposition. And it was likewise Brissot who, in the following May, justified Pitt for refusing to form an alliance with the French Republic. But any illusions concerning the conciliatory sentiments of the French revolutionary leaders were abruptly dispelled by a declaration of war on England issued by the convention two days after this debate took place. As long as possible Pitt, 
had striven to bring the Jacobins of France to reason, even at the last moment he had made a further attempt at conciliation by agreeing to a conference between Lord Auckland, the British ambassador at The Hague, and Dumayet, commander-in-chief of the French armies in the Netherlands. But on the very day arranged for the conference to take place the convention precipitated matters by declaring war and thus incurred the full responsibility for the twenty-two years' conflict that followed. Yet even now the English admirers of the Jacobins were for conciliation, even when the overture of Pitt had been thus insolently rejected they pleaded that England should humiliate herself and sue for peace, a peace, Pitt declared, that would be precarious and disgraceful. What sort of a peace must there be in which there is no security? Peace is desirable only in so far as it is secure. War with the French Republic was finally voted by 270 votes to 44. These, then, were the causes that led up to the inevitable rupture between France and England. To accuse Pitt of wishing to destroy French liberty is, therefore, a monstrous calumny, for in France liberty had completely ceased to exist. Already the blade was suspended over the heads of the Whigs' supposed allies, the Girondins, and the country was rapidly passing under the most frightful tyranny the civilized world has ever seen, the reign of Robespierre. It was against this atrocious system, it was against anarchy and bloodshed, against cruelty and oppression, that England took up arms. So, by the master hand of Pitt, the ship of state was steered to safety, and England, true to her traditions, entered the lists in the cause of liberty and justice. The fall of the Gironde. The Girondins had little realized that in voting for the death of the king they had signed their own death warrant, that by lending themselves to this monstrous injustice they had helped to frame the system that was to bring about their downfall. If they had only had the courage of their convictions, and persisted in their resolution that an appeal should be made to the people, they would have had public opinion almost unanimously on their side, and could have defied the threats of the mountain. Their contemptible weakness not only lowered them in the eyes of the multitude, but increased the audacity of their adversaries. Ever since the beginning of the convention angry murmurs against the Gironde had emanated continually from the mountain, and as the months went by grew in volume, the hall of the assembly, always tumultuous, became at moments a pandemonium. Of this historians give no idea, but it must be realized in order to follow the true course of the revolutionary movement. For if we picture the convention as it is habitually represented to us under the guise of a serious senate sitting in debate on great political questions, and led by statesmen of commanding personalities inspired with pure zeal for the country's welfare, it is perfectly impossible to understand the nature of the conflict that now arose, and that culminated in the successive slaughter of each faction. We must turn, therefore, to the accounts of contemporaries in order to visualize the fearful scenes of confusion that took place in the assembly, and the part played by the so-called giants of the convention. Even the toned-down official reports of the debates afford us glimpses of the strangest incidents, members making simultaneous rushes at the tribune, frantically disputing who should have the right to speak, 60 to 80 deputies advancing in a body on the president's desk, the president ringing his bell to obtain silence, breaking his bell in desperation, breaking three bells in succession, putting on his hat to close the sitting, deputies drawing swords or brandishing pistols threatening to blow out their brains, to stab themselves to the heart, roars from Danton, legendary, David, of vile intriguer. Monster? Murderer? Imbecile? Pig? Robespierre shrieking above the tumult, kill me or let me be heard, Mara rushing about the hall like a maniac, crying, let the patriots speak. Turning to the right and shouting, be silent, brigand. To the left, be silent, conspirator, or, again, Furious petitioners arriving at the bar of the assembly, all talking at once, and all at cross-purposes, the tribunes filled with brawlers and viragos hired by the opposing factions, shaking sticks and fists at the deputies, spitting on their heads, howling invectives. What was the reason for these continued dissensions? If, as the convention declared, everyone wanted a republic, if, as they had asserted in the past, the king was the sole obstacle to the regeneration of France, why should the overthrow of monarchy and king have proved the signal for a further outbreak of revolution more violent than any that had preceded it? Why, as the Girondon Genjon sensibly inquired, should the opposing faction, that is to say, the mountain, continue to declaim against the national convention and provoke insurrections? What do they want? What is their object? What strange despotism threatens us? And what kind of government do they propose to give to France? English readers, indoctrinated by Carlyle, will answer, the Girondins were now reactionaries, they wished to arrest the tide of progress, 
Their schemes of social reform did not go far enough to meet the real needs of the people. For, according to Carlyle, all manner of aristocracies being now abolished, the conflict that arose was between the Girondon formula of a respectable republic for the middle classes and the liberty, equality, and fraternity of the mountain, by which the hunger, nakedness, and nightmare oppression lying heavy on 25 million hearts would be relieved. In these words Carlyle presents an imaginary situation. It is probably true that by 1793 the Girondins had become genuine republicans, henceforth we find no trace of Orleanist, Prussian, or English intrigue amongst them, it is also true that they desired an orderly republic, but this was to be no more in favor of the middle classes than of the great mass of the people. The mountain, on the other hand, as represented by Marat, Robespierre and Saint Just, no doubt dreamt of a socialist state for the people only, but their immediate aim was still anarchy, by which hunger and nakedness must be immensely aggravated. For Robespierre and Marat were surgeons, not physicians, their only remedy for all social ills was amputation, they did not wish to relieve present distress or to put down injustice by legislation, but only to annihilate all existing conditions, and to exterminate all classes of the community except the people over whom they hoped to rule supreme. It was therefore the Gironde, not the mountain, that now came to the relief of hunger and nakedness, it was Roland who pointed out the real causes of the famine and proposed measures for preventing it, whilst Robespierre contented himself with vague theorizings and ignored offers of supplies. Meanwhile Marat continued to urge the people on to pillage, a method which greatly aggravated the situation by terrifying the shopkeepers and peasants into concealing provisions. It seems, indeed, not improbable that the mountain pursued the same system in 1793 as the Orleanists in 1789, that of engineering famine in order to rouse the anger of the people against their political antagonists. Thus a contemporary states that, at a sitting of the Comité de Neuf on September 2, 1793, it was decided by Jean Bon Saint André, Drouet, Cambone, and Robespierre, that an insurrection must be excited by means of the difficulty of supplies, and that the municipality should direct accusations of monopoly against the party of the Girondins, monarchists, and Brissotins. It was this accusation of monopoly that in the hands of the mountain served as a weapon against each rival faction in turn. Such, then, were the men whom Carlyle represents as the protectors of the hungry and naked. The truth is that the people counted for very little in the great war between the mountain and the Gironde, it was not, as Kropotkin, following in the footsteps of Carlyle, falsely represents, such questions as feudal dues, the maximum price of bread, or communal lands that formed the subjects for heated debates at the convention, we have only to consult the Moniteur to find that the discussions that took place on these questions occupy a very small amount of space and never became the occasion for tumultuous scenes. The great accusations leveled by one faction at the other related in no way to the needs of the people, but mainly to the form of government each wished to establish, the Gironde accusing the mountain of wishing to establish a dictatorship under one of the triumvirate, Marat, Danton, or Robespierre, the mountain declaring that the Gironde aimed at a federative republic, at the same time each hurled at the other the reproach of Orleanism. Meanwhile the personal animosity existing between the members of the two factions, which found expression in recriminations of the most puerile description, made all hope of conciliation vain. Whilst the politicians wrangled, the people bore their sufferings with admirable patience. Now for the first time at the baker's doors were formed those long processions known as queues that grew in length as the year advanced, and were to continue for two years without intermission. Paris accepted the situation with its usual insouciance. The French, who have always made merry over everything, even over their misery and their greatest misfortunes, says Bewley, made merry over these gatherings at the baker's doors, where they seemed rather to be asking for arms than for goods of which they paid the price. I have seen women spend whole nights at these wretched doors for the sake of having an ounce or two of bad bread which dogs would not care for. Well, the Parisians laughed over these sad gatherings, they called them queues. Since one was in want of everything one went in the queue for everything, in the bread queue, the meat queue, the soap queue, the candle queue, there was nothing for which there was not a queue. Naturally, under these circumstances, when Marat proposed that the people should take the law into their own hands and pillage the shops, he endeared himself still further to the hearts of the tumultuous elements amongst the populace. The capitalists, the stock jobbers, the monopolizers, the tradesmen, the ex-nobles, he declared in his journal de la République française, were to blame for the scarcity of provisions, and nothing but the total destruction of that cursed breed could restore tranquillity to the state. 
Meanwhile let the nation, weary of these revolting disorders, take upon itself to purge the soil of liberty of this criminal race. The pillage of a few shops, at the doors of which they hanged a few of the monopolizers, would soon put an end to these malpractices. The call to plunder was received with enthusiasm, and in the morning of the 25th of February a troop of women marched, to the Seine and, after boarding the vessels that contained cargoes of soap, helped themselves liberally to all they required at a price fixed by themselves, that is to say, for almost nothing. Since no notice was taken of these proceedings, a far larger crowd collected at dawn of the following day and set forth on a marauding expedition to the shops. From no less than 1,200 grocers the people carried off everything on which they could lay their hands, oil, sugar, candles, coffee, brandy, at first without paying, then, overcome with remorse, at the price they themselves thought proper. In this they displayed a greater sense of morality than their leaders, who doubtless hoped that their enemies the bourgeois, would be plundered without indemnity, moreover, the crowd refrained from hanging any of the tradesmen at their shop doors as Marat had proposed. From the anarchists' point of view the rising had, therefore, proved a failure. Marat, when denounced at the convention for provoking these disorders, retorted in his usual manner by calling his accusers pigs or imbeciles who should be shut up in asylums, and he could well afford to defy them, for he had the mob now wholeheartedly at his back. The short-sighted Girondins, illusioned by the fact that the majority of the convention was with them, underestimated the force of this coalition. They could not realize that men who appeared in the eyes of all sane contemporaries so contemptible as Marat, so feebly vindictive as Robespierre, so addicted to empty noise as Danton, could end by carrying everything before them. They overlooked the fact that, as Danton himself afterwards expressed it, in times of revolution authority remains with the greatest scoundrels, that is to say, with the most unscrupulous, and just as in the past it was the Orleanists who had held in their hands the machinery of revolution, of which the Girondins had made use, it was now the anarchists who alone knew how to frame that new engine of destruction, the Second Revolutionary Tribunal, the Tribunal of the Terror. The First Revolutionary Tribunal, created on August 17, 1792, had proved a failure, the populace were not yet ripe for wholesale executions, the spectacle of the guillotine had disgusted the humane portion of the people, and disappointed the sanguinary. The massacres of September had therefore been preferred as a method of extermination, and on the 29th of November 1792 the tribunal was suppressed. But now that the anarchists could make sure of support from the populace, and the restraining influence of the Girondins had been reduced to nothing, Danton resolved on a further venture. This time the Girondins were not to be spared, on the contrary, it was they who were to provide the principal victims of the new tribunal. As usual, the responsibility for this measure was to be laid at the door of the people, the same calumnies, the same futile pretexts that had done duty at the massacres of September were again employed. On the 8th of March Danton and Lacroix, who had returned from a mission to the army in Belgium, appeared at the convention with an alarming report on the military situation. The troops had been almost totally rooted, treachery on the part of their officers could alone explain the state of affairs, the remedy lay in raising fresh forces, but before marching on the enemy the patriots must exterminate traitors at home. That, as in September, no connection whatever existed between so-called traitors in Paris and the armies abroad is of course obvious, but Danton, like Mirabeau, excelled in rendering the flimsiest pretexts plausible, and in concealing sanguinary designs beneath a flood of high-sounding oratory. The great speeches of Danton that have gone down to posterity as trumpet calls to patriotism, were mostly delivered at a moment when he was meditating some fresh plan for slaughtering his fellow countrymen. Thus, just as audacity and yet more audacity had been the signal for the massacres of September, another famous phrase heralded the inauguration of the Revolutionary Tribunal. What matters my reputation? Let France be free and my name forever dishonored. Que la France soit libre et que mon nom soit flétri à jamais. Dot stirring words truly in the ears of posterity, less stirring in those of contemporaries to whom such exclamations had by long use become familiar. The demagogy, says Mercier, had created for itself a language to deceive and seduce the multitude. I have heard it shouted in my ear, let the French perish as long as liberty triumphs. I have heard another cry out at a section, yes, I could take my head by the hair, I could cut it off and give it to the despot, I could say to him, tyrant, this is the action of a free man. This plimity of extravagance was composed for the populace, it was understood and it succeeded. 
The famous exclamation of Danton was a phrase of this order, and, in the sense in which it is usually accepted, meaningless. What connection can be found between the reputation of Danton, and the success of French arms in Belgium? Why should his name be dishonored by France becoming free? But when we understand the real intention that lay behind the words, we find them pregnant with meaning. Was not Danton's reputation to be forever tarnished, his name forever dishonored, by the creation of that sanguinary tribunal before which he himself was to be summoned only a year later? Was he not to cry out between his prison bars in an agony of remorse, it was on this day I instituted the revolutionary tribunal, but I ask pardon for it from God and man, it was not in order that it should become the scourge of humanity, it was in order to prevent a renewal of the massacres of September. Always, to the end, the same calumny on the people. The people at the time the revolutionary tribunal was inaugurated showed no symptoms whatever of wishing to massacre anybody, had they not refused to carry out the sanguinary suggestions of Mara only a fortnight earlier. Danton was well aware of this, he well knew that the thirst for blood existed not amongst the people, but amongst the leaders of the mountain, the members of the commune. Indeed, with his usual audacity of speech, he frankly acknowledged his own bloodthirsty intentions. The famous trumpet call loses something of its splendor when quoted with its less lofty sequel, What Matters My Reputation? Let France be free and my name forever dishonored. I have consented to be called a drinker of blood. Well, let us drink the blood of the enemies of humanity. Later in the evening, when the light in the hall of the convention was growing dim, Danton sprang again into the tribune, and his great voice rolled out through the semi-darkness, it is important to take judicial measures to punish the counter-revolutionaries, since it is on their account that this tribunal is to be substituted for the supreme tribunal of the people's vengeance. The enemies of liberty lift audacious heads. In seeing the honest citizen at his fireside, the artisan in his workshop, they have the stupidity to think themselves in a majority. Well, snatch them yourselves from popular vengeance, humanity commands you. Suddenly, whilst the thunderous tones of Danton still quivered in the air, another voice was heard, one word, one only, but filled with terrible import, rang out through the stillness of the spellbound assembly, September. It was again Landuinize, the one brave man who had dared to defend the king against the injustice of the convention, who now arose in defense of the people against the calumnies of the great demagogue. The shaft had found its mark, for a moment Danton faltered, became confused, then, quickly recovering himself, summoned more audacity to his aid, piled calumny on calumny, since someone has dared, he shouted, to recall those bloody days over which every good citizen has groaned, I will say, I myself, that if a tribunal had then existed, the people who have often been so cruelly reproached for those days would not have stained them with blood. Let us profit by the mistakes of our predecessors. Let us be terrible to prevent the people from being terrible. Never was hypocrisy more flagrant. Who had accused the people of responsibility for the September days but Danton and his colleagues of the Commune? By every other party, by Girondins and Royalists alike, the people had been absolved from all complicity, not a single reproach had been uttered against any but the real authors of the crime. The brazen effrontery of Danton won the day, the revolutionary tribunal, was decreed in spite of the protests of Landuinize and the Girondins, and on the 6th of April held its first sitting at the Palais de Justice. The court was composed of five judges, ten jurymen, twelve had been ordained, but were not forthcoming, and the public accuser, whose name was to strike a deeper terror into the hearts of the Parisians than even that of Robespierre, Fiquier Tinville. On the opening day of the dread tribunal, Fiquier alone seems to have entered with zest into the proceedings, the populace, whose ferocity it had been declared impossible to restrain, behaved with lamentable weakness. When the first victim, a gentleman of Poitou named De Morlans, was summarily condemned to death for emigration, the immense majority of the audience, particularly the women, says Monsieur Lenotre in his admirable description of the scene, could not imagine that a man who had done no harm to anyone should be condemned to death, and, as the fatal sentence was repeated by each judge in turn, the crowd burst out into weeping, silently at first, then with much noise, and, their emotion communicating itself to the judges and jury, the whole court was shaken by a storm of sobbing, shoulders heaved, handkerchiefs were pressed to eyes and lips, men turned away their faces to hide their tears. 
Yet so potent was the spell cast over all minds by the authors of these tragic happenings, so skillfully had they impressed upon the multitude the necessity for severity towards the enemies of the country, that no one seems to have thought of stopping the proceedings, and all resigned themselves to what followed as to the inevitable. Day after day further victims were sent to the guillotine, an ex-brigadier general named Blanchelard, Gabriel de Guiney, a naval lieutenant, a young cabman called Mangat, who proclaimed himself a royalist, Bouche, a travelling dentist, who said that the convention were brigands, sick, la convention ito it de brigand, and continued to call out vive Louis the Seventeenth. O. F. La République. After his condemnation, an aged soldier who, under the influence of drink, had said that France was too large for a republic, a poor old cook called Catherine Clear, who had cried out vive la ROI. In the street at midnight, and had added in the hearing of passers-by that all that rabble who dictated laws to decent people should be massacred. Truly a formidable band of conspirators. That it was for such as these the revolutionary tribunal had been instituted no one could seriously imagine, moreover, the leaders of the mountain now showed their hand by publicly designating who were the real enemies of the country it was necessary to destroy. At the same moment that the revolutionary tribunal began its sittings, Camille Desmoulins published his terrible indictment of the Girondins under the title of Histoire des Brissotins, ou fragment de l'histoire secrète de la révolution sur la faction de l'Aeonet le Comité anglo prussien et les six premiers mois de la République. Revolutionary historians, to whom the facts revealed in this pamphlet are exceedingly unpalatable, have endeavoured to prove that Camille did not intend to be taken seriously, that he had allowed himself to be carried away by his whimsical imagination, that he was overcome with contrition when he discovered that taunts he had merely launched in sarcasm served as real grounds of accusation against his political antagonists. But there is not a shred of evidence to confirm this convenient theory. Camille de Milan, original only in his style, was always the echo of a stronger mind. Once it was Mirabeau who had served as his inspiration, now it was Robespierre and Danton, later it was to be Danton only. In this Histoire des Brissotins the influence of Robespierre is plainly visible, and indeed, in his speech against the Brissotins only a few days later, Robespierre followed precisely the same line of argument, as his disciple Camille. To suppose that these accusations were suggested to Robespierre by Camille's pamphlet would be absurd, not to the feather-headed Camille can we attribute the relentless logic, the ingenious chain of evidence, by which the Brissotins are convicted of complicity in the past with three of the great revolutionary intrigues, the Orleanist conspiracy, the intrigue with Prussia, the intrigue with the Jacobins of England. In these illuminating pages, perhaps the most brilliant Desmoulins ever wrote, the workings of the first two revolutions are mercilessly unveiled, the Orleanist influence behind the so-called popular movement on the 12th of July 1789, the collusion of Mirabeau with the Duc d'Orléans at the March on Versailles, the accusations brought against the King and Queen for holding an Austrian committee by men who were themselves members of an Anglo-Prussian committee, the visits of Pétion to London in order to enlist the aid of his English allies, the support given to the Brissotins by the Whigs, the proposal of Cara to place the Duke of Brunswick on the throne of France, the persistent attempts to form an alliance with Prussia, the gold received from Frederick William, the negotiations with the Prussians at the camp of La Lune that resulted in the retreat of the invading armies after Valmy, no royalist has ever shown up the revolution so completely. What wonder that revolutionary historians prefer to dismiss the revelations of this enfant terrible as an absurdity. It was not till much later that Camille realized that, in giving away the secrets of the first two revolutions, he had given away his own share in the Orleanist intrigue, nor did he dream that a year later Robespierre, through the mouth of Saint Just, would bring against Danton and himself precisely the same accusations of Orleanism that he had brought against the Girondins. At present he thought only of destroying the rival faction. This work will send them to the guillotine. I will answer for it. He said to Pridom, giving him a copy of the pamphlet. That may be, answered Pridom calmly, so much the worse for you. Your turn will come. Bah! said Camille, we have the people with us. He had forgotten, as every demagogue in turn forgot throughout the revolution, that, in the words of Mirabeau, it is but a step from the capital to the Tarpeian Rock. Today the populace of Robespierre was with him, tomorrow they would be with Robespierre only, and he might scream to them in vain from the tumbrel to save him. To Robespierre the pamphlet of Desmoulins served a double purpose, for it helped to rid him of both the factions he detested, the Girondins and the Duc d'Orléans, with his few remaining supporters. With his usual ingenuity he used one faction to destroy another, 
and we cannot doubt that it was owing to his influence that the Girondins on the 6th of April succeeded in obtaining the banishment of Philippe Egalité, the Marquis de Sillery, and Chaudelot de Laclos, in spite of the protests of Marat. Three days later the whole Orleans family were sent to Marseille and imprisoned. Thus was the principal bone of contention removed from Paris, and Robespierre could concentrate all his energies on overthrowing the Girondins. On the 10th of April he boldly demanded that they should all be summoned before the Revolutionary Tribunal, at the same time Marat published an address, inciting the people to save the country by getting rid of all traitors and all conspirators. The Girondins retaliated by accusing Marat of provoking disorders, and of attempting to destroy the convention, and so great was the indignation of the great majority of the assembly at Marat's incendiary proclamation, that they actually succeeded in obtaining a summons against him to appear before the Revolutionary Tribunal. But the movement was doomed to failure, Marat had on his side all the turbulent elements of Paris, all the machinery of insurrection, the jury, obedient to the dictates of Fiquier, declared Marat innocent, and the friend of the people, smothered in wreaths and roses, was borne triumphantly from the Palais de Justice on the shoulders of the crowd. Of all the grotesque scenes of the revolution this was perhaps the strangest, the malignant dwarf wrapped in a ragged coat of faded green, surmounted by an ermine collar yellow with age and dingy from long contact with his neck, the filthy handkerchief that usually bound his head for once discarded, and in its place a crown of laurels slipping down over the black and greasy hair, lending a still greener tint to the sickly pallor of his countenance. And the smile of Mara, that was enough to strike a chill to the stoutest heart. Dr. Moore has described the sensation of horror that overcame him in the convention at the sight of Mara attempting pleasantry, now he must have appeared more hideous still as, with withered cheeks creased into smiles, with mouth distended, he bent forward, holding out his arms to the people as if to press them to his heart. The devotees presented an appearance worthy of the idol they carried, all the Dupont's gras of Robespierre were there, nodding disheveled heads in response to his greetings, throwing Venus kisses, Sancalot, drunk with joy cutthroats of September shouting, Vive Mara! Long live the friend of the people! This time popular dementia had gone too far, and the result of the triumph of Mara was to produce a wave of reaction. When the friend of the people presented himself at his section he met with so hostile a reception, that he was obliged to beat a hasty retreat. Nearly every evening crowds marched through the streets shouting, Down with the anarchists! Long live the nation! Long live the law! Good citizens, who had kept away from their sections on account of the anarchic schemes discussed there, now returned, to throw their weight into the scale of law and order, a deputation from three sections arrived at the convention to denounce the brigands who have dared to raise the standard of revolt, and who under the perfidious mask of patriotism wish to kill liberty. The speech was received with applause from a large majority of the deputies, and on the proposal of Bayer, who had not yet thrown in his lot with the mountain, the convention decreed that an extraordinary committee should be formed, composed of twelve members, to inquire into the measures adopted by the Council of the Commune, and the sections of Paris, and also into the operations of the Comité de Salo Public and its accessory, the Comité de Sûreté Générale. These two sanguinary committees, the great committees of the terror, had only recently become a power. The former, which had originated in 1792 as the Comité de Défense Générale, took the further title et de Salo Public, under which name alone it was henceforth known, on the 6th of April 1793, the same day that the Revolutionary Tribunal began its sittings, whilst the latter, although subordinate to the Comité de Salo Public, had existed since 1789 as a Comité d'Information, assuming the name of Comité de Sûreté Générale in May 1792. Hitherto the Comité de Salo Public had included men of all parties, Danton, C.S., Vergniaud, Guardat, Genjona, Pétion, and others, but the restraint imposed on its operations by the Girondins exasperated Danton against the faction he had saved from the massacres of September, and he resolved on their destruction. Moreover, since seven out of the twelve members elected to the new Commission des Dues were Girondins, and the rest neutrals, it became evident that their inquiries into the workings of the two committees would act as a further check on the schemes of the anarchists. For six months the Girondins had now held up the course of the terror which, but for them, would doubtless have formed the sequel to the September massacres. Therefore the Girondins must not be simply overthrown, but put out of existence. It was this that in the eyes of the anarchists necessitated the rising of the 31st of May. That a massacre of the whole faction was now contemplated by the Commune cannot be doubted. Dutard, the secret agent of the minister Garot, records that this moment is terrible, and much resembles that which preceded the 2nd of September. 
And indeed, on the 23rd of May, a further deputation from the section of La Fronite came to the convention to reveal the fact that at a meeting of the Council of the Commune, to which several of their members had succeeded in gaining admittance, it had been proposed that 32 deputies of the Gironde should be made to disappear from the face of the globe, or Septemberized. This, according to a deputy from Brittany to whom the plan had been confided, was to be followed by a further massacre of 8,000 people. Thereupon the Commission des Dues ordered the arrest of Heber, the deputy attorney of the Commune, and author of the Bloodthirsty Journal, the Père Duchesne, also of his two colleagues, Varlet and Dobsant. The same evening Heber and Dobsant were imprisoned at the Abbey. The Commune retaliated with a deputation from sixteen sections of Paris demanding the release of the oppressed patriots, meanwhile the women of the Société Fraternelle rushed through the streets armed with red flags, urging the people to march on the Abbey and deliver Heber, an appeal to which the people declined to respond. The Hall of the Convention at the Tuileries, which it had occupied since the 10th of May, became again the scene of indescribable confusion, deputations poured in continuously, the petitioners, unable to find room in the places reserved for them, overflowed into the seats of the deputies, many of whom, overcome with fatigue, had retired for the night. Then, amidst the howls of the crowd, Aero de Seychelles proposed the liberation of Heber and his colleagues, and the suppression of the Commission des Dues. A few deputies, joined by the petitioners, voting as if they were the legal representatives whose places they occupied, succeeded in carrying the motion. But the next day the convention, restored to its normal conditions, reinstated the commission des dues by a majority of 259 votes. You have decreed the counter-revolution, cried Kalud Herboy, I demand that the Statue of Liberty should be veiled. This decision of the convention gave the signal for battle, and immediately the commune proceeded to put the revolutionary machine in motion, no easy matter, for Paris in general was singularly calm, and two days were necessary to prepare the rising. This is not the place to describe in detail the movement known as the Revolution of the 31st of May, which was in reality simply a duel between the two opposing factions, and as such belongs to the history of the convention, not to the story of the great popular outbreaks of the revolution. No other great day of tumult was so completely artificial. When on the morning of the 31st Paris awoke to the sound of the toxin, armed forces summoned from the sections assembled mechanically, women gathered on their doorsteps to see the insurrection pass, but no one knew what all the stir was about. Throughout the day the convention was surrounded with troops, who, for the most part, had no idea why they were there and whom they were protecting. Meanwhile deputations from the sections streamed into the hall, some to demand the suppression of the Commission des Dues and the arrest of the Girondins, others to protest in their favour. Amongst the latter was the section of the Butte des Moulins, and in retaliation for its spirited action the Commune dispatched messengers wearing municipal scarves to Saint-Antoine and saint Marceau to rouse the inhabitants with the news that members of this section had formed a centre of counter-revolution at the Palais Royal, and were wearing the white cockade of royalty. The men of the Faubourgs who had been under arms for some hours, waiting for orders, marched off obediently with their cannon, and on arrival at the Palais Royal found indeed a battalion of the Butte des Moulins encamped there with detachments from other sections, sent to their support, for what purpose no one seemed to know. The folly of the whole proceeding now occurred to the men of the Faubourgs, who, after placing their cannon in position and ranging themselves in battle order, decided that before beginning to fire on their fellow citizens it would be as well to discover whether there was any real cause to gare between them. Accordingly a deputation was sent to verify the accusations of the agitators, and, as might be expected, the whole alarm was discovered to be needless, no white cockades were to be seen, the tricolour was flaunted everywhere, on hats and in the form of banners. Then amidst cries of long live the Republic. The gates were thrown open, and the opposing battalions fell into each other's arms, swearing eternal friendship. This sort of thing was always apt to occur when the people were left to themselves to settle matters, and no agitators were at hand to stir them up to violence. On this occasion Santerre, who excelled in the art of exciting revolutionary troops, was absent from Paris, and Henriot, who had been illegally made commander-general by the Commune, was at the head of the forces that surrounded the convention. As an insurrection, therefore, the 31st of May had proved a failure just as the affair Réveillon, the first march on Versailles, and the 20th of June had proved failures for want of popular support. Always throughout the revolution the same abortive movement before each outbreak, the same misfire preceding the explosion. 
At the convention the Commune had succeeded in again obtaining the suppression of the Commission des Dues, but had been unable to secure the arrest of the Girondins. So a further insurrection must be attempted, and all the following day was occupied in preparation. In the evening Marat appeared at the Commune and, after giving the order to the Council to begin the movement, proceeded himself to ring the toxin. The same night the anarchists struck their first decisive blow at the party of the Gironde by the arrest of Madame Roland, who, during the absence of her husband, was seized by emissaries of the Commune and led to prison at the Abbey. The next morning, June 2nd, all Paris was again under arms, the toxin rang out, an armed force of 80,000 men assembled, but amongst these 80,000, says the deputy Mayan, 75,000 did not know why they had been made to take up arms, nor, owing to the skillful organization of the Commune, was it possible for them to discover. For Henriot, well aware that the honest citizens of Paris would not cooperate in the real purpose of the day, the destruction of the Girondins, had been careful to place the troops formed by the sections at a distance from the chateau, some in the place Louis XV. Beyond the swing bridge, which was closed between them and the garden, others in the carousel separated by a wooden barrier from the court of the Tuileries. Meanwhile his picked force of four to five thousand insurgents, including a number of German mercenaries belonging to the Legion of Rosenthal under orders to march on La Vendée, whose total ignorance of the French language rendered them docile instruments of the Commune, formed a cordon immediately around the chateau to which all the avenues were occupied by his officers or agents, who had received orders to suffer no communication between the hall, of the convention, and the court or garden. By this means the troops of the sections were powerless to intervene, whilst the great mass of the people that had as usual assembled to look on was kept in complete ignorance of what was passing. On the part of the people the 2nd of June was thus the same absolutely blind movement as the abortive rising that had preceded it two days earlier. If only the Girondins had stood their ground on this critical day it is probable that the victory would have remained with them, but now that their own fate was at stake they displayed the same pusillanimity they had shown at the trial of the king. Instead of bringing their eloquence to bear on the situation, the leading members of the Gironde, including Briso and Vergniaud, dared not venture into the convention, but sought refuge at the house of Mayan nearby. Mayan himself, and also Barbaru and Iznar, remained at their post in the assembly, but it was left to Languinais, who was not a Girondon, to act as the principal defender of the faction with which during these days he associated himself as the champion of liberty. In the name of the people the courageous Breton now denounced the efforts of the factions to create disorders. You calumniate Paris. You insult the people, cried the mountain. No, answered Languinais, I do not accuse Paris, Paris is good-hearted, Paris is oppressed by a few scoundrels. Legendary the butcher, rushing upon Languinais, attempted to drag him from the tribune, but, quelled by the sangfroid of his opponent, retreated discomfited, and only returned to the assault when reinforced by Drouet of Varennes' fame, the younger Robespierre, and Julian. A hand-to-hand -hand struggle ensued, and Languinais remained master of the situation. The craven Girondins, hearing of this momentary victory, attempted to reach the hall of the convention and rally around Languinais, but it was too late. A fresh deputation of the commune arrived on the scene to demand their arrest, and departed shouting, to arms. Let us save the country, a battle cry echoed with fury by the tribunes. Meanwhile Henriette's troops had closed around the chateau and the mob had taken possession of the halls, corridors, and staircases, the women followers of Mara and Robespierre, constituting themselves doorkeepers, forcibly prevented the exit of deputies. At this Danton, who never believed in allowing the canai, particularly the female canai, to take command of the situation, grew indignant, and when at last the news reached the assembly that armed sentinels had been placed at the doors of the hall, it was on the proposal of Danton's ally, Lacroix, that the convention dispatched an usher to Henriot demanding that the armed forces should be withdrawn from the chateau. Henriot replied briefly, tell your B, President that he and his assembly can be D, D, dis R ton F. President K. Jeremy F. De Louis et de son assemblée, and that if it does not deliver up the twenty-two to me within an hour I will blast it with cannon. Bear then proposed that the convention should make a display of independence by going out to face the army of insurgents, and thereupon the whole assembly, with their haut de Seychelles at its head, descended the great staircase by which Louis XVI had left the Tuileries on the 10th of August, and filed out into the courtyard where Henriot awaited them at the head of his men. The half-drunken commander again demanded that the twenty-two should be surrendered. Erho refused, 
and the deputies surrounding him, inspired with sudden courage, cried out, they want victims. Let them kill us all. Then Henriot, grasping his saber, turned to his troops and shouted, Cannonaires, to your guns. But no one obeyed the order to fire. The men remained immovable, Aero and a fellow deputy, who went boldly towards them saw that their eyes and attitude gave evidence of no evil design. The truth is that the multitude was opposed to the insurgents. One of the sections of Paris actually pointed its cannon on the troops of Henriot at the same moment that Henriot's cannon were pointed on the members of the convention. It was therefore once again the people who ranged themselves on the side of law and order, and Henriot, disconcerted by their attitude, was unable to carry out his sanguinary designs. The troops, drawn up in the garden on the other side of the chateau, whither the assembly now made its way, seemed equally averse to bloodshed, and contented themselves with crying out, Vive la Montagne! Vive la Convention! And from time to time, Vive Marat! At this moment Marat himself, followed by the crowd of little ragged boys that his grotesque appearance frequently attracted, appeared on the scene, shrieking imperiously to Erho, in the name of the people I charge you to return to your post, which you have basely deserted. And he added significantly, let the faithful deputies return to their posts. In other words, let the sheep be divided from the goats and the members of the mountain retire into safety, whilst their opponents remain outside to be butchered. Ero and his colleagues had evidently thwarted the designs of Marat by joining themselves to the Girondins who had been singled out as victims, but now, merged in the crowd of deputies, could not be distinguished by the insurgents. Such, however, was the authority the wretched dwarf had acquired that, obedient to the word of command, the Montagnards turned towards the Tuileries, leaving the Girondins to their fate, but the Girondins, seeing the snare, retreated likewise, and the whole assembly, followed by Marat, re-entered the hall of the convention and resumed the sitting. Coutone, the friend of Robespierre, then proposed a decree against the twenty-two and the members of the Commission des Dues, but the parade round the courts and garden of the Tuileries had evidently convinced the leaders that violent measures would not meet with popular support, for it was no longer the imprisonment of the Girondins their opponents demanded, but simply their suspension, after which they were to be left in their own houses under supervision. A surprisingly mild conclusion to three days insurrection. The list of the proscribed deputies was then read aloud, and meanwhile Marat repeatedly intervened, adding certain names and ordering others to be removed without even consulting the convention. It was then, says Mayan, that we understood all the power of Marat, well for them if they had realized it earlier, and stood together as one man to resist it. Now at the eleventh hour the assembly made one expiring effort to assert its independence, several members rose to declare that they were not free and that they refused to vote surrounded by bayonets and cannon, a resolution in which no less than two-thirds of the convention finally concurred. The mountain, not to be beaten, solved the difficulty by simply voting without them, and the majority, thus becoming simple spectators, left the Montagnards to pass the decree, supported by a great number of strangers who, as on the 27th of May, had placed themselves in the seats of the legislators whose functions they had usurped. So, by a violation of law and justice as flagrant as that which had brought about the condemnation of the king, the Girondins fell victims to the revolution they had helped to prepare. And just as Louis XVI, on the eve of his death, had seen in one prophetic moment the future that awaited France, brave Langeonais, prescribed with the faction whose cause he had defended, foretold the terrible era of which this day was to be the prelude in his last words from the tribune, I see civil war kindled in my country, spreading its ravages everywhere and rending France. I see the horrible monster of the dictatorship advancing over piles of ruins and corpses, swallowing you each up in turn, and overthrowing the Republic. The terror in the provinces. Exactly as Langeonais had prophesied, the fall of the Gironde proved the signal for civil war. All over France a great wave of indignation arose, and within a few months the whole country was in a blaze from one end to the other. In La Vendée, royalist and Catholic to the core, the fire had broken out two months earlier, the civil constitution of the clergy and continued persecution of all who remained attached to religion, the massacres of September, and finally the execution of the king, had each in turn roused the people's fury, and now one hundred thousand peasants, armed with forks and sticks, were marching in defense of the church and monarchy, led by the priests and few remaining nobles they had forcibly placed at their head. Leon likewise rose in revolt just before the final overthrow of the Gironde. The splendid city reduced to misery by the revolution, its commerce ruined, its inhabitants starving for want of work, 
had nevertheless submitted to the Republic, but when an emissary of the mountain, Chalier, a disciple of Marat, was sent to Lyon to propagate anarchy and set up a revolutionary tribunal, the sections of the town all combined against the convention. And on the 29th of May a bloody battle took place in the streets between the National Guards of Lyon, and the gunners enlisted in the service of the mountain, which ended in the arrest of Chalier. Then came the new of the rising in Paris on June 2nd, and the victory of the mountain. Thereupon Lyon boldly declared that it no longer recognized the convention, and called its citizens to arms. Meanwhile Bordeaux had risen in defense of its liberties, for with glaring injustice, when its deputies the Girondins were expelled from the convention, the department had been invited to name no others in their places. Bordeaux was, therefore, now unrepresented in the convention, and had every right to protest, indeed it had protested for some months before the 31st of May, against the treatment of its representatives by their adversaries of the mountain. Now on the 6th of June the Council General of the city forwarded a threatening address to the convention, and summoned Lyon and Dijon to combine in the fight for liberty. Throughout the southeast of France the fire of revolt was spreading likewise, Toulon opposed a vigorous resistance to the dictates of the mountain, Marseille, once dominated by the most violent revolutionaries, had also turned against it, and, summoning Lyon, Normandy, and La Vendée to its aid, announced its intention of marching on Paris. Calvados, Caen, and Evreux, in Normandy, were organizing revolt, Dauphiné and French Comte were in arms, altogether no less than sixty departments had risen against the tyranny of the convention. Such was the attitude of the twenty-five millions of France who, according to Carlyle, looked to the mountain for salvation, as a matter of fact at least three-quarters of the population were violently opposed to it, and the remaining quarter was mainly terrorized into submission. At the same time the people were by no means wholeheartedly on the side of the Girondins. Wazot, Pétion, Isnar, Barbarou, and others of the faction, who escaped from Paris after their expulsion from the convention and attempted to rally the provinces around them, failed entirely in their role of popular leaders. To the ruminating minds of the peasants, the aims of one republican faction were indistinguishable from another, they were ready to oppose the bloodshed and anarchy advocated by the mountain, but the ideal republic offered them by the Girondins in no way roused their enthusiasm. The truth is that France remained at heart monarchic, partly by conviction and partly by habit. For in every country the characteristic of the true people is hatred of innovation, and against this prejudice the republicans of both factions contended in vain. The correspondence of revolutionary emissaries to the provinces frequently breathes a spirit of despair, the laborer is estimable, but he is a very bad patriot in general, and from Marseille, in spite of our efforts to republicanize the people, our trouble and fatigue are almost fruitless. The mind of the public is still detestable amongst the proprietors, artisans, and day laborers, in Alsace republican sentiments are still in the cradle, fanaticism is extreme and unbelievable, the spirit of the inhabitants is in no way revolutionary. No one, however, has described the utter failure of the Girondins to convert the people to republicanism better than Buzot himself, one must not dissemble, the majority of the French people sighed after the monarchy and the constitution of 1791. Can one believe that the events of June 2, 1793, the misery, persecution, and assassinations that followed, made the majority of France change its opinion. No, but in the towns they pretend to be sans culotte, because those who are not are guillotined, in the country places they obey the most unjust summons to serve, in the army, because those who do not go are guillotined. The guillotine, that is the great reason for everything. This people is republican by blows of the guillotine. But look closely at things, penetrate into the homes of families, sound all hearts, and if they dare open themselves to you, you will read their hatred against the government that fear imposes on them, you will see that all their desires, all their hopes, tend towards the constitution of 1791. And again, the honest inhabitants of the countryside confound the crimes committed in the revolution of 1793 with the revolution itself, they abhor the republic, and those who tyrannize over them in its name, they regret and sigh for the return of a gentler and more peaceable regime. In the towns, where fear has withered all hearts, where commerce and industry are forever annihilated, where it is a crime to live in any degree of comfort or to show any decency in one's tastes or manners. Every citizen, in all classes, bitterly regretted the past. Indeed, Buzot himself is at last forced to arrive at this conclusion, amidst the abyss of evils into which this superb empire is precipitated by license and misery one is almost reduced to desiring the return of ancient despotism, 
since it is uncertain whether the French could now bear the moderate regime of the Constitution of 1791. It was thus in La Vendée alone that real enthusiasm prevailed, there the people, inspired by passionate devotion to cherished traditions, were at one with their seigneurs, whilst in the other provinces dominated by the Girondins the people took up arms in a cause that was not their own. Ostensibly they were fighting for the Republic, in reality they craved for the old familiar things the Republic had taken from them. What cared the peasants of France for the promise of a government modelled on Athens or Sparta that was to replace the antiquated monarchy, or the enlightened philosophy that was to compensate them for the destruction of their ancient faith? The Girondins themselves could not fail to perceive the failure of their efforts to inspire the people, everywhere it was the royalists who secured the largest following. Even in republican centres royalist generals led out the troops, at Lyon, Viriou and Prissy, at Porto, de Puisay, even Vimpfen, beloved of the Normans, though avowedly a republican, was believed by Louvit to be a royalist at heart. The Girondins at Caen in Normandy, Louvit, Guardet, Buzot, and others, watched these symptoms with alarm and, rather than combine with their rivals to overthrow the mountain, diverted their energies to opposing the progress of royalism. Thus amongst the leaders of the people there was no coordination, and amongst the various elements that made up the population no unity of purpose that alone could have ensured success. Owing to these dissensions the movement was from the first doomed to failure, and the triumph of the mountain seemed assured. It was then that a girl who lived at Caen, Marie-Charlotte Corday, resolved to take the law into her own hands and save the country by striking down the author of all the ills that were desolating France. For to Charlotte, as to many inhabitants of provincial towns, it was Marat who appeared as the incarnation of the terror that now held France in its grip, Marat once removed, she imagined that the other leaders of the mountain might return to sentiments of humanity. If Charlotte had been a Girondin, as certain writers have supposed, she would probably have thought otherwise, for to the Girondins Marat seemed merely a loathsome reptile, far less to be feared than Robespierre, whom they regarded as their chief antagonist of the mountain. It is therefore improbable that when Charlotte went to request Barbaroux for introductions to some of his friends in Paris, she confided to him the object of her journey, if, as Louvet said, she had consulted us, would it have been against Marat that we should have directed her stroke? Undoubtedly no, Robespierre would have been the victim, Barbaroux, moreover, could have told her that in slaying Marat she was sacrificing herself needlessly, for Marat was already dying of a lingering disease, and had, indeed, only a short time to live. This Charlotte did not know when she set forth for Paris on that morning of July 9th, and all the way she pictured to herself the execution of the great deed as she had planned it. The letter to Duprit, the friend of Barbaroux, was to procure her admittance to the convention, and there in the midst of the assembly, on the summit of the mountain, she meant to deal the mortal blow that was to rid the world of Marat. It was not until she reached Paris that she heard that the friend of the people was too ill to attend the convention. For some weeks already he had retired from public life, and the fearful irritation of his skin obliged him to sit perpetually in a bath with wet compresses around his head. The precise nature of his malady is not stated by his biographers, but according to the delegates from the Jacobin Club who were sent to visit him it was simply an acute attack of patriotism. The madness of Maratism is nowhere better exemplified than in the following report published by the Society, we have just been to see our brother Mara. We found him in his bath, a table, inkstand, and newspapers around him, occupying himself unremittingly with public affairs. It is not a disease. It is a great deal of compressed patriotism squeezed into a very small body, the violent efforts of patriotism exuding from every part are killing him. This was the vision that confronted Charlotte Corday when, on the evening of July 13, she succeeded, in spite of the opposition of Mara's mistress, Simone Everett, in obtaining admission to the fateful bathroom. If she had expected to see a monster she must have found her wildest imaginings surpassed now that she was brought face to face with the reality. Out of the opening of the slipper bath appeared the withered neck, the misshapen shoulders, the puny arms of the people's friend, and above them that monstrous head swathed in its compresses of vinegar and cold water, truly an awful and a hideous sight. A fainter heart than Charlotte's must have quailed, a nerve of less tried steel than hers must have failed at this tremendous moment, have kept her rooted to the threshold, or driven her shuddering backwards through the door and down the narrow staircase, out, out, into the pure air of heaven. But Charlotte, wholly concentrated on her purpose, had risen above such human weaknesses, and she went straight forward, calm as the summer evening outside the window, and sat down beside Marat. Charlotte Corday did not kill Marat as Marat killed his victims, 
without a trial. She gave him now, at the last moment, a chance to prove that it was not he who had raised scaffolds all over France, that it was not by his orders that innocent victims were led daily to their death. So when he asked for news of Khan, she spoke of the Girondon deputies who had taken refuge there, mentioning them by name. And at that Mara croaked out with a frightful laugh, I will have them all guillotined within a week. Then rumor had not lied, Mara was indeed the sanguinary monster he had been represented in the provinces. Out of his own mouth he was convicted. Charlotte hesitated no longer, and grasping her knife she plunged it straight into his heart. The deed was done, henceforth, as she said, she was to know peace. The serenity she displayed at her trial amazed the world no less than the courage that had led her to carry out her enterprise. Who had inspired you with so much hatred against Mara? The president asked her. I did not need the hatred of others, I had enough of my own. In killing him what did you hope? To restore peace to my country. Do you think you have killed all the Marats? That one dead, the others will perhaps be afraid. Never for a moment as it seemed to have occurred to Charlotte that her action could be regarded as murder. When Fikir Tinville observed suspiciously, you must be well practiced in this kind of crime, she cried out in horror, the monster. He takes me for an assassin. The truth is that Charlotte did not feel she had killed a human being, but rather that she had exorcised an evil spirit who had cast a spell over the capital. It is only in Paris, she said to her judges, that people's eyes are bewitched on account of Mara, in the other departments he is regarded as a monster. And, indeed, the more we study Mara the more we feel a sensation of unreality creeping over us. Can such a being really have existed outside the pages of a medieval legend? Robespierre, Danton, Bio, even Carrier we can believe in as physiological possibilities, but Mara is a phenomenon to be explained by no natural laws, the shuddering repulsion he inspired in all normal beholders, the unholy fascination he exercised over those who fell beneath his power, the fearful rapidity with which immediately after death that hideous body crumbled to corruption, yet around which knelt crowds of worshippers, blaspheming Christ and crying out, O, oh, sacred heart of Mara. All these things belong surely to the region of the supernatural, and can only be accounted for by a belief in demoniacal possession. Exclude this hypothesis and Mara remains an insoluble mystery, unique in the annals of mankind. At any rate, whether we believe in the powers of darkness or not, the phase on which the revolutionary movement now entered could not have been surpassed in devilry if evil spirits hitherto caged in the body of Mara had been loosed over France. Until now the atrocities committed have been traceable to perfectly tangible causes, to Orleanist intrigue, to the personal ambitions of the leaders, to excitement, delusion, or drink on the part of the populace, but from the autumn of 1793 all political aims seem to be swallowed up in a wild rage for destruction, the scenes of horror taking place everywhere appear to serve no definite purpose, but, like the convulsions of a madman, to spring from a mind in delirium. Yet if we examine the movement closely we shall find that there was nevertheless a method in the madness, that through this frightful period of the terror there ran a system founded on the same political doctrines that had produced the massacres of September. This is what Kalud Herboy meant when he said, the 2nd of September is the credo of our liberty, in other words, the massacres in the prisons formed simply the prelude to a general scheme of destruction. At this earlier date, as we have seen, the idea of the leaders was to amputate the gangrened limb formed by the aristocracy and clergy, now that these two categories had been practically destroyed, the same operation must be carried out on those other portions of the body to which the gangrene had spread. First on the list came, then, the prosperous bourgeoisie, the peculiar object of Mara's hatred, a hatred he had communicated to Robespierre and Heber, who, after the death of Mara, were left to carry on the campaign against this obnoxious class. Thus we find Robespierre writing, internal dangers come from the bourgeois, in order to conquer the bourgeois we must rouse the people, we must procure arms for them and make them angry. Heber went further, the virtue of the holy guillotine, he wrote, will gradually deliver the republic from the rich, the bourgeois, the spies, the fat farmers, and the worthy tradesmen as from the priests and aristocrats. They are all devourers of men. This campaign against commerce was again the direct outcome of Illuminism, for it was Weishaupt who had first denounced the mercantile tribe as capable of exercising the most formidable of despotisms. Accordingly war was now waged with particular ferocity on the manufacturing towns. In August the revolutionary troops surrounded Lyon, where the authorities, exasperated by the sanguinary propaganda of Chalier, had ended by condemning this disciple of Marat to death. 
The siege lasted until the 9th of October 1793, when, reduced by famine, Leon was obliged to surrender, and it was then decided that the magnificent city, once the pride of France, must be demolished. The name of Leon, cried Bear at the convention, must no longer exist, you will call it Villa Franchi. On the ruins he proposed to erect a monument bearing the words, Leon made war on liberty, Leon is no more. Thereupon the convention passed the decree, the town of Leon shall be destroyed, every part of it inhabited by the rich shall be demolished, only the dwellings of the poor shall remain. Emissaries were then sent to carry out the task, the paralytic Coutone, born on a litter about the city, struck with a silver hammer the buildings destined to destruction, saying as he did so, in the name of the law I demolish you, and instantly masons set to work upon the task. Meanwhile orators incited the working classes to violence, what are you doing, pusillanimous workmen, in these industrial occupations by which opulence degrades you? Come out of this servitude and confront the rich man who oppresses you. Overthrow his fortune, overthrow these edifices, the wreckage belongs to you. It is thus that you will rise to that sublime equality, the basis of true liberty, the vigorous principle of a warrior people to whom commerce and arts should be unnecessary. It will be seen, therefore, that there was no question of readjusting relations between employers and employed, the whole industrial system, was simply to be destroyed whilst the workers were left to starve upon the ruins. Yet even when commerce had gone the way of aristocracy, and pride of wealth no longer violated the principles of sublime equality, yet another center of gangrene still remained, the educated classes. It was here that Robespierre displayed particular energy. Men of talent had always been abhorrent to him, hence his inveterate animosity towards the Girondins. Unable himself to rise out of the crowd of little lawyers amongst whom he had made his debut in Paris, he could not forgive success achieved by eloquence or literary ability. To the incorruptible wealth offered little or no temptation, but superiority of talent roused in him an envy that bordered on insanity, and it was mainly owing to his influence that a campaign against intellect, art, and education was now inaugurated. All highly educated men were persecuted, said Fourcroy later to the convention, it was enough to have some knowledge, to be a man of letters, in order to be arrested as an aristocrat. Robespierre, with atrocious skill, rent, calumniated. All those who had given themselves up to great studies, all those who possessed wide knowledge. He felt that no educated man would ever bend the knee to him. This war on education was even carried out against the treasures of science, art, and literature. Manuel proposed to demolish the Port Saint-Denis, Chemet wanted to kill all the rare animals in the Museum of Natural History, Henry proposed to burn the Bibliothèque Nationale, and his suggestion was repeated at Marseille, the other Decembers, taking up the cry, added, yes, we will burn all the libraries, for only the history of the revolution and the laws will be needed. And although the great National Library of Paris survived, thousands of books and valuable pictures all over France were destroyed or sold for next to nothing. Not only education but politeness in all forms was to be destroyed. By a decree of the Commune on 21 August 1792 the titles of Monsieur and Madame had been formally abolished, and the words citoyen or citoyen substituted, and in order to satisfy the exponents of equality it had now become necessary to assume a rough and boorish manner, to present an uncultivated appearance. A refined countenance, hands that bore no marks of manual labor, well-brushed hair, clean and decent garments, were regarded with suspicion, to make sure of keeping one's head on one's shoulders it was advisable that it should be unkempt. Thus, says Bewley, those who had been born with a gentle exterior, were obliged to distort their faces, to quicken their movements, so as to look as if they formed a part of those ferocious bands that had been loosed against them. Our dandies had allowed their moustaches to grow long, they had ruffled their hair, soiled their hands, and put on repulsive clothes. Our philosophers, our men of letters, wore large bristling caps from which hung long fox tails that floated on their shoulders, some dragged great wheeled sabers along the pavement, they were taken for Tartars. Paris was no longer recognizable, one would have said that all the bandits of Europe had replaced its brilliant population. In a word, it was now not merely war on nobility, on wealth, on industry, on art, and on intellect, it was war on civilization. France was to return to a state of savagery. Insane as the project may seem, we must recognize it nevertheless to be the logical outcome of the desire for absolute equality. But unfortunately, when the equalizing process reached this stage, an unexpected difficulty occurred. 
The aristocracy of birth had long since been humbled to the dust, the aristocracy of wealth was reduced to beggary, the aristocracy of intellect concealed itself beneath a rude exterior, yet, after all, aristocracy still survived triumphantly, for lo. It had taken refuge amongst the people. Nowhere, says Taine, are there so many suspects as amongst the people, the shop, the farm, and the workshops contain more aristocrats, than the presbytery or the chateau. In fact, according to the Jacobins, the cultivators are nearly all aristocrats, all the tradesmen are essentially counter-revolutionary. The butchers and bakers are of an insufferable aristocracy. The women of the market, writes a government spy, except a few who are bribed, or whose husbands are Jacobins, curse, swear, rave, and fume, but they dare not speak too loud, because they are all afraid of the Revolutionary Committee and the guillotine. This morning, said a shopkeeper, I had four or five of them here. They do not wish to be called citizenesses any longer. They say they spit on the Republic. In the provinces matters were still worse, not only had reverence for religion and the king survived, but everywhere respect for superiority and successful enterprise prevailed, the good bourgeois whose business had prospered, the worthy mayor renowned for his benevolence, the working man who had got on in the world, all these in the eyes of country folk seem more deserving of esteem than the drunkard or the wastrel. How was perfect equality to be achieved if the people themselves persisted in raising one man above another? It is easy to imagine the despair that seized on the surgeons who had embarked on the great scheme of eliminating gangrene when they discovered its existence in this most vital point of the body. Yet, nothing daunted, they grasped their instruments and set to work once more, if the people themselves were gangrened, then the people too must come under the knife, the blade of the guillotine must fall alike on the neck of noble, priest, or peasant. So on the 5th of September the word went forth from the Commune of Paris, let us make terror the order of the day. In order to carry out this system it was necessary to reconstruct the government. Already the first constitution framed on the K.A.s had been swept away and replaced by the anarchic code known as the Constitution de Lon II, without further reference to the desires of the people. But now the anarchists had recourse to a still more arbitrary measure, and on the 10th of October the convention, entirely dominated by the mountain, acceded to the proposal of St. Just that a provisional revolutionary government should be proclaimed, in which every department of the state was to be placed under the control of the Comité de Salut public. The members of this committee, which included Robespierre, Couton, St. Just, Baer, Billot Varenne, Calud Herboy, Jean Bon Saint André, Carnot, Prior de la Marne, and Lindet, were thus to be made the absolute rulers of France, to their authority the executive power, the ministers, the generals, and the constituted bodies were to be subjugated, and since it was by the incorruptible that they themselves were controlled, the reign of Robespierre may be said to have begun from this moment. The terror in the provinces was thus entirely the work of the Comité de Salut public. Emissaries were now sent out by the committee to the towns and provinces that had risen against the mountain, with instructions to show no mercy to the counter-revolutionaries. The better to ensure a rigorous application of the new regime these men were usually chosen to act in couples, one to check the other, in reality to goad each other on to violence. Thus when at Bordeaux, Tallien, under the influence of the beautiful Theresia Caberus, showed signs of relenting, Isobo performed the office of denunciator, at Lyon, Calud her boy urged on Fouché, at Toulon, Frerin incited Barras, and so each emissary, terrorized by his colleague, attempted to outdo him in ferocity. The atrocities that took place all over France from October 1793 onwards require volumes to be realized in their full horror, and can only be briefly summarized here. At Bordeaux, then, owing to the intervention of Theresia, only 301 people fell victims to the guillotine, which took patriotic journeys to that city, starvation and terror were, therefore, the means by which it was finally reduced to submission. But at Lyon the population was literally mowed down in hundreds, carts filled with women, old and young, plied daily to the scaffold. But the guillotine proved too slow a method of extermination, and the method of fusillades was then adopted, young citizens tied together in couples were driven to the brotto and blown into fragments by rifle and cannon fire. The Rhone, that received at least two thousand corpses, ran so red with blood that Ronson, the general of the revolutionary armies, informed the Cordeliers in Paris of its utility in conveying a message of warning to the counter-revolutionaries all over the South. The South, however, needed no warning. Toulon, crushed and starved by the regime of Frerin and Barras, 
had opened its gates in desperation to the English on the 29th of August, treachery never to be forgiven it. Yet there were certainly extenuating circumstances. It was necessary, wrote Isnar, who was then at Toulon, to yield either to the mountain or to Admiral Hood. The former brought us scaffolds, the latter promised to shatter them, the former gave us famine, the latter offered us provisions, Freren brought us the Constitution of 1793, written by the executioner at the dictation of Robespierre, who promised to put us under the laws promulgated by the Constituent Assembly. A few intriguers profited by these circumstances to tempt the multitude led astray by hunger and despair, it had the weakness to prefer bread to death, the Constitution of 1791 to the Anarchic Code of 1793. Toulon paid heavily for its frailty when, on the 17th of December, the town was recaptured by the army of the Republic. Freren, mounted on a horse, surrounded by cannons, troops, and a hundred maniacs, adorers of the god Mara, ordered citizens selected at random to be lined up against the walls and shot. Freren gives the signal, the charge rings out from every side, the murder is accomplished. The ground is drenched in blood, the air resounds with cries of despair, the dying roll back upon the corpses. Suddenly, by order of the tyrant, a voice cries, let those who are not dead arise. The wounded raise themselves in the hope that help will be brought to them, a fresh discharge is made, and steel gathers those that fire has spared. After this Freren complacently announced that 800 Toulonais had perished in the fusillade, whilst at the same time 200 heads fell by the guillotine. These methods, repeated until the spring of 1794, resulted, according to Prudhomme, in the death of no less than 14,325 men, women, and children, and whether this figure is excessive or not the fact remains that by the 9th of Thermidor the population of Toulon was reduced from 29,000 to 7,000 inhabitants. All over Provence men were hunted down like wild beasts, the prophecy of the scriptures seemed now to be fulfilled, for those that were in the cities fled into the mountains, crying to the rocks to cover them, and hiding in dens and caves of the earth. At Marseille the death roll was comparatively light, only about 240 victims had mounted the scaffold by January of 1794, and the Comité de Salo public in Paris found it necessary to issue a reprimand to the public accuser of that city in Paris. The art of guillotining has attained perfection. Sanson and his pupils guillotine with so much rapidity. They expedited twelve in thirteen minutes. Send, then, the executioner of Marseille to Paris in order to take a course of guillotining with his colleague Sanson, or we shall never get through. You must know that we shall never let you want for game for the guillotine, and a great number must be dispatched. In the small town of Orange, however, 318 victims were disposed of in a very short space of time, whilst in the north at Arras and Combray, under the reign of the apostate priest, Joseph Le Bon, between 1500 and 2000 perished. In the province of Anjou alone the number of people killed without a trial has been estimated at 10,000. La Vendée as the stronghold of royalism, when finally vanquished in October, could not of course hope for mercy, and the plan of the convention, to transform this country into a desert, was adopted. We are able to say today, wrote the Republican envoys, that La Vendée no longer exists. A profound silence reigns at present in the land occupied by the rebels. One could travel far in these parts without encountering a man or a cottage, for we have left nothing behind us but ashes and piles of corpses. But of all the towns of France it was at Nantes in Brittany that the worst atrocities were committed, in spite of the fact that here the bourgeoisie had welcomed the revolution with the greatest enthusiasm, and, indeed, had actually taken up arms against La Vendée. Unhappily, in the organizer of the campaign against Nantes the Comité de Salo public had found a man after its own heart. Like his divinity Mara, Jean-Baptiste Carrier embodied in his person the whole principle of the terror, like Mara, physically abnormal with his lean misshapen figure, his long cadaverous face and bloodshot eyes, Carrier exhibited perpetually the same convulsive fury that had characterized the people's friend, indeed it is probable that he too was the victim of homicidal mania. Carrier thought, spoke, dreamt incessantly of killing, I have seen him, a contemporary declared, cutting candles in two with his sabre as if they were the heads of aristocrats. Even his colleagues trembled to approach him for fear of his sudden angers, his bellowings like those of a famished wild beast. In order to carry out the vengeance of this maniac upon the unfortunate city, three companies of bandits, selected for their ferocity, had been recruited. The first of these, which Carrier had named after his idol, the company of Mara, 
consisted of 60 members who had sworn on enrollment to carry out the doctrines of the People's Friend, the second, known as the American Hazars, was composed of Negroes and Mulattoes, the third, which was called the Germanic Legion, had been formed with German mercenaries and deserters. Thus, as Taine observes, it was necessary, in order to find men for the work, to descend not only to the lowest ruffians of France, but to brutes of foreign race and speech. The services of the two last companies were utilized principally for brutality towards women and children, an eyewitness related that on one occasion he saw the corpses of no less than 75 girls, aged from 16 to 18 who had been shot down by the German legion. Carrier entertained a peculiar hatred for children, they are whelps, he said, they must be destroyed, and he gave orders that they should be butchered without mercy. The details of these massacres far surpass in horror anything that took place in Paris during the height of the terror, their young children at least were spared, but at Nantes they perished miserably in hundreds. The annals of savagery can show nothing more revolting, poor little peasant boys and girls thrust beneath the blade of the guillotine, mutilated because they were too small to fit the fatal plank, five hundred driven all at once into a field outside the city and shot down, clubbed and sabred by the assassins round whose knees they clung, weeping and crying out for mercy. Finally the executioner grew weary of the slaughter and declared he could go on no longer, even the fusillades proved too slow a method of extermination, and it was then that Carrier embarked on the scheme which for all time has rendered his name infamous, the Noyades, or wholesale drownings in the Loire. The first experiment was made on about ninety old priests, who were placed on board a galliot in charge of several marats, as the members of the Mara company were known and when in midstream those men, obedient to orders, burst open the ports and sank the barge to the bottom of the river. This delighted Carrier, I have never laughed so much, he declared, as when I saw the faces those, made as they died. The incident, when reported to the convention, met with no remonstrance, Aero de Seychelles in fact, wrote to Carrier congratulating him on his energy and talent in the art of revolution, whilst Robespierre, we know, heartily approved. Carrier, thus encouraged, set to work on a larger scale. The cargo load of gangrene in the form of clergy had proved but the prelude, now the people were to provide the victims. So through those bitter December nights crowds of poor women, armed with the little bundles of possessions that peasants in flight are wont to carry with them, some clasping babies to their breasts, some leading little children by the hand, were driven out into the cold and darkness, they knew not whither, only when they found themselves on the bank of the river where the great barges waited the hideous truth dawned on them. Then all at once they burst into tears and lamentations, crying out, they are going to drown us, and they will not bring us to trial. Many holding their babies closer refused to give them up to strangers, and bore them with them in their arms down beneath the dark waters of the Loire. These perhaps were wisest, for many of those poor children, whom stronger-minded mothers had placed in sympathetic arms held out to them, were seized by carrier's agents and herded into the ghastly entrepot, or prison of the city, to die of cold and pestilence. The Noyades, which Carrier playfully described as bathing parties, offered a fresh field to his inventive genius, and by way of variety he now devised the plan of stripping men and women to the skin, tying them together in couples and throwing them thus bound into the Loire. Carrier called this Republican marriages. Such was the reign of terror at Nantes, during which the number of victims that perished by drowning was estimated by one member of Carrier's committee at 6,000, by another at 9,000, whilst Pridom estimates the number of people killed by drownings, fusillades, the guillotine and pestilence, at the appalling figure of 32,000. What must have been the death roll for all France during the terror? Pridom places it at no less than 1,025,711, including losses through civil war, tain at nearly half a million in the eleven provinces of the West alone. But on this point it is impossible to speak with any certainty. We only know that the massacres were wholesale and, what is more important, indiscriminate. For not only were the victims of the fusillades and noyades almost exclusively taken from amongst the people, creatures of no account, said Gullin, one of Carrier's aides, but no attempt was made to discover their political opinions. Some were royalists, others republicans, the greater number probably held no views on politics at all, but lived like simple country folk, without a thought beyond their daily needs. The necessity for destroying gangrene cannot, therefore, have applied to them, and we must seek a further development in the scheme of the revolutionary leaders to explain this amazing paradox, the massacring of the people in the name of democracy. Epilogue. In the foregoing chapter we have seen the results of the great revolutionary climax, the reign of terror, 
and although at the close of this frightful epoch the revolution was not yet ended, it is impossible within the limits of this book to follow it throughout its final convulsions. To judge of the ultimate results of the movement by the state of France in 1795 would, however, be inconclusive, at this date, it might reasonably be urged, the country was still in a transition stage, a period of chaos was bound to follow on the great upheaval before matters could readjust themselves and the beneficial effects of the revolution become apparent. To this argument the only reply is a brief summary of the succeeding regime in France during the century that followed, it will then be seen, not as a matter of opinion but of fact, how far the new order proved permanent is satisfying to the nation. The directory that succeeded to the convention lasted four years, from 1795 to 1799, during which period two coups d'état took place. The directory was then abolished on account of its tyranny, corruption, and mismanagement. In 1799 the consulate was formed, with Napoleon Bonaparte as first consul, but five years later the republic was declared a failure as unequal to the exigencies of the country. Accordingly in 1804 Napoleon was made emperor, and by re-establishing despotism, a rigorous system of conscription, the abolition of the liberty of the press, etc., he succeeded in restoring order. It is needless to enumerate the disasters that followed on this brief spell of glory, the retreat from Moscow during which thousands of Frenchmen perished in the snows of Russia, the invasion of France by Russians, Austrians and Prussians, the overthrow of Napoleon for having violated the rights and liberties of the people and the laws of the Constitution. Then France, sickened with anarchy, republicanism, and imperialism all in turn, reverted to monarchy, and in 1814 Louis XVIII was called to the throne only to be driven away by Napoleon six months later. Fresh disasters followed, the defeat of Waterloo, the second entry of foreign armies into Paris, the payment of an indemnity of 28 millions. Once more Louis XVIII was recalled, and the nine years of legitimist monarchy that followed was the only government since the revolution that did not come to a violent end, but ceased with the death of the king in 1824. The reign of Charles X, the unpopular Comte d'Artois, was foredoomed to failure, and the legitimist dynasty was overthrown in 1830 by a fresh rising of the Orleanists. But now that at last the conspiracy had achieved the purpose for which 41 years earlier it had plunged France into the horrors of revolution, and the succession was transferred to the House of Orleans, it became apparent that Louis-Philippe firmly seated on the throne of France was a very different person from the Duc de Chartres sitting in the tribune of a revolutionary assembly and calling out for lanterns. The liberty that the change of dynasty was to confer proved, like all the other visions of liberty offered by the revolution, only a mirage, and after 18 years of unrest Louis-Philippe was driven from the throne he had usurped. In this third revolution of 1848 fresh scenes of bloodshed took place, led by socialists the workmen of Paris broke out into violent insurrection, the national workshops were suppressed, and finally a second republic was proclaimed. Let us leave it to a Frenchman, who lived through the time to tell the rest of the tragic story. We see this ephemeral republic, says Monsieur François Saint-Maur, perishing beneath an audacious coup d'état, France hungering for rest and order, throwing herself at the feet of a representative of a great name, Louis Napoleon, the Second Empire established and soon shattered, a series of wars ending with the most terrible of all, Napoleon III. Conquered and a prisoner, and the Third Republic proclaimed without having been asked or desired by the nation, anarchy, despotism, and license under the name of liberty. A bold and incapable dictatorship profiting by the disasters of the country to seize the reins of power. A frightful insurrection holding Paris for two months under the sway of the terror, living and dying in murder, pillage, and burning, the grossest instincts glorified and triumphant, the most odious crimes evading just repression, the revolution always armed, right trampled underfoot. Such is the history of that mournful period. In spite of such incidents as the affair Boulanger, the affair Dreyfus, frequent strikes of workmen, the strife of factions, this third republic, the republic of today, has nevertheless held her own for nearly fifty years, and now, after gloriously retrieving the disasters of 1870, we fervently hope will at last give peace to France. The sequel to the great French Revolution was thus eighty years of unrest. That this unrest was the direct outcome of the revolution it is impossible to deny. To attribute it to the unstable character of the French people is as illogical and unjust as to attribute the crimes and follies of the revolution to their passions. The French people had not proved fickle or unstable under their former government, were they not the same people who had proved passionately loyal to their kings during fourteen centuries. 
If after the revolution they became restless and unstable, it was simply that the revolution itself had produced this change in the national character. For by that gigantic demolition France lost the habit of stability, the power of remaining content with any form of government, the spell exercised by the monarchy once broken she lost faith in all rulers, and through eight succeeding forms of government never found one to satisfy her permanently. As Monsieur de Lamini has expressed it the persistence of subversive utopias is at the same time the cause and the natural consequence of all those abortive strokes that make up our history since 1789 a vicious circle in which France turns and mentally exhausts herself. Yet, if the century that followed had proved a millennial age of contentment, if the Republic established in 1792 had never been overthrown, but had continued to this day to satisfy the desires of the French people, the panegyrists of the revolution could not have pronounced it a more unqualified success. For in spite of subsequent upheavals, they hasten to assure us, Great and lasting reforms were brought about by the revolution, reforms so immense as to atone for all the crimes and follies that attended their birth. Contrary to all previous experience in the history of the world, this time, we are asked to believe, men did gather grapes of thorns and figs of thistles, and from the hatred, the lust, and the corruption that marked the whole revolutionary period there sprang up a harvest of love and liberty and justice. If this were so, morality might well be proclaimed a fraud, and the divine ordering of the universe a delusion. Mercifully it is as untrue as all the other deductions of revolutionary sophists. The immense reforms brought about, during the revolutionary era, were not the result of the revolution. It was to the king and his enlightened advisers, as I have shown in this book, that the reforms in government were primarily due, it was the noblesse that dealt the death blow to the feudal system, it was the royalist democrats, abhorred of the revolutionary leaders, who drew up the Declaration of the Rights of Man and framed the Constitution. The work of the revolution was to destroy all these reforms, to abolish the liberty of the press, liberty of conscience, personal liberty, to replace the comparatively mild feudalism of the old regime by the most frightful tyranny the world had ever seen, and finally to annul the Constitution demanded by the people in favor of a Constitution that could never be enforced, that lasted exactly 26 months, and was followed by no less than six others in the 80 years that followed. Of all the measures passed by revolutionary legislation one alone can be quoted with some show of reason by historians to have resulted in permanent benefit to the people, this was the law passed in 1793 conferring a greater proportion of the land on the peasants by the sale of national goods, that is to say, property formerly owned by the nobility and clergy. Thus although, as Monsieur Louis Madeleine points out, the workman was the principal victim of the revolution, the peasant proprietor profited by it. The peasant alone, writes a contemporary, is happy, he alone has gained. But how far was this happiness a reality, or did it, like his pre-revolutionary misery, exist largely on paper? To judge of this we must refer to the accounts of eyewitnesses who record their impressions after the revolutionary storm had subsided. Thus, for example, we may compare the following passage in the journal of an English woman who travelled through France in 1802 with the descriptions given by Dr. Rigby of dancing French peasants quoted at the beginning of this book, Breteuil, July 8, where is the gaiety we have heard of from our infancy as the distinguishing characteristic of this nation? Where is the original of Stern's picture of a French Sunday? I have seen today no cessation from toil, no intermixture of devotion, and repose, and pleasure. I have seen no dance, I have heard no song. But I have seen the pale laborer bending over the plentiful fields, of which he does not seem, if one may judge by his looks, ever to have enjoyed the produce, I have seen groups of men, women, and children working under the influence of the burning sun. And others giving to toil the hours destined to repose, even so late as ten o'clock at night, etc. By dint of this capacity for unremitting labor, combined with his inherent thrift, the peasant of France has contrived to make a living out of the soil, but certainly not under the millennial conditions promised him by the revolutionary leaders. A still more striking comparison might be made between the accounts given by Arthur Young of the peasant's lot in 1789 and that of his successor in agricultural law, Mr. Roland Prothero, in his Pleasant Land of France, written precisely 100 years later. After describing in detail the wretchedness of the French peasants, food and dwelling which he witnessed, during a tour through France in 1889, Mr. Prothero concludes with the words, the position of the peasant thus miserably lodged and poorly fed is said to be precarious and perilous. He is a proprietor only in name. The real owner is the money lender, and the peasant proprietor is a veritable serf. If this, then, 
was all that the one purely revolutionary reform did for the peasant of France, we may well ask whether it was worth the seas of bloodshed to effect it. But whilst the benefits resulting to France from the revolution may be comprised in so small a compass, peasant proprietorship on an increased scale, the evils of which it was the cause are immeasurable. And Amp, 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 NDSP, the revolution, wrote Hoer, who had lived all through it, was terrible because it was neither in the interests nor in the character of the people. It had a million soldiers killed, 200,000 to 300,000 citizens butchered. I shall be told, you are wrong, confused. One must not place on the score of the revolution all the errors, the mistakes, or even the crimes of which it was the occasion, not the cause. But what is this idea of separating the revolution from the ills it produced? To what other cause must they be attributed? It is to it, to it alone, that they are due, these effects were not accidents but consequences. The tree has borne its fruits. This is what many people will not see. We are told that it was with the revolution that ideas of liberty originated in France. Nothing is further from the truth. France had a far clearer conception of liberty, even of democracy, during the years that preceded the revolution than in those that followed after, in the days when Rousseau said that liberty would be too dearly bought with the blood of one French citizen than when Mirabeau demanded that liberty should have for her bed mattresses of corpses, or when Reynal declared that a country could only be regenerated in a bath of blood. No, it was not ideas of liberty that the revolution bequeathed to France, but a legacy of bitterness, of envy, and of strife. I am convinced that the day will come when the world, enlightened by the principles of true democracy, will recognize that the French Revolution was not an advance towards democracy but a directly anti-democratic and reactionary movement, that it was not a struggle for liberty but an attempt to strangle liberty at its birth, the leaders will then be seen in their true colors as the cruelest enemies of the people, and the people, no longer condemned for their ferocity, will be pitied as the victims of a gigantic conspiracy. It was this conspiracy, or rather this combination of conspiracies, that alone triumphed in the revolution, it was the same great intrigues at work amongst the people in 1789 that survived all the storms that followed after and that now once again threaten the peace of the world. The final triumph of the intrigues. Of the first great intrigue of the French Revolution, the Orleanist conspiracy, little more remains to be said, for although it was the cause of the Revolution of 1830, and again made itself felt as recently as 1889 and in the Affair Boulanger, it claims at the present day so few supporters that it may be described as dead. It is therefore with the other three intrigues, now more alive than ever, that we need concern ourselves. That the French Revolution proved a triumphant success for Prussia might be proved in half a dozen ways, the severing of the Franco-Austrian alliance, the alarm created amongst the smaller German sovereigns that caused them to rally around Prussia, the overthrow of the Bourbons who had constituted the chief rivals to the ambitions of the Hohenzollerns and the removal of whom enabled Germany to place the offspring of her royal houses on all the thrones of Europe. The destruction of the French court which, as the center of art and learning, formed the greatest safeguard of civilization and the strongest antidote to militarism, and, on the other hand, the rise to power of Napoleon I, who in the role of an aggressor alienated from France the sympathies of all Europe, the decline in the population which weakened the military strength of France, these are only a few of the benefits reaped by Prussia from the harvest of sedition she had sown. But perhaps the principal advantage that Prussia gained by the revolution was the propagation of those doctrines of socialism and anti-patriotism that, first circulated by the revolutionaries of France, have paralyzed the resistance of Prussia's enemies. Before 1870 it was the socialists of France who opposed the reorganization of the army, it was Michelet, the great panegyrist of the revolution, who, on the very eve of the Franco-Prussian War, hailed the rising power of Germany, and in the great war that has just ended it was the radical socialists of France and the corresponding factions in all the countries of the Allies who have displayed the least resentment of Prussian aggression. Thus the immense paradox has been created that amongst the so-called Democrats of Europe Prussian autocracy has found its most valuable allies. From the 18th century onwards Prussia has never relinquished the policy of Frederick the Great, that of encouraging social unrest in the countries she wishes to subdue. The first experiment was made in France, the second in Belgium during the same period, the third, at an interval of a century and a quarter, during which period German philosophers and writers ceaselessly disseminated those subversive doctrines that are rigorously suppressed in the land of their birth, was to have taken place in Ireland during the spring of 1914.
This effort proving temporarily abortive Germany concentrated all her energies on Russia, and by the fearful cataclysm that ensued very nearly succeeded in turning the tide of the war irretrievably against the Allies. But it would seem that Prussia had played with fire too long, that the fire she had fanned so assiduously abroad had all the while been smoldering within her own borders, and now threatens to envelop her in the general conflagration. If indeed the present revolution in Germany is genuine, and the power of the Hansolens has been finally overthrown, it is surely the most amazing case of being hoist with one's own petard in the history of the world. For side by side with the intrigue of the Hansolens that other intrigue has gone forward, the scheme that, originating with the Illuminati of Bavaria in 1776, is now being actively carried out by their successors. The plan of world revolution devised by Weishaupt has at last been realized. Can we believe that it is by mere coincidence that the Spartacists of Munich have adopted the pseudonym of their fellow countryman and predecessor, Spartacus Weishaupt, the inaugurator of class warfare? Is it a mere coincidence that their doctrines are the same as his? We have only to study the course of the revolutionary movement in Europe during the last 130 years to realize that it has been the direct continuation of the scheme of the Illuminati, that the doctrines and the aims of the sect have been handed down without a break through the succeeding groups of revolutionary socialists. Thus, for example, if we compare the Confession of Faith issued by Bakunin in the name of the International Social Democratic Alliance of 1866 with the Creed of the Illuminati quoted on page 20 of this book, they will be found to be almost identical, the Alliance professes atheism, it aims at the abolition of religious services, the replacement of belief by knowledge and divine by human justice, the abolition of marriage as a political, religious, and civic arrangement. Before all it aims at the definite and complete abolition of all classes and the political, economic, and social equality of the individual of either sex, the abolition of inheritance. All children to be brought up on a uniform system, so that artificial inequalities may disappear. It aims directly at the triumph of the cause of labor over capital. It repudiates so-called patriotism, and the rivalry of nations, and desires the universal association of all local associations by means of freedom. Indeed Prince Kropotkin, one of the leading spirits of the Internationale, admits that there was a direct filiation between this association and the Enrage of 1793 and the secret societies of 1795. Now, since we know that ever since 1866, and still at the present day, it is in secret societies and at meetings of spurious Freemasons that revolutionary doctrines have been propagated, can we doubt that these associations are also the direct continuations of the Illuminati, and that it is on the doctrines of Weishaupt, the inventor of world revolution, that the thing we now call Bolshevism is founded? Can we doubt, moreover, that many of the terrible secrets of engineering popular tumults have been handed down to these societies from those that organized the first experiments in France? The art of working on the public mind by calumny, corruption and terror, the seduction of the soldiery by women in the pay of the agitators, the fabrication of pretexts by which the people were made to carry out the designs of the leaders, the holding up or destruction of food supplies in order to drive them by hunger to violence, and at the same time the distribution of fiery liquor to inflame their passions, the hiring of foreign assassins to lead them on to bloodshed. All these diabolical methods employed by the Jacobins of France, indoctrinated by the Illuminati, have been repeated in Russia with terrible effect. Moreover, not only in its secret organization, but in its outward manifestations the Russian Revolution has obviously been inspired by the French, the September massacres in the prisons of Petrograd by those in the prisons of Paris, the drownings in the Black Sea by the Noyades de Nantes, the desecration of the Kremlin by the desecration of Notre Dame, the very phraseology of the leaders is the same. The Bolshevik tirades against the bourgeoisie are copied almost verbatim from the diatribes of Robespierre. The danger that threatens civilization is therefore no new danger but dates from before the French Revolution. The blaze kindled by Weishaupt has never ceased to smolder, France was only the place of its first conflagration. The same doctrines again put into practice must inevitably lead to the same result as surely as the fusion of the same gases must produce the same explosion. For the terror, as I have shown, was not a frightful accident but the logical consequence of attempting to establish by force a system of equality not demanded by the nation. It matters not how averse to violence the leaders of such a movement may be, or how exalted the ideals which inspire them, they will find themselves obliged to resort to violent methods in order to maintain themselves in power, firstly, because by no other means can resistance be overcome, and secondly, because a period of anarchy is unavoidable for the destruction of the existing order. 
and this must inevitably rally round them men who are not idealists at all but simply criminals whose ferocity they will be unable to control. Whoever stops halfway in revolution, said Saint Just, digs his own grave. So just as Robespierre, who in 1791 had proposed the abolition of capital punishment, and later still had shuddered at the sanguinary schemes of Marat, found himself obliged to adopt the system of depopulation and to ally himself with Kalu, Bio, Bear, and the jackals of the Comité de Sûreté Générale in order to carry out his scheme of equality and to save his own head, just as Babouf, who had denounced the atrocious methods of Robespierre, came to see that the triumph of socialism could be ensured by no other means, just as Lenin, who has likewise been described as an idealist, is forced to permit, if not to ordain, wholesale massacre, and to associate himself with the dregs of the Russian underworld in order to make his position and his system secure, so in any country the attempt to establish socialism by means of revolution must inevitably be accompanied by a reign of terror, not merely for the subjugation of the people as a whole, but as a means of defense against rival revolutionary factions. For with the sweeping away of the old order the conflict will only have begun and must then enter on its further phase, the war between the factions that from the outset has divided the forces of revolution. The quarrel that took place between Spartacus and Philo was repeated in the perpetual dissensions between the disciples of the Illuminati throughout the whole French Revolution, and recurred again continually between the various revolutionary groups during the last century. Broadly speaking these groups have been divided into two opposing camps, the state socialists and the anarchists, that is to say, on the one hand the faction which aims at the supremacy of the state and the subjugation of the individual, and on the other hand the faction that would do away with the state and proclaim the complete liberty of the individual, policies which, of course, are diametrically opposed. It was this difference of opinion which in its embryonic stage caused the feud between the Robespierreists and Hebertists, which broke out later between the revolutionaries of 1869, the state socialists, Karl Marx, Engels, and Louis Blanc, violently separating themselves from the anarchists, Proudhon and Bakunin, and that finally led to the rupture in the Internationale. So still today the same feud rages in Russia, for it is towards anarchists such as Kropotkin that the state socialist Lenin has displayed the greatest severity. The hatred entertained by the believers in these opposing creeds has throughout been even fiercer than that of either party for the upholders of the old regime, the same furious animosity that led Robespierre to ordain the death of Heber flamed out again in Proudhon's denunciations of Robespierre, in Marx's diatribes against Proudhon, in Bakunin's detestation of Marx. In Marx it would seem that not only the policy but the very spirit of Robespierre lived again. His vanity, wrote Bakunin, knew no bounds, a veritable Jew's vanity. This vanity, already very great, was considerably increased by the adulation of his friends and disciples. Very personal, very jealous, very susceptible and very vindictive, like Jehovah, the God of his people, Marx cannot suffer one to acknowledge any other God but himself. Proudhon became the bete noire of Marx. To praise Proudhon in his presence was to offer him a mortal affront deserving of all the natural consequences of his enmity, and these consequences are at first hatred, then the foulest calumnies. Marx has never recoiled before falsehood, however odious, however perfidious it might be. Such, in the opinion of one of his most intimate associates, was the prophet now held up by the exponents of revolutionary socialism to the admiration of the English people, and such is the conflict on which they are invited to enter at the very moment when real and far-reaching reforms are actually within their grasp. Could they but realize the true character of the men whose gospel is offered them as their one hope of salvation, could they but study the history of the revolutionary movement in Europe, the miserable quarrels that took place between the leaders, the grotesque failure of every attempt to put their theories into practice, notably in such experiments as the New Harmony and the New Australia carried out by Lane and Owen, it is inconceivable that they could lend an ear to such counsels. But all these things are unknown to the working classes in our country, the true history of revolution has very carefully been kept from them by the propagandists on whom they depend for instruction, and who, in no way blind leaders of the blind but guides endowed with the clearest powers of vision, will lead them not into a ditch but over the brink of an abyss. For whichever revolutionary party succeeds in establishing its domination over the people it will be all over with democracy, since neither in the plan of the state socialists which entails autocratic control of every department of life, that is to say, Prussianism of the most intolerable kind, nor in the scheme of the anarchists which consists in the absence of all control, and must necessarily end in rule by the strongest, can any element of liberty be found. The ideal of true democracy, 
rule by the will of the majority, must then in either case be finally abandoned, and the people must submit to the domination of bureaucratic minorities or return to a state of savagery. Naturally this is not the program placed before the nation, for, just as in the French Revolution, the people are invited to cooperate on some perfectly plausible pretext, the redressing of their real grievances and the improvement in the conditions of labor, but are not admitted to the secrets of the leaders. Indeed it is probable that those of the extremists amongst the leaders who are of British birth and origin little realize whither they themselves are being led. It is on these supposed leaders, mainly middle-class men posing as representatives of labor, that the makers of world revolution have founded their hopes. The extraordinary simplicity and want of acquaintance with continental thought which the German, Karl Hillebrand, long ago detected in the attitude of the rising radical school in England towards the French Revolution, which characterized the correspondence of their prototypes the English Jacobins with their brethren in France, and that is still to be found in the utterances of our pacifists and internationalists today, makes them the ready dupes of subtler continental minds. For it is not they but their allies of foreign blood who are the real directors of the movement, Prussian exponents of democracy who entertain the secret hope of building up their shattered military machine once more on the ruins of civilization, German merchants who see their chance to corner the markets of the world by paralyzing industry in the countries of their rivals, cosmopolitan Jewish financiers who hope, by the overthrow of the existing order to place all capital beneath their own control. Anarchists from the east of Europe animated solely by a passion for destruction, who have all adapted Weishaupt's scheme of world revolution to their own particular purpose. Of all these conspiracies it might be said, as Robison said of the Illuminati, their first and immediate aim is to get the possession of riches, power, and influence, without industry, and to accomplish this they want to abolish Christianity, and then dissolute manners and universal profligacy will procure them the adherence of all the wicked, and enable them to overturn all the civil governments of Europe, after which they will think of further conquests and extend their operations to the other quarters of the globe, till they have reduced mankind to the state of one undistinguishable chaotic mass. Over this helpless mass each conspiracy hopes to establish its ascendancy, thereby bringing the peoples of the world under an iron tyranny unequaled in the annals of the human race. With each conspiracy, moreover, militant atheism forms an integral part of the scheme. Beginning with Weishaupt, continuing with Klutz, with Buchner and with Bakunin, hatred of religion, above all of Christianity, has characterized all the instigators of world revolution, since it is essential to their purpose that the doctrine of hatred should be substituted for the doctrine of love. We have only to replace the old word Jacobinism by its modern equivalent Bolshevism in this prophetic warning written by the Abbe Bowell in 1797 on the universal explosion devised by Spartacus Weishaupt to understand the danger that now threatens the whole civilized world, to whatever government, to whatever religion, to whatever rank of society you belong, if Jacobinism wins the day, if the projects and oaths of the sect are accomplished, it is all over with your religion, with your priesthood, with your government and your laws, with your properties and your magistrates, your riches, your fields, your houses, even to your cottages, all will cease to be yours. You thought the revolution ended in France, and the revolution in France was only the first attempt of the Jacobins. In the desires of a terrible and formidable sect, you have only reached the first stage of the plans it has formed for that general revolution which is to overthrow all thrones, all altars, annihilate all property, efface all law, and end by dissolving all society. It rests with the people to prevent the execution of this project in our country. Can we believe that at this hour they will fail to play their part as the champions of liberty? Can we believe that the working men of England who put down with an iron hand all attempts to establish Jacobinism in their midst throughout the French Revolution, amongst whom Marx himself for more than thirty years labored in vain to obtain a following, whom Kropotkin left in anger and disgust after his failure to win them over to his schemes of anarchy? will now be persuaded by the agents of Lenin to accept that which their sturdy forefathers rejected and to become the instruments of their own ruin. Is it possible that the English Jacobins, so ignominiously defeated in 1793, will now triumph over the good sense of their fellow countrymen? Will that Isle of Serenity, whose soil the emigres fell on their knees to kiss when flying from the horrors of their own unhappy country, after another century and a quarter of civilization become the scene of kindred disorders? Shall we, the freest people on earth, whose laws and constitution have been for countless generations the envy and the admiration of the world, now consent to be taught liberty by men nurtured under Khazardom and Tsardom, or by a race without a country of its own on which to experiment in government. Shall we, 
in the words of Arthur Young, imitate the example of France, and by tampering with that constitution to which we owe all our prosperity hazard so immense a stake of happiness. Appendix. The Duc d'Orléans on the 6th of October. At the Procédure du Châtelet the following witnesses came forward to testify to the presence of the Duke amongst the crowd during the invasion of the Château on the morning of October 6, the Vicomte de la Chartres, witness Xfé, and two men servants, Eudeline and Genifé, witnesses Xxi, and Xxi, who were with him, swore to having seen the Duc d'Orléans amongst the crowd in the courtyard of the Château in the morning of the 6th whilst the guards were being massacred, adding that the Duke had a switch in his hand and never ceased laughing. De Guillemy of the bodyguard, witness Kslix, testified to seeing the Duke in the crowd at the same moment. The Chevalier de la Serre, witness Kxvi, brigadier in the King's army and a Chevalier de Saint-Louis, stated that at six o'clock in the morning of the sixth he went to the chateau by the place des Arms, where he perceived a great movement of the people. That he then ran to the Cour Royale, there he joined the people and with them ascended the great staircase, the Escalier de Marbre, that these people were uttering imprecations, saying, our father is with us, let us march. That he asked one of these men who was this father. This man answered him, Ah, sacred you, do you not know him? It is the Duke Dolayan. That he asked this man, where is he? Is he here? The witness had then reached the first flight of the great staircase, this man answered him by indicating with a gesture of his arm that he, the Duke, was at the top of the staircase. A. F. Do you not see him? He is there, he is there. Then the witness raising his head and rising on tiptoe saw the Duke Gorlean at the head of the people making a gesture with his arm to indicate the hall of the Queen's bodyguard, and that the Duke Gorlean then turned to the left to reach the King's apartments. The Marquis de Digo in Du Palais, witness Cluxii, stated that just after the rush of the crowd up the Escalier de Marbre he went down the Escalier de Princes leading to the King's apartments, and at the foot of this staircase he met the Duke Gorlean. Morlet, witness Kluxkii, the sentinel on guard outside the king's apartments, related that the duke presented himself at this door and that he refused him admittance. After this, that is to say between seven and eleven in the morning, the duke was seen amongst the crowd in the courtyards of the chateau by six other witnesses, de la Borde, CXCV, Quence, Clive, a coachman, Jobert, Colvy, a valet and hairdresser, Madame. Tillet, CCCLXV, wife of a restaurant keeper, Brea, Xvi, an upholsterer, and de Frondeville, Cluxvi, King's Councillor and Deputy of the Assembly. The Duke was described by these witnesses as being dressed in a grey frock coat, carrying a switch in his hand and smiling at the people who followed him crying out, Vive notre roi d'Orléon. It is true that in the published report of the Procédure du Châtelet the Chevalier de la Serre was the only eyewitness who testified to seeing d'Orléon actually on the staircase pointing to the Queen's rooms, but de Nampy, Witness 88, captain in the Régiment de Flandre, stated that he had heard de Groix, one of the bodyguard, say that he saw the Duc d'Orléans in a grey coat pointing out to the people the great staircase of the chateau, and signing to them to turn to the right, and that he heard the people cry, Vive la roi d'Orléans. Moreover, according to Madame Campon, several other witnesses at the Procédure du Châtelet declared that they had themselves seen the Duke at the head of the staircase pointing the way to the Queen's apartments, and the English contemporary Robertson asserts that the most important evidence on the Duke's complicity was not printed. But the obvious answer to these accusations would have been to prove an alibi. If, as revolutionary historians would have us believe, all the witnesses above quoted were not only liars but perjurers, for their evidence was given on oath, when they declared that they had seen the Duke in the courtyards or on the staircase, then where was he? According to his own statement he was at the Palais Royal and did not start for Versailles till just on eight o'clock in the morning, but the only witnesses he could produce were some of his own servants and three obscure people, whose names only were given but whose identity was not stated, who said that they had passed him at Hortel at 7.30, i.e. half an hour before the time at which he himself said he had left Paris. Yet one other alibi was afterwards provided by his friend Mrs. Elliot, and since it is on this evidence that certain historians have founded their exoneration of the Duke, it should be compared with the Duke's own account of his movements given in his expose de la conduite, drawn up by him in London. The Duke's account there was no assembly on Sunday the 4th, and I had started off according to my custom on Saturday evening for Paris, intending to return on Monday morning to Versailles, but I was kept by work which certain people of my household had to do with me. I learnt in succession throughout the day, i.e. the 5th, 
of the effervescence taking place in Paris, of the start for Versailles of a considerable quantity of the people with arms and even with cannons, and at last the departure of a great number of the Parisian guards. I knew nothing else of what was going on at Versailles, until the following morning, when Monsieur Lebrun captain of a company of the National Guard, and inspector of the Palais Royal, had me awoken and came to tell me that an express of the National Guard had come to bring his bodyguard news of Versailles. The same day, i.e. the 6th, towards 8 o'clock in the morning, I started for the National Assembly. Between Sevres and Versailles I met some carts laden with provisions and escorted by a detachment of the National Guard. The officer in command of the detachment gave me two men as escorts. These two cavaliers escorted me in fact to my house, i.e. the Hotel de Vergennes at Versailles. I left again immediately to go to the National Assembly. I found a number of deputies in the avenue. They told me the king would hold the assembly in the Salon d'Ecole. I went up to the chateau and to his majesty, exposé de la conduite de Monsieur le Duc d'Orléans Redige par Louis Memo Londres, June 1790, pages 17 to 19. Mrs. Elliot's account soon after came the 5th of October, a memorable and dreadful day. But I must here do justice to the Duke of Orleans. He certainly was not at Versailles on that dreadful morning, for he breakfasted with company at my house when he was accused of being in the Queen's apartments disguised. He told us then that he heard the fish women had gone to Versailles with some of the Faubourgs, and that the people said they were gone to bring the king again to Paris. He informed us that he had heard this from some of his own servants from the Palais Royal. He said that he was the more surprised at this, as he had left the Palais Royal at nine o'clock of the night before, and all then seemed perfectly quiet. He stayed at my house till half past one o'clock. I have no reason to suppose that he went to Versailles till late in the day when he went to the States, as everybody knows. I have entered into this subject that I may have an opportunity of declaring that I firmly believe the Duke of Orleans was innocent of the cruel events of that day and night, and that Lafayette was the author and instigator of the treatment the August royal family then met with. The Duke of Orleans was even tried on this account, but the proofs were so absurd that it was dropped. And indeed it was clear to everybody that Lafayette and his party were the only guilty people, Journal of Mrs. Elliot, pages 37, 38. It will be seen that between these two accounts there is no resemblance whatever. In the first place, the Duke d'Orléans says nothing about breakfasting with Mrs. Elliot either on the fifth or sixth. On the contrary, he distinctly states that he was in his own house, the Palais Royal, early in the morning of both days. Mrs. Elliot says he breakfasted with her on the 5th, when he was accused of being in the Queen's apartments disguised, but he was never accused of being there on the morning of the 5th, for the mob did not start for Versailles till the middle of the day, and if this was a mere slip of the pen, and Mrs. Elliot really intended to say the 6th, this does not tally either, for the Duke says he left the Palais Royal at 8 o'clock and went straight to Versailles, where he remained till the assembly met, which was about 11 o'clock in the morning nor was he ever accused of being disguised as were his followers, and all eyewitnesses were agreed in their description of his dress on that morning. Mrs. Elliot's story, like several other passages in her journal, is evidently a tissue of inaccuracies, or of deliberate misstatements, but the accusation against Lafayette can only be attributed to Orleanist influence. No one at the time thought of accusing Lafayette of complicity with the events of October 5th and 6th, this charge was brought against him only by the real authors of the day, the members of the Orleanist conspiracy. Yet it is on this obviously trumped-up story that revolutionary historians found their exoneration of the Duke. In the absence, therefore, of any convincing alibi, and in the face of the overwhelming evidence brought forward at the Procédure du Châtelet, it seems to me impossible to doubt that the Duke d'Orléans was actually with the crowd at Versailles when they invaded the château on the 6th of October. Rotondo and the Princess de Lamballe. The document preserved amongst the Chatham papers at the record office, where it has been wrongly dated in pencil 1791, consists of a series of questions and answers in French written by two different hands, and accompanied by a letter signed only L, saying that the sender has the honor of forwarding the answers to Mr. Pitt's questions. The inquiry concerning Rotondo runs thus, question, qui est Rotondo? S. son nom de guerre ou de famille? Eighty on quelques notions, sur si qu'il faisait avant la révolution. Depuis qu'en est-il ici? I.e. evidently in London. Eighty il avec lui quelques autres chefs connus des travailleurs. Answer, Rotondo est un maître italien, c'est son nom de famille, il mérite de fame avant la révolution. 
Il est ive ici la 24 ou la 25 8 brie, il a remplace Chevy, que l'on envoie au Portugal, son assessor et un nommé tile, sic, an y car, beau de la femme de Danton. Rotondo et l'ami de Barbarou, la femme Marseille qui vendait des bas dans la cour de l'hôtel de Pentheva et mari d'une fille de cuisine de Madame de Lambal qui la ventre après con lui haut coupe la tête. This reveals a curious web of revolutionary intrigue, Rotondo, the friend of Barbarou, who first sent for the Marseille, Barbarou, a lawyer by profession, selling stockings in the courtyard of the Duke de Pentheva, father-in-law of the Princess de Lambal and with whom she lived, Rotondo sent officially to London, by whom? Evidently by the leaders of the Orleanist conspiracy. Incidentally, this correspondence provides further proof of Pitt's non-complicity with the revolutionary movement, if he had encouraged sedition is it possible that after three years of revolution he would have known nothing of Rotondo, a leading agitator who was frequently in London, and, as we see, officially employed there. The Trovio referred to were evidently an association for watching the movements of the revolutionaries and reporting them to Pitt. Obituary of Nestor Webster, 1876 August, 24-1960 May 16, in the London Times, the passing of Nesta Webster deserves a note before eventual justice can be done to her literary work. Born at Trent Park, Cockfosters, 84 years ago, the youngest daughter of Robert Bevan, who saved Barclays Bank during the Panic of 1866, her mother was the daughter of Bishop Shuttleworth of Chichester. Robert was Cardinal Manning's best friend at Harrow and Oxford. At Trent Manning found his spiritual mother in Aunt Favell the authoress of Peep of Day. The family tradition remained, that her diary showed a tenderness towards her brother's friend which inspired secret meetings. To her disappointment Manning married Miss Caroline Sargent. The evangelical Bevans grimly retained a letter of Manning's connecting the papacy with Antichrist, which Nestor's father said he would publish if ever Manning became Pope. In her autobiography Nestor described spacious days at Trent. One illustration showing the staff of 14 men and 11 females gives an amusing glimpse into a stately home. Two famous preparatory schools found patronage on the estate. Arthur Dunn's Lug Grove and from a cottage next door Mr. Tabor, vicar of Trent, was sent with Bevan Capital and a brace of Bevan boys to revive the older school at Cheam. Robert Bevan died murmuring last regrets that he could not attend the parents' cricket match at Cheam. His children were scattered, Frank inheriting Trent while Nestor was sent to Westfield College Hampstead, under the austere Miss Maynard. Coming of age, she travelled round the world, India, Burma, Singapore, and Japan, in leisurely, inexpensive days. In India she married Arthur Webster, a sporting superintendent of police, exactly as had been foretold by King Edward's famous palmist, Mrs. Robinson. She bore two daughters, Rosalind and Marjorie, who survive her. Settling down in England she felt she could write, and John Murray accepted a novel The Sheep Track in 1914. A strong literary obsession overcame her that she had eved in 18th century France. Like the ladies of Versailles, the more she read about the French Revolution the more she remembered. In 1916 she published The Chevalier de Boufflers, a romance of the French Revolution, which fascinated Lord Cromer to judge by his review in The Spectator. Sir Edward Marshall Hall was another fan. There were 15 editions, but the authoress was disappointed to receive no response from scholars. Deeper and deeper she sank into the literature of the Revolution, collecting several such rare books as La Bastille de Voily. After three years at the British Museum and the French archives she published The French Revolution, a study in democracy. At last Carlyle's semi-hysterical rhapsody had been met factually. Except for Lord Acton's lectures and Crocker's articles in the quarterly the English public had not been allowed to criticize the popular view of the Revolution which was conveyed by Dickens's Tale of Two Cities. Like Lord Acton she perceived evidence of design in the tumult, and a calculating organization behind masks, but she disapproved his concern to absolve the leaders from complicity. As she worked from original papers as well as printed sources she claimed to have faulted the great Acton nine times. The First World War together with her revolutionary studies drew out her fearless Bevan fervor. She turned with confident fury on the possible enemies of England. Three books followed in ten years, World Revolution, the plot against civilization, secret societies and subversive movements and finally the surrender of an empire. They will be worthy of the attention of unbiased historians. Her political book on the socialist network made her enemies as well as critics, but Bevans in their faiths or politics are not to be frightened or discouraged.
Though her last years were cramped by illness, her mind still flashed information to her friends and defiance to her critics. Her charm enabled her at different times in her long life to captivate Mr. Cross the widower of George Eliot, Lord Kitchener in India, and Gaston Morbres the French historian who assisted her with precious documents in her book on the Chevalier de Boufflers. May 18, 1960, The Times, London, page 17.